Lord of the Mysteries 2, Audiobook, Part 21 Chapter 501, Honorific Name City of Exiles, Morora, doesn't exist? When Lumian perused the information Ludwig had stolen, he couldn't shake the sensation that Morora was vivid and right before him. This stemmed from the fact that the scribe had meticulously chronicled every folklore and characteristic of the city. Even those who hadn't set foot there could conjure a mental image. Yet, Madame Magician had just dropped the bombshell, the city of exiles, Morora, didn't exist in Lenberg. I read it so intently, feeling so nervous and afraid. Finally, you tell me, I'm sorry, I made all this up? As Lumian grappled with the absurdity, his gaze reverted to the letter, eager to uncover Madame Magician's speculations. The major arcana card holder teased, perhaps the individual who penned this sealed artifact information had already lost their sanity, conjuring the city of exiles, Morora. Maybe it's a colossal prison nestled in the mountains, patrolled by guards. They provide supplies unattainable independently and remain cut off from the outside world. Perhaps Morora is genuinely an imagined city of exiles, yet, in a peculiar way, it already exists. Don't dismiss the first and third conjectures as absurd or hyperbolic, making them implausible. Let me enlighten you, when dealing with grade zero sealed artifacts, numerous things defy common sense and intuition. Especially when we're talking about 0-01. Personally, I fancy the first conjecture. It emanates a fantastical beauty. A deranged keeper jotting down information about a sealed artifact, filled with ramblings and delusions, and treating it as reality. But what about the truth? Where did it vanish to? Is it no longer in place? At the sight of this, Lumian felt an inexplicable chill, and his hair stood on end. Madame Magician had expounded terrifying possibilities. Moreover, she had employed seemingly casual strokes, brisk descriptions, and a barrage of questions to cultivate an atmosphere of composure and distortion, pushing one's nerves to the brink. Prolonged contemplation of it could drive one to the brink of insanity. Isn't this superior to the narrative prowess of most current best-selling authors in crafting horror tales? Lumian critiqued his major arcana card holder. Shaking his head, he relegated 0-01 and the City of Exiles to the recesses of his mind. He feared that dwelling on it might tip him into madness. It wasn't out of the realm of possibility. Lumian hadn't slept since perusing the information. While he leveraged the 6 a.m. reset of his body every morning to alleviate fatigue, he occasionally heard indescribable and spine-chilling voices resembling calls from the depths of the mountains. Phew. Lumian exhaled and resumed reading the letter. All right, I won't terrify you any longer. In essence, until you truly confront 0-01, don't summarily dismiss any conjecture or potentiality. I've verified the auditory hallucinations you mentioned. It's a mild corruption induced by delving into 0-01's information. Some entities can induce corruption merely by knowing their names instead of their code names. Fortunately, your destiny is entwined with that long-named fellow. To some extent, it's akin to having the status of an angel. Furthermore, you bear Mr. Fool's seal, the Blood Emperor's aura, and other high-level paraphernalia. That's why you only experienced a faint auditory hallucination and sensed the beckoning. You didn't suddenly descend into paranoia and extremism, harboring a desire to seek treasure in the mountains before vanishing one night. Madame Magician revels in spinning horror stories. She insists on expanding concise explanations into potential scenarios for me. Lumian had been in correspondence with his major arcana card holder for quite some time, becoming well acquainted with her choice of words and writing style. Let me remind you that you're akin to an angel to some extent, yet you won't succumb to the corruption associated with higher sequences. That's what sets you apart. It's why you can venture into many peculiar places. Hence, some entities seek to exploit this. Exercise caution and vigilance, continually scrutinizing yourself. By the way, misjustice and judgment extend their gratitude. 
the revelation of 0-01 and Vermanda Sauron's whereabouts allowed them to fulfill a mission entrusted by Mr. Fool before his slumber. Hence, the rewards are particularly generous this time. Your concerns are valid. If you miss the initial trail, whether it's Bard, Mad Lady, or the traces left by other key members of April Fools, it's more likely a trap than a clue. Of course, traps can yield certain information. As long as you can withstand the associated peril, you might uncover the architect of the trap. If, and I say if, you chance upon a high sequence beyonder of the seer, apprentice, and marauder pathways while delving into the whereabouts of the key members of April Fools, you can invoke my name and seek my assistance. Remember, this is my name. It carries the power to conceal secrets from others. Cosmic Traveler, beholden to the King of Yellow and Black, and the Sorcerer chronicling the world. The King of Yellow and Black is an alias for Mr. Fool. Cosmic Traveler and chronicling the world sounds amazing. Could she truly be the Angel of Stars from the Bible? As Lumian committed it to memory, he witnessed the honorific name gradually fading, as if erased and consumed by the void. At the conclusion of the letter, Madam Magician added, the minor arcana, knight of swords, subordinate to Mam Hermit, journeyed to Faina Potter a few months ago for a certain matter. When you arrive there, should you require assistance or information, you can reach out to him. His messenger is, a peculiar creature wandering above the world, a half-fairy who fiddles with melodic strings, a messenger that belongs solely to the knight of swords. Half-fairy. Lumian had skimmed through information about such spirit world creatures, mainly to select a suitable contract partner. He hadn't delved into the details, making it challenging to recall. Simultaneously, he noted that the Knight of Swords's messenger incantation deviated from the conventional format. Perhaps there was concern that foes could decipher the correct three-line description and summon the messenger to target him. Regardless, with the limiting phrase a messenger that belongs solely to the Knight of Swords, the second sentence didn't necessarily have to depict a creature friendly to humans. However, since it could serve as the messenger of the Knight of Swords, it could tacitly be considered as friendly to humans. Lumian reread Madam Magician's letter from start to finish, mindful not to overlook any crucial information embedded in her cryptic statements. Suddenly, a knock echoed on the bedroom door. Lumian glanced up, and the door creaked open. Ludwig stuck his chubby head out and, in a daze, uttered, I'm hungry. It's time for you to cook. Didn't you just eat plenty of cake and crackers? Lumian's lips twitched. Ludwig replied seriously, that's dessert, not the main course. Subtly, he licked his lips. Moreover, your culinary skills are quite impressive, and those dishes are quite unique. With a chef around, I don't want to settle for raw beef, hard bread, and freshly bought potatoes. The boy's expression turned pleading. Lumian scoffed. Why don't you do it yourself? I can only cook by myself after I recover a little, Ludwig replied subconsciously before changing his tone. I'm still a child. You're actually asking me to cook in the kitchen? Aren't you afraid that I'll be injured by a knife or burned? I'm just afraid you'll eat the knife. What does it mean to cook after recovering a little? Is chef a higher rank than your current sequence's strength? Can't you cook if you're not a chef? Lumian observed Ludwig leaning against the door frame, looking at him with expectant brown eyes, and suddenly found the scene familiar. In the past, he had begged his sister Aurora in the same way. Lumian sighed and stood up. I'm only responsible for three meals. The rest of the time, rely on dessert, bread, and cold dishes. Don't bother me. As he spoke, he left the bedroom and entered the kitchen. While donning an apron and engrossed in cooking, Ludwig, in a caramel coat, waited at the kitchen door, occasionally wiping his mouth. After pan-frying a steak, Lumian picked it up and casually tossed it out. Ludwig deftly caught it, tore it in a few bites, and stuffed it down his abdomen. Observing this, Lumian chuckled inwardly, feeling that this fellow was even more absurd than he had been back then. An underground trier, within a quarry cave. Lumian stood before the altar, encircled by the recently dismantled wall of spirituality. He had completed the contract T summoning ritual and gained two new contracted abilities. 
Now, he awaited Franca and the others to witness who could successfully gain a messenger. One of these abilities was shadow transformation. It allowed Lumian to authentically morph into a shadow, merging with it to conceal himself and move stealthily, a skill he currently lacked. While such abilities existed in the mystical knowledge of contractees, Lumian opted to acquire them from the spirit world creature information provided by Madame Magician. This prevented the bestowed of inevitability from discerning the negative effects he might endure. Ultimately, Lumian contracted a spirit world creature known as Long Shadow. He sacrificed six servings of fresh cow and sheep meat in exchange for this ability, making him more susceptible to sunlight than ordinary humans. This wasn't as severe as the aversion vampires had to sunlight. Lumian could endure it with his ascetic endurance. Another ability he had acquired was the Bottle of Fiction. He found the unique and practical ability demonstrated by the Padre intriguing. It could effectively screen an enemy, creating a concealed space where the other party couldn't escape and could only exit through the bottle's opening, traps could be added. Since no spirit world creature could provide this ability, Lumian summoned the creature called the Fantasy Face and completed the contract with a bottle of blood with strong spirituality. The blood needed to come from a Beyonder above sequence 7 or a corresponding Beyonder creature. Lumian, naturally, wouldn't use his own blood, as sacrificing it to the Fantasy Face could gradually transform him into a monster. Instead, he used the blood Madame Magician extracted from Gardner Martin's corpse, one of the supplementary ingredients for a Reaper. It was substantial, and there was plenty. The corresponding downside was a trace of greed. Before long, Franca, Jenna, and Anthony arrived at the quarry cave, one after another. Chapter 502 Messenger Ritual Anthony stared at the altar, the flickering candlelight casting shadows on his face. He voiced his concerns and uncertainties about having their own messenger. Can we really have our own messenger? His knowledge of mysticism hinted that messengers were a rare occurrence. Only beyonders of specific pathways at a certain sequence or high-level beyonders with godhood possessed these special contracted creatures, accessible at any time and summoned by others. Franca, grinning, reassured him, other beyonders might not cut it, but we still have a chance. There are three prerequisites for possessing a messenger. First, you need to understand spirit world creatures, knowing which ones can be used as messengers. You must grasp their characteristics and devise incantations for precise summoning. Second, the spirit world creature must be willing to respond to the summoning and not reject signing a contract to become your messenger. Third, you need a unique undead contract and a deity to bear witness, restraining both parties and clarifying their responsibilities. C. There aren't any restrictions on pathways and sequences among these three. There are only hidden restrictions but there are ways to bypass them. For ordinary beyonders, the first requirement is the toughest. Usually, they lack a deep understanding of spirit world creatures. Summoning one might make them tremble with fear, afraid the incantation could lead to a monster that could harm their family. With time, they might rely on their predecessor's experiences to accumulate reliable summoning incantations, but most have nothing to do with a messenger. We're different. As members of the Tarot Club, we have Madame Magician, an expert in spirit world creatures. Seal has a pile of information on them. Madame Magician selected 30 spirit world creatures suitable for being a messenger, some with a desire to serve as a mid-sequence Beyonder's messenger. This allows us to skip the greatest obstacle. Otherwise, consider the speed at which spirit world creatures traverse. Some messengers can cover the distance from Southern Entis to Trier in just a few minutes. Others take 10 minutes to half an hour, while some may take half a day or even a full day. Without knowledge, signing a messenger that takes half a year or one year to cover such a distance is pointless. My name isn't Seal Dubois anymore, Lumian reminded Franca after she finished explaining a portion of the knowledge to Anthony and Jenna, who were novices in the mysticism world. Franca let out a hollow laugh. Isn't it just a habit of the mouth? When I first met you, your name was Seal. I've been calling you that for months. She continued, the second prerequisite is that we have a way to bypass it. 
Beyonders of Pathways Fly Corpse Collector, affiliated with the undead and other creatures in the spirit world, can make them willing to be summoned. Then, it's possible to sign a messenger contract. At the sequence of Spirit Guide, they can even semi-compulsively turn a target they fancy into their messenger. Without such specialties, one can often only rely on their status to suppress and intimidate them. As for us, we follow Mr. Fool. You've all heard the Church's Bible, so you should know that Mr. Fool is the great ruler who controls the spirit world. Strictly speaking, those spirit world creatures are under his control. As members of the Tarot Club, summoning spirit world creatures and signing a messenger contract with them will definitely be much easier. In particular, Lumi here has Mr. Fool's power. Have you ever seen him fail in summoning spirit world creatures? At most, it's vague. What comes isn't what he wants. The third prerequisite is that Madam Magician has already given Lumian a special undead contract, specially prepared for messengers. The witness should be deaf, but they can be replaced by an angel from the underworld or the undead domain. And there's an angel of death by Mr. Fool's throne. He's the consul of the underworld. Actually, I don't think it's a problem to use Mr. Fool's honorific name directly. Would spirit world creatures not obey the orders of the great ruler who controls the spirit world? The information from Madam Magician contained a four-line description targeting the underworld, suitable as a witness. Jenna and Anthony absorbed the mysticism knowledge attentively, realizing its value in explaining many problems in ordinary summoning rituals. Once Franca had concluded her instructional role, Lumian produced a carefully selected stack of information about spirit world creatures and directed his attention to Jenna. You first. Jenna, pointing at herself in confusion and surprise, asked, me? She was a complete novice at summoning rituals. Lumian let out a chuckle. You have the lucky gold coin. According to Madam Magician, it has a certain connection to Mr. Fool, equivalent to his memento. This will make you more likely to summon a specific creature and complete the messenger contract than Franca and Anthony. My chances of success should be about the same as yours, but I have a lot of messy things on me. I'm afraid it'll cause an anomaly and ruin the rest of tonight's attempts, so I'll be the last. Jenna considered Lumian's explanation and agreed. Muttering under her breath, she took the document and flipped to the page she had chosen earlier. It recorded a spirit world creature she was relatively familiar with, Rabbit of Knowledge. However, this wasn't an ordinary Rabbit of Knowledge, it had absorbed some specific knowledge and undergone a special mutation to become suitable as a messenger. Jenna had a positive impression of the Rabbit of Knowledge. She found it friendly and willing to help humans, making it her preferred choice from the beginning. Additionally, its silly appearance added to its charm. Retrieving the page of information, Jenna entered the altar. Recalling Franca's teachings and the mystical knowledge from the witch potion, she swiftly sanctified the ritual silver dagger and created a wall of spirituality. Having completed all the preparations, Jenna took two steps back, focused on the candle flame, and uttered a concise and forceful word in ancient Hermes. I. Then, she switched to Hermes. I summon in my name. Rabbit-shaped spirit that wanders about the unfounded, a friendly creature that can be communicated with, a runner who pursues knowledge. In this modified incantation, the original weakling was replaced with runner to specifically denote the special rabbit of knowledge. The candle flame abruptly shifted to a dark green hue, expanding to the size of a human head. A translucent creature resembling a rabbit emerged from the dark green candle flame. Unlike other rabbits of knowledge, its eyes emitted a wise glint, and it held a blurry book with an orange-red cover in its hand. Its legs were powerful, indicating its proficiency in running. Jenna couldn't contain her joy at successfully summoning it on her first attempt. Slightly perturbed, she addressed the creature in ancient Hermes, Are you willing to become my messenger? The mutated rabbit of knowledge glanced at Jenna and asked in intision, Have you ever called my kind fools or idiots before? No, Jenna replied sincerely. I curse occasionally, but it's not directed at anyone. It's just an expression of my emotions. Occasionally? Lumian mocked Jenna inwardly. 
the mutated rabbit of knowledge observed Jenna intently, somehow confirming that she wasn't lying. However, this might have been more of a formality, as the answer of not having engaged in name-calling was sufficient. Whether it was entirely true or not seemed inconsequential. The rabbit nodded and said, You have to pay me. Every time you summon me, you have to give me a book or knowledge of equal value. You can give it to me directly or burden the person who's writing to you. It agreed just like that? Having name called it in the past, I can't summon this rabbit as a messenger. Well, I can't summon it now either. There should only be one special rabbit of knowledge that has evolved to be capable of being a messenger. Lumian knew it was generally easy to deal with, but he didn't expect it to be so amiable. Jenna glanced at the information placed at the edge of the altar, noticing a notification, the knowledge you feed the rabbit of knowledge determines what it will become in the future. Will reading more postman-related books improve its awareness and abilities as a messenger? Jenna wondered to herself as she replied, No problem. Let's sign a contract. Following the template provided by Madame Magician, she used the dark red fountain pen on the altar to swiftly write a contract on the yellowish-brown goatskin, outlining the agreed compensation. The contract was composed in ancient Hermes, with every word seeming to resonate with the forces of nature and the spirit world. Jenna had utilized her usual studies and the knowledge from the witch potion to quickly grasp this beyond their language. In addition to the contract, Jenna penned a description of the mysticism related to the underworld. The home of all death, the hell hidden deep within the spirit world, the witness of the decay of all living things, one that solely belongs to the kingdom of death. As she wrote, the ancient Hermes' words burned with dark green flames, including the original ones. Remembering Lumian's earlier advice, Jenna deliberately included a class fixing the summoning incantation as rabbit-shaped spirit that wanders about the unfounded, a runner who pursues knowledge, a messenger that belongs solely to the Seven of Cups. Still cautious about revealing her real name, Jenna refrained from using it. She worried that someone familiar with her messenger summoning incantation might uncover her true identity, potentially implicating her brother Julian in the future. After scanning the contract and confirming its accuracy, Jenna signed her code name. The goatskin floated up and flew toward the mutated rabbit of knowledge. Picking up another fountain pen, the rabbit of knowledge wrote its name, Chasel Savio. You have a name? Lumian was a little surprised. He was also within the wall of spirituality. I named it myself after reading a book. It's my name now, replied Rabbit Chasel as the ghastly green flames on the goatskin merged, incinerating the contract into ashes and transforming it into an invisible force. Jenna breathed a sigh of relief and engaged in a brief conversation with Rabbit Chasel before concluding, I. I end this summoning in my name. Rabbit Chasel returned to the spirit world and Franca eagerly watched as the wall of spirituality dissipated before stepping into the altar. Jenna's ease had filled her with confidence. However, she faced a shameful failure. Chapter 503 Penitent Franca attempted summoning five different spirit world creatures. Despite her successful summonings, none of the spirit world creatures were willing to sign a contract and become her messenger. The repeated failures struck her hard, and her disappointment and frustration were evident from her blank expression. Nevertheless, she didn't let her emotions dictate her actions. Undeterred, she proceeded to summon the remaining 24 spirit world creatures. The situation was becoming increasingly clear, success, if achievable, would happen in the first few attempts. Jenna glanced at the disappointed Franca. Give it a try when your sequence is higher. Franca grumbled, when I reach a higher sequence, I might use a mirror in the mirror world to send messages. Why would I need a messenger? Why aren't there any spirit world creatures tempted by a demoness charm and willing to become a messenger? Lumian let out a chuckle. I've seen something similar in the information about spirit world creatures. Would you like to give it a try? Despite her reluctance to admit defeat, Franca remained pragmatic. She cursed, forget it, forget it. Such spirit world creatures are definitely dangerous. All they can think about is dragging a demoness into the spirit world. 
Even delivering a letter will help me turn my friend into an enemy. Seeing that she had calmed down, Anthony Reed, a fellow novice in ritualistic magic, made his attempt. Like Franca, he too faced a series of challenges. Five attempts were made, with two summoning failures and three unsuccessful contract formations. Looks like I can't have a messenger for the time being, Anthony sighed with a bitter smile. Franca's emotions eased significantly. She wasn't alone in facing difficulties. Which one do you want to summon? She asked Lumian curiously. The coolest one. Lumian, maintaining an air of nonchalance, sanctified the ritual silver dagger and recreated the spiritual barrier. Focusing on the burning candle flames, he took steps back, alternating between ancient Hermes and Hermes. I. I summon in my name, a creature wandering above the world, the penitent who awakens from the flames of pain, a friendly person corrupted by darkness. This summoning incantation, unique information from Madame Magician, deviated from the norm. It wasn't just a spirit but a creature wandering above the world. The latter descriptions combined encounters and characteristics, adding an intriguing layer to the summoning. Lumian found the temperament and style of this particular creature impressive and decided to make it his first attempt. He sought a messenger capable of delivering a letter and traversing the spirit world, indifferent to other considerations. Why not choose the coolest one? As the incantation echoed, the candle flame expanded, acquiring a dark green hue bordering on black. With each intensifying flicker, a figure materialized. It was a tall, human-like being dressed in deep black robes reminiscent of the eternal blazing sun church clergy. However, his exposed face and limbs bore the marks of prolonged incineration, leaving only bones and charred flesh. Empty eye sockets glowed with dark flames, while strange, viscous black flames lingered, causing perpetual pain to the spirit. Lumian gazed at the penitent and asked an ancient Hermes, Are you willing to become my messenger? Responding in ancient Faisak, the source of several northern continent languages, the penitent offered a condition, if you're not concerned about being implicated by me and slowly slipping into the darkness, I can help you deliver letters. No compensation, but there's latent danger. Since Madame Magician provided the penitent's information, it means I can bear it. Lumian, who had too much mysticism debt to worry about, smiled and said, that depends on whether you and darkness can win the tug of war. No problem. I was mentally prepared for this before summoning you. This time, he switched to ancient Faisak to communicate with the other party. After all, it was quite troublesome to use ancient Hermes, which could stir the power of nature, to say so much. Soon, he drafted the contract and penned the four-line mysticism description representing the underworld's representative as witness. Illuminated by ancient Hermes' words engulfed in ghastly green flames, Lumian fixed the summoning incantation to, a creature wandering above the world, the penitent who awakens from the flames of pain, a messenger that belongs solely to Lumian Lee. Lumian didn't adopt a code name like Jenna and the Knight of Swords. After all, those who knew about his messenger might not know that he was a minor arcana card holder of the Tarot Club. This was the self-cultivation of a veteran spy and it didn't matter if Lumian Lee's name and corresponding background were known. With his name penned down, Lumian witnessed the yellowish-brown goatskin fly towards the black-robed penitent. The penitent signed his name, Bane fell. The ghastly green flames intertwined, consuming the contract and seamlessly merging with the spirit world. Curious about his new messenger, Lumian queried penitent Bane fell, what are you penitent about? However, Banefell remained silent, and a viscous black flame descended from his body, disappearing into the soil. Despite Lumian's persistent questioning, Banefell kept his silence. Lumian chuckled and remarked, Very good. All hairdressers should learn from you, before concluding the summoning. After he dismantled the wall of spirituality, Franco looked at him with a resentful expression. You succeeded on the first try? I succeeded on the first try. Lumian lacked any evident joy, as if he was talking about something ordinary. Perplexed and unable to let go of her own failures, Franca questioned, Why? Why aren't Anthony and I popular with the spirit world creatures? Why? It had to be said that the demoness of pleasure was quite charming. 
Seeing Franca like this, ascetic Lumian wanted to walk up to her, raise his right hand, and flick her forehead. It made him want to bully her. He pondered for a moment. I roughly understand the reason. Being a minor arcana card holder of the Tarot Club increases our chances of successfully summoning special spirit world creatures. Even a psychiatrist like Anthony succeeded several times during his first ritualistic magic. However, to gain their favor or obedience, you need a higher level, a special pathway, or something related to Mr. Fool. For example, Jenna's lucky gold coin and Mr. Fool's power on me. A sudden realization struck Lumian. If that's the reason, does the Knight of Swords, who also possesses a messenger, have something similar? I see. Franca, buoyed by this insight, regained confidence. It wasn't that there was a problem with her, she simply lacked a prop. She then looked at Jenna, contemplating whether to borrow the lucky gold coin to complete the messenger contract. Franca eventually dismissed the idea. There was a significant mysticism difference between ownership and loaning. She was afraid that Jenna wouldn't be able to handle it if she were to give it and take it back in the future without a unique opportunity. Phew. Franca exhaled and was about to inquire when Lumian planned to leave Trier and how, when she noticed her companion's inexplicable silence and a hint of dejection. What's the matter? Franca inquired, concerned. Nothing. Lumian shook his head. He suddenly remembered that Aurora had once yearned for a messenger. Anthony glanced at Lumian, but no words were exchanged. Jenna brought up the purifier's Deacon Angulim's proposal to purchase the pride armor, prompting Lumian to fall into a brief silence before chuckling. I'll decide after some time. Despite recognizing the danger of the pride armor, Lumian acknowledged its formidable power. It could pose a threat to all beyonders below the demigod level. If wearing it was the key to defeating Loki and other key members of April Fools, Lumian wouldn't hesitate to use it, prepared to face the consequences. Lumian wouldn't give up on the sealed artifact just because it was dangerous, until he eliminated all those scoundrels or until he was too strong for pride armor. All right, Franca inquired, are you leaving Trier tomorrow? Will you take a boat, a steam locomotive, or seek the spirit world's coordinates from Madam Magician and teleport there? Lumian chuckled. All of them are possible. I'll decide tomorrow. Let's see what fate has in mind. Franca muttered, when did you learn to act all mysterious? After bidding farewell to his three companions, Lumian adorned the silver lie earring and subtly altered his hair color and appearance. Making his way down Avenue du Marque into Rue Anarchy, he arrived at Aubert's du Coq d'Ores underground bar. Seemingly unaffected by the previous night's catastrophe, the bar retained its lively atmosphere. Regular patrons occupied their usual spots, some singing loudly, others dancing around small round tables, and a few engaged in gambling with alcohol as stakes. Charlie, now in a black coat, stood at a small round table, enthusiastically exclaiming, you might not know this, but Seal Du Bois and I are friends. We've been through life and death together. Look, look, his bounty has been updated to 60,000 Vrl d'Or. What a substantial sum. You're quite proud of me. Lumian scoffed and settled at the bar, ordering a glass of absinthe. In the midst of the commotion, he silently listened, savoring the bitter liquor. Pavard Neeson, the proprietor wiping glasses, noticed the new face and smilingly inquired, Have you just arrived in the market district? Yes, Lumian responded in a deep voice. Pavard Neeson said gently, You seem to have a story. Lumian sighed, taking a sip of the dreamy La Favert. With a self-deprecating smile, he said, I'm a nobody. Chapter 504, Breakup In an instant, I found myself with no alternative but to depart. Staying put was not an option. Besides, lingering too long might jeopardize my friend and jeopardize the fortune he had tirelessly amassed. Lumian raised the emerald green absinthe to his lips once more. Pavard Neeson, the proprietor of the bar, gently placed his glass on the counter and let out a sigh. That's truly unfortunate. A sly grin played on Lumian's lips. All right, I've wrapped up my tale. 
How about a complimentary drink on the house? Pavard, his ponytail giving him a somewhat artistic appearance, was momentarily taken aback. Minutes before the stroke of midnight, Charlie, clad in a black coat, exited the basement bar of Aubert's Du Coke door and retraced his steps to his rented apartment. Under the gentle autumn night sky, a soothing breeze played, neither bone-chilling nor overly brisk. It seemed to cleanse both body and mind with each inhale. Charlie couldn't resist taking a deep breath. Dogs hit, which drunkard peed all over the place again. The foul odor in the air soured Charlie's mood. At that very moment, a silhouette emerged from the shadows up ahead. The figure boasted golden black hair, piercing blue eyes, and a strikingly handsome face, none other than Seal Dubois. Haven't you left Trier? Charlie's heart surged with joy, ready to inquire further. But almost instantly, he caught sight of the dark expression on Seal's face, as if a tempest brewed within his eyes. Charlie jumped in fright, his thoughts racing. Instinctively, he said, I, I was going to let you know. Before he could finish, Lumian materialized before him, his right fist meeting Charlie's face with a solid impact. The force sent golden specks dancing in Charlie's vision. He teetered backward, struggling to maintain his balance. Lumian's countenance darkened as he spoke, considering our past friendship, I won't kill you this time. With that, he pivoted in his dark jacket and strode towards a dimly lit alley, away from the glow of street lamps. Clutching his throbbing face, Charlie watched Seal vanish into the shadows. Anxious and incensed, he blurted out, but I couldn't locate you. How was I supposed to inform you that you're wanted? Lumian offered no response, disappearing into the alley. Rooted to the spot, Charlie couldn't suppress his curses. Frustration and resentment welled up within him. Why did he suddenly become so unreasonable? It's not my fault you're wanted. I've done my utmost to help. I'm just a clerk, there's a limit to what I can accomplish. The next morning, Charlie had just settled into his subterranean office at Eglis St. Robert, armed with a meatloaf. Before he could even start brewing a cup of coffee, he spotted Angulim, the deacon clad in a brown double-breasted coat, heading his way. Morning, deacon, Charlie exclaimed, rising to his feet and greeting him with eager deference. Angulim glanced at the bruises on his left cheek. What happened? Did you get into a scuffle? Oh, no, not at all. I, uh, collided, with a statue. Charlie suddenly grew jittery and waved his hand dismissively. It might sound unbelievable, but those lunatics get wild when they're drunk. Some ran about toppling the government, others believe their vomit is gourmet cuisine, and a few decide to relocate hefty statues to random corners. I accidentally bumped into one. Anguli maintained a steady gaze on the clerk and spoke with measured calmness, your lies lack finesse. Do you recall the clause in the contract about not concealing crucial information? Charlie's expression stiffened, his lips faltering before he stammered, it, it's seal. Seal Dubois attacked me. Perhaps he's resentful because I didn't notify him beforehand about being wanted by us. Angulim listened in silence. After a brief pause, he remarked, very well. That's more like what a competent purifier clerk should be. Where did you encounter him? Right outside Aubert's Du Coke door, just past the first alley leading to Avenue du Marquet, Charlie responded, a blend of nervousness and concern coloring his voice. Angulim delved into further details and said to Charlie, Given that Seal Dubois's true circumstances surpassed our expectations, we scrutinized all the files associated with him. It came to light that you share a close bond with him and that he was implicated in Susanna Mattis' beyond her case. Upon including him in that matter, it became apparent that you concealed numerous details. Charlie, upon hearing the deacon's words, stiffened, beads of cold sweat forming on his forehead. I, I. He faltered, unable to find words, as if the specter of his impending doom loomed large. At that moment, Angulim took the initiative to ask, did Seal force you to hide these details? No, it wasn't coercion, Charlie responded instinctively, quickly adding, he requested it. As expected, a request, Angulim nodded thoughtfully and probed into every nuance of the Susanna Mattis incident. With his psychological defenses stripped away, 
Charlie laid bare every detail to the purifier deacon. Upon concluding his account, Angulim spoke with gravity, for someone in your position as a purifier clerk, concealing vital case details would typically lead to immediate dismissal, if not imprisonment. Though Charlie had braced himself for such a repercussion, the actual words felt like a blow to the head. His body swayed, teetering on the brink of imbalance. Before he could mount a plea, Angulim shifted the conversation. However, your recent performance has been commendable. You've shown diligence, dedication, and commitment to your studies. Moreover, it appears you haven't leaked information to Seal, cautioning his resentment towards you. As the deacon of the Market District's Inquisition, I'm inclined not to cast aside someone who has earnestly climbed out of the abyss and crushed their last hope. Given your clean record after becoming a purifier clerk and the authenticity of the Susanna Mattis incident, I'm offering you another chance. I can't just push you out and wait for Seal to kill you or the Mother Tree of Desires bestowed to find you again, can I? You'll be terminated, but you can intern here. Your salary will revert to the intern level for six months. If you excel and avoid errors during this period, you may be rehired. Otherwise, you'll be asked to leave immediately. In simpler terms, your punishment is a six-month probation. Charlie, upon hearing these words, felt a surge of relief, as if he had plummeted into hell only to be yanked back into heaven. In a frenzy of gratitude, he slumped back into his seat, drained of strength. As Angulim departed, Charlie's mind reeled, scenes flashing before his eyes. After a few seconds, he raised his right hand and delivered a self-inflicted slap. Muttering in frustration and regret, he reflected, to think, last night at the bar, I boasted about Seal and me being friends who had faced life and death together. Shortly after returning to his office, Angulim received a telegram. It originated from St. Vive Cathedral's Plessis Descartes, overseeing the Trier Diocese. The Cardinal summoned Angulim to St. Vive Cathedral for a discussion. St. Vive Cathedral Ascending a dazzling staircase to an area near the dome, a small room awaited. It stood as one of the places in Trier closest to the sun. Clad in a white robe adorned with golden threads, Cardinal Plessy spent his days here, bathed in holy light. An elderly man with high cheekbones and grizzled blonde hair, his demeanor lacked sternness, yet a radiant glow made direct eye contact impossible, rendering the room eerily devoid of shadows. While you faced challenges during the recent catastrophe due to unforeseen events and intel disruptions, your ability to grasp crucial information and manage subsequent arrangements was noteworthy. We haven't overlooked your performance in the market district over the past year, Plessy commended amicably. Praise the sun! Angulin proclaimed, extending his arms in acknowledgement of the Lord's glory. Plessy's satisfaction deepened. In light of the current circumstances and the foreseeable future, we intend to establish three purifier teams directly under the Trier Diocese. This will provide flexibility in handling various beyond their incidents. At this point, the Cardinal offered a rare smile. You've been swamped with work for the past six months. Privately, you've voiced concerns about lacking leisure time. Do not blame yourself, it's a common human experience. As a deacon in the Trier Diocese, you should find more leisure time. Your role will involve addressing cases beyond the capacity or time frame of the purifiers in the districts. Of course, this also entails risk. You must comprehend this clearly. Francois, sequence 4 marks a qualitative transformation. Many within the Inquisition are aspiring to become saints. If you wish to surpass them, you must make remarkable contributions. The first step is to become a deacon of a small team under a large diocese. The second step involves amassing contributions and wielding a holy artifact. The third step is to await an opportune moment. Do you aspire to be a deacon? I respect your desires. Flexibility Addressing cases beyond the reach of purifiers in various districts. I should typically have considerable freedom. How could there be so many significant matters? I don't know if Gandalf's apocalyptic prophecy holds true, but there's no harm in self-improvement. Angulin pondered briefly and responded, Your Eminence, thy will be done. Plessy smiled and said, As a deacon, you'll be tasked with selecting team members. 
Yes, your eminence. Angulim extended his arms once more, praising the sun. Upon returning to the underground confines of Eglis St. Robert, he summoned the mixed blood Imra to his office, apprising his subordinate of the Trier Diocese team. Are you willing to follow me? Angulim inquired. Imra smiled and replied, Does this mean I can advance my sequence and earn a higher salary? I have no issue with that. After agreeing, the mixed blood inquired, Who should we choose next? Angulim fell into silence for over ten seconds before stating, Don't consider individuals like Valentine, those with a wife and children. Approach those who are single. A team under direct command is both an honor and a risk. Angulim released a soft sigh and added, Which purifier with a happy family wouldn't want to witness their child grow and spend more time with their spouse? Let the single individuals among us bear this burden. Chapter 505 Departure Having apprehended everyone deserving of it in the market district and putting those who hadn't been arrested on the wanted list, Angulim found a rare moment of leisure. He shifted his focus to selecting members for the Trier Diocese team. Choosing from the Inquisition in the market district was impossible. Armed with information from St. Vive Cathedral, he casually visited the Inquisition in Cartier de l'Observatoire, the prison district, and other locations where he engaged in detailed conversations with the target purifiers. He swiftly concluded his work and returned to his rented apartment in Cartier de la Cathedral commemorative, promptly falling asleep. Angulim slept until the early hours of the morning, awakened by the growling of his stomach. He nibbled on a piece of white bread, complemented by his stockpiled jerky, butter, and red wine. Observing the unwashed cutlery on the coffee table, he contentedly seated himself in front of the miniaturized analyzer and switched on the radio transceiver. During this time, the telegraph group was most active. After sending a telegram to announce his presence, Angulin pulled over a pillow, placing it behind him as he leaned comfortably against the wall. Soon, amidst the clicking sounds, the analyzer, powered by numerous components, spat out a telegram. Angulim's forehead twitched at the sight of the telegram's signature, Hidden Blade. He picked up the telegram and quickly scanned its contents. 007, you're finally here. I have something to tell you. I've just received news that the mirror people we mentioned have been infiltrating Trier over the past decade, replacing the original ones. Countless Trier citizens are already mirror people, and no one knows their ultimate goals, but it can't be anything good. I'm investigating these mirror people. I'll give you new clues at any moment. Keep an eye out for such matters in advance. After reading it, Angulin took a deep breath and exhaled slowly. The following morning, Lumian sat in a four-wheeled, four-seater rental carriage. Ludwig, clad in a caramel coat and carrying a red school bag, occupied the seat beside him. On the opposite side sat Lugano Toscano, with thick eyebrows and large eyes, emanating a distinct protagonist aura. Glancing out the window at Avenue du Marque, Lumian noticed little deviation from the usual scene. Street vendors, public carriages, and rental carriages bustled about. The Suet Steam Locomotive Station welcomed numerous foreigners, waiters actively seeking customers, cafes doubling as beer houses, inexpensive restaurants, and card rooms, along with clerks and workers in a hurry. While seemingly unchanged, subtle shifts had occurred. Rat Cristo had fled, Giant Simon was apprehended, and Baron Brignes was nowhere to be found. He didn't even commission information brokers to seek out his smuggled godson. The Savoy mob, once dominant, faced total annihilation, setting the market district on the brink of new mob conflicts. The dark brown rental carriage, marked with a yellow plate, gradually departed from the lively and somewhat chaotic surroundings. Observing Lumian divert his attention, Lugano inquired ingratiatingly, should we travel by boat to Faina Potter, or perhaps get false identities and take the southbound steam locomotive to explore Riston Province first? He initially considered mentioning Cordu but refrained, sensing it might unsettle Lumian. Instead, he referred to their shared hometown, Riston Province, in a broader context. It's in the hands of fate, Lumian replied with a smile. 
Producing three post-it notes, he scribbled various options with the black fountain pen he carried, boat, steam locomotive, and direct travel. Crumpling the notes into balls, he deftly shuffled their positions, presenting a dazzling display of sleight of hand. Your turn. Let's see what fate has in store. Lumian extended his right hand to Lugano. Isn't this too arbitrary? Lugano pondered, surprised by the randomness of selecting their travel method to the Faina Potter kingdom through drawing lots. Despite the absurdity, he dutifully picked up a paper ball. In any case, he had already received the 5,000 Vroldor advance payment. Lugano unfolded the paper and read the word ship. Lumian nodded and smiled. Very good. Then let's take the steam locomotive. Dot. Lugano's expression became uncertain as he instinctively glanced at the wanted criminal worth 60,000 Vroldor sitting across from him. He wondered if Lumian was manipulating him to eliminate the wrong option or simply playing a prank. Forcing another smile, Lugano suggested, Shall we head back to the Suet Steam Locomotive Station? No, to the Northern Train Station, Lumian replied, turning to Ludwig, who had been quietly eating without uttering a word. Northern Train Station? Lugano felt increasingly puzzled by his employer's decision. Trier had two main steam locomotive stations, Suet, connecting the southern and central regions, and the northern train station, responsible for the northern provinces. If their destination was the Faina Potter Kingdom and Riston Province, the logical choice would be Suet. Why, then, were they going north? Recognizing that it wasn't his place to question his employer's decisions, Lugano instructed the carriage driver to alter their course. As noon approached, the rental carriage arrived at the Northern Trier train station. I have to disguise myself and find a broker to fake my identity to buy a ticket. As Lugano directed the carriage driver to a more remote area, he turned to look at Lumian, preparing to make a suggestion. He was met with an unfamiliar face. The short flaxen-colored hair, brown eyes, and other facial features combined to create the appearance of a stranger. If not for the silver earring on his right ear and the familiar clothes, Lugano might have believed they were ambushed by official Beyonders, having quietly dealt with Lumian. Purchase a ticket to Port Gotti in Upper Coastal Province, Lumian calmly instructed. Upper Coastal Province, Port Gotti. Lugano suddenly grasped Lumian's strategy. While his employer did intend to take a boat to the Faina Potter Kingdom, he chose a less obvious route. Instead of departing from the nearest Port Lusur in Pas Province, he opted for Upper Coastal Province to the north. For an ordinary person, it might seem wasteful, but for a wanted fugitive evading enemies, an unconventional approach could prove to be a prudent choice at avoiding potential dangers. In the business carriage of the steam locomotive, divided into six cozy private rooms, Lumian's gaze swept across the slightly ajar carved wooden door, the table adorned with a vibrant, multicolored tablecloth interwoven with golden threads, the plush sofa that doubled as a bed, and the slender wooden wall adorned with oil paintings. A satisfied nod escaped him. A private room like this commanded a hefty price of 400 Vroldor, accommodating no more than four individuals. The steam locomotive promised a 12-hour journey with an 8-hour night stop, totaling 20 hours. Travel costs were 30 Vroldor for a third-class seat, 45 Vroldor for second class, and 60 Vroldor for first class. The exclusive small private rooms in business class demanded 100 Vroldor per person, sold only in packages to maintain the privacy of business companions. For a wanted fugitive like Lumian, this setup was perfect. Equipped with the lie earring and the knee's face, Lumian had no real need for the privacy or luxury of the business carriage, but there was a compelling reason for his choice. The business carriage provided two complimentary meals, dinner tonight and breakfast tomorrow. A convenience that would spare Lumian from many hassles. Sigh, a child has to eat something warm. I just hope his appetite doesn't startle the attendants. After catering to Ludwig for over two days, Lumian recognized the importance of his traveler's bag, capable of storing ample rations and desserts for long trips with the boy. The boy had to eat frequently. Amidst the whistle, Lumian settled into his seat, absorbing the rhythmic clanging sounds as the scenery rapidly retreated on both sides. 
In less than 15 minutes, the colossal steam-spewing train departed from the bustling metropolis through the cave door carved into the high wall. It left behind a metropolis pulsating with desires, immersed in both joy and pain. Lumian half-closed his eyes, overhearing someone in the private room ahead sigh, as if reciting a poem. Goodbye, Trier. At 8 p.m., under the cover of complete darkness, the steam locomotive came to a halt at its scheduled stop, Dardell Station. Situated on the outskirts of the upper coastal province's Faust region, in Darter Town, the platform was already bustling with 20 to 30 men and women eagerly rushing to different carriages. Devoid of luggage, their faces radiated enthusiasm. Knock! 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 A middle-aged man, sporting thick black hair and a slightly hooked chin, rapped on the glass window corresponding to Lumian's private room. With interest, Lumian pushed open the window and greeted with a smile, What can I do for you? Monsieur, would you like a drink? Perhaps a cozy bed instead of a sofa, the middle-aged man inquired in intision, his accent heavy. A bar with its own motel? Lumian was enlightened. It seemed like local merchants were soliciting customers right on the platform. That's right, that's right. Our bar boasts some charming little frogs, the middle-aged man winked suggestively. Little frogs? Lugano, seated across from Lumian, asked, puzzled. The middle-aged man pondered for a moment and explained, that's our slang here in Coastal. It means the same as your trier pussies. In trier, pussies often carry dual meanings, referring to both female reproductive organs and prostitutes. Is that so? Lumian had suspected as much but wasn't entirely certain. Seated beside Lugano, Ludwig chimed in eagerly, anything good to eat? Without awaiting the middle-aged man's response, Lumian teased Ludwig with a smile, I thought you were going to ask if the meat was tender or chewy and if it tasted good. Initially unresponsive, Ludwig suddenly realized something and cursed, sick. Observing this, the middle-aged man swiftly introduced the local specialties. Meanwhile, outside the station, dogs started barking in the town. A lone bark triggered a chorus of canine voices, shattering the night's silence. The middle-aged man's expression shifted, tainted with an indescribable sense of fear. Chapter 506 Illness Amidst the nighttime cacophony of the town's barking dogs, Lumian let out a low chuckle. Do you have that many dogs in Dardell? Yeah, yes. The middle-aged man managed a hesitant smile. Something is off as expected. Has something happened to this town? Lumian had intentionally inquired, keen on observing the reactions of the resident across from him. Amidst the persisting dog chorus, he concentrated on gauging the other party's luck. He had no plans to leave the steam locomotive and venture into Dardell for investigation. His only recourse was to probe into the luck of the town's residents, anticipating hidden problems before they could unexpectedly spread to the train station. While Termoboros could influence his luck observation, there was always a chance of being misled. Lumian, lacking expertise in divination or prophecy, had limited options for gathering information without leaving the steam locomotive. Factoring in various environmental details, he aimed to discern potential issues. In Lumian's view, the middle-aged man's luck took on a ghastly green hue. This indicated an impending illness, a rather peculiar one. The specifics, such as when or what kind of illness, eluded Lumian's current sequence. Dog barking inducing fear, future special illness, do Dardell's wild dogs cause calamities by biting and spreading diseases? That's a plausible explanation, and it's not a beyonder incident, but that means there's a potential solution. The man outside seems to be grappling with a hint of despair. Lumian turned to the middle-aged man who was soliciting customers and said, Can you bring over the food we ordered? We can do so if the meal cost exceeds two verldor. You know, it's not easy for us to enter the platform, the middle-aged man, now smiling again, replied. At that moment, the clamor of dozens of dogs subsided, no longer as intense as before. No problem, Lumian casually ordered a variety of dishes, apple liqueur, deep-fried potato pancakes, shrimp and gravy, dardel meat sauce, stewed pork, salt marsh mutton, 
buttered pancakes, and whipped cheese. The total cost amounted to ten verldor. Ludwig couldn't help but gulp with each mention of a dish. For hours prior, an attendant had delivered a four-person standard dinner. Despite managing to finish two portions alone, Ludwig remained unsatisfied. He had also retrieved multiple pieces of jerky from Lumian's traveler's bag. Two hours ago, he had his first supper, consisting of cheese, dessert, bread, jerky, and more. Now, he was hungry again. The middle-aged man, who had used simple words and symbols to record the dish names, couldn't resist asking, is the food provided in a carriage of this level not tasty? Otherwise, why would Ludwig look as though he hadn't eaten dinner? Lumian responded in turn, that's right. Don't ever expect to eat tasty food on a steam locomotive. After noting down the dish names and receiving five Verldor banknotes as a down payment, the middle-aged man with a slightly hooked chin moved to another private room. Wait, Lumian suddenly called out. Is there anything else, monsieur? The middle-aged man turned around and inquired. Lumian smiled and said, you don't look well. If you don't want to get sick, you need more rest in the next few days. The middle-aged man froze, his expression struck by lightning. After a momentary pause, panic and fear mixed on his face. All, all right. Thank you. He turned around in a hurry and dashed out of the platform, forgetting to solicit other customers. Dardell's abnormality is indeed linked to illnesses. Lumian mused as he withdrew his gaze thoughtfully. Lugano asked with curiosity, why can't I tell that he's sub-healthy and could fall ill at any moment? Being a doctor, he possessed corresponding abilities. Even without activating his spirit vision, he could discern various external manifestations of a person's body. Recognizing a concealed illness and with Lumian's warning, he activated his spirit vision to observe the person's ether body. Subhealthy was a term coined by Emperor Roselle, but it had only gained popularity in Intus's medical world in recent years. He's not currently in a subhealthy state, but it's very likely that he will contract a special illness. Lumian used Lugano's questions to confirm that the townsfolk's illness didn't originate from him. He smiled and responded to Lugano's question, it's never wrong to care about others' health and encourage them to rest more. Instinctively, Lugano revealed an expression that said, I don't buy it. Then, he masked it with a smile. He seems to share that concern. That's right, Lumian replied patronizingly. Dardell's barking subsided and resounded at times. Sometimes, it was just outside the platform, and at other times, it came from the edge of the town. Lumian listened quietly and sighed inwardly. Why am I encountering something like this again? Do I bring calamity, or does calamity lure me here? From the looks of it, the problem in Dardell has been around for a while. It has nothing to do with my arrival. No matter how I avoid it or make choices via the use of others, I'll always be drawn to calamities and unknowingly approach them. Is this why a hunter with an angelic level and the Blood Emperor's remnant aura will inevitably encounter an abnormal situation despite their low sequence? In the future, will a novelist write about my experiences like German Sparrows? Then, the line he's always accompanied by calamity would be included. As time ticked by, the middle-aged man who had been soliciting customers arrived with a bar waiter, each carrying a food container. Is this what you want? He and the waiter handed plates and glasses through the window. Seeing the table covered in an exquisite tablecloth filled with tempting food, Lumian took a sip of the slightly sour apple liqueur and paid the remaining five verl d'or for the meal. We'll collect the cutlery in an hour. We won't be disturbing you, will we? The middle-aged man asked politely. Lumian nodded, giving them permission. After sidestepping with the waiter for a moment, the middle-aged man found himself returning to his original position. He couldn't resist the urge to inquire, Monsieur, how do you know I'm about to fall ill? Lumian, gesturing towards Lugano across the way, explained, My friend is a renowned doctor in Trier. The term renowned here applied to a wanted poster. Without awaiting the middle-aged man's reply, Lumian casually inquired, What's your name? Just call me Pierre, the middle-aged man replied, hunched over as he observed Lumian in the snug private room on the steam locomotive. 
Do you folks fancy that name around here too? Lumine grinned and asked, Do you think you'll get sick too? Pierre's eyelids twitched, his expression momentarily freezing. Instinctively, he replied, No, no. Just a bit concerned. Well then, get some rest, drink more water, and perhaps seek out the clergyman at the cathedral for repentance, Lumian advised without pressing further. Pierre moved towards the front of the locomotive in silence, hoping to drum up more business. However, his steps seemed burdened, as if his feet were encased in lead, each stride a struggle. Woof, woof, woof. The barking resumed near the platform. Pierre's face contorted, overwhelmed with worry and fear. Suddenly, he turned around, shaking off the waiter and rushing to the window of the small private room where Lumian and the others were situated. Save me, doctor, save me, he pleaded, pressing his hands against the glass with a desperate expression. Lumian seized the moment, stating, unless you disclose the cause of the illness, my friend won't be able to treat you. The commotion reached the passengers in the adjacent private rooms, but in their slumber, they were indifferent to the unfolding drama. Pierre swallowed hard, stealing a glance at the equally terrified bar waiter. Yes, yes. Before he could complete his sentence, a figure materialized on the platform's wall. The figure stood firmly, legs apart, body contorted, but its head tilted upward, fixated on some distant point. It was a man clad in tweed garments, conspicuously marked by tears and frays. His facial muscles contorted dramatically, and his eyes were rolled back, leaving only a white patch visible. Saliva dribbled from his open mouth as he attempted to speak. Woof! 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 The barking harmonized with the other canine sounds in Dardell, forming a disconcerting chorus. It's derangement! Pierre finally exclaimed. Derangement? Lumian shifted his attention from the man barking on the wall to Lugano. Lugano observed the abnormality for a moment before slowly shaking his head at Lumian. His message was clear this wasn't your typical case of rabies. Pierre, mistakenly thinking Lumian was addressing him, was on the brink of emotional collapse. Yes, derangement. I don't know when it started. People in our town began turning into barking lunatics. Initially, it was just one, but then two, three, ten. Many acquaintances of mine got infected, completely losing their minds. They only bark like dogs and are most active during the night. Did they contract it from being bitten by these lunatics? Lugano inquired with a furrowed brow. No, the ones I know weren't bitten, but they still went mad. I, I feel like I'm soon next. Pierre exclaimed in despair. You didn't seek help from the government? Lumian was puzzled, thinking that official beyonders wouldn't allow such a situation to escalate. We heard about a village having a similar situation as derangement, they reported it to the government, and then the whole village vanished. We. We didn't dare approach either the government or the church. Pierre explained frantically, with the bar waiter by his side equally terrified. Lumian's eyes narrowed. Where are the people from the town's health department, police station, and the cathedral's padre? They were the first to succumb to madness. Pierre, caught up in distress, didn't consider Lumian's intentions in asking. The initial casualties were the padre, police, and health officials. Lumian raised an eyebrow and remarked, So why haven't you tried escaping from Dardell? Escape. Pierre and the bar waiter were startled, staring blankly at Lumian. Beneath the crimson moonlight, the whites of their eyes took on a bloodshot hue. Chapter 507 Dead End Pierre and the bar waiter locked eyes with Lumian and the others, their bloodshot gaze shifting from vacant to sheer terror. In hushed tones, they uttered frantically, You folks are aware. You folks are aware that there's derangement here. Abruptly, Pierre's face contorted and he bellowed in hysteria, none of you can leave. Once the outsiders catch wind of this, we're all done for. He swiftly maneuvered through the steam locomotive's open window, attempting to climb in and forcefully pull Lumian and the others out. In response, Lugano rose to his feet, delivering a powerful blow with his right fist. 
With a resounding thud, Pierre slumped, unconscious, hanging awkwardly from the window. The bar waiter, seemingly unhinged, trampled over the fallen man, attempting to leap into the carriage. Lugano struck again, his punch rendering the bloodshot-eyed bar waiter unconscious. He slumped over Pierre, creating an unusual tableau. They didn't abnormally transform into monsters. Lumian had previously speculated that the two town folks had succumbed suddenly to derangement. Turning to Lumian, Lugano inquired in a low voice, What do we do? What do we do? Lumian echoed the doctor's inquiry. The unfolding events not only displayed an abnormality but also left him with a sense of inner conflict and displacement. The peculiar derangement, causing people to lose their sanity and transform into canine-like creatures, coupled with the consecutive onset of various illnesses, unmistakably hinted at supernatural forces at play. However, the mystery deepened as Pierre and the other townsfolk, who were evidently concerned about keeping derangement a secret, freely disclosed the information to Lumian. This apparent contradiction could be attributed to Pierre's overwhelming mental stress, pushed to the brink. Lumian's mention of future sickness served as the tipping point, prompting Pierre to instinctively guard the secret from leaking when reminded. Yet, the lingering question persisted, why not escape? Faced with an infectious and unstoppable derangement, wouldn't it be prudent for ordinary humans to flee Dardell and return once the plague had subsided? Even if they feared attracting attention from the authorities by fleeing, a temporary escape into the nearby mountains after addressing those potentially afflicted could provide a solution. Unless there was some force preventing the citizens of Dardell from escaping. Lumian deduced this from various details. The townsfolk were cognizant of similar derangement cases elsewhere, resulting in entire villages being wiped out by the authorities. Normally, such incidents would be reported as a tragic disaster with everyone buried. After the initial infection, key figures like the cathedral's clergymen, the police, and health department officials succumbed to madness, severing Dardell's connection with regional authorities from the start. It appeared as if an intelligent and dangerous individual deliberately spread derangement, employing tactics to hinder the townsfolk from escaping. Why would this mastermind allow Pierre and others to divulge the situation to the doctor on the steam locomotive? If the steam train were to stay in Dardell, unable to reach Port Gotti by the next morning, it would undoubtedly attract official beyonder investigation. Lumian, thinking from the mastermind's perspective, considered it illogical to choose a transportation hub regularly frequented by steam locomotives. Even without Lumian's inquiries, those choosing to enter Dardell to sleep under a warm blanket and sample beautiful frogs would eventually notice the abnormality, raising suspicions. They couldn't all be made to stay behind, could they? This would lead to an investigation. There are many contradictions, inconsistencies, and inexplicable aspects. He's smart yet foolish, cautious yet careless. Lumian, contemplating the intricacies, turned to Lugano and said, What else can we do? Of course, we have to find a way to inform the authorities about this. Don't tell me you want to investigate the source of the derangement and save the residents here. Do you? I didn't expect you to be so noble. Lugano smiled awkwardly. The latter possibility had never crossed his mind. How should we inform the authorities, he asked sincerely, admitting his lack of experience in such matters. The simplest solution is to get the train police here and tell them what Pierre said. Have them use the train's radio to contact the relevant departments in the Faust area or the upper coastal province, Lumian suggested casually. However, Lugano hesitated, expressing concern, but, but as witnesses, we'll be invited to assist in the investigation. Our, our identities are fake, and even if we use your mystical item to change our appearances, it's easy to expose that we're beyonders under the influence of some mysticism abilities. Lumian pondered for a moment and offered an alternative with a smile, then find an empty room on the platform, pile dozens of bundles of explosives, and detonate them. The explosion will send the roof flying, destroying the house. This way, the conductor and the train police will report it quickly, and the officials in the Faust area will take notice. When they investigate further, they'll discover the hidden problem in Dardell. How about that? We won't need to personally show our faces in this plan, right? 
Lugano considered the proposal but raised another concern. When the authorities investigate further, they'll discover that we've interacted with Dardell's residents. They'll worry that we might also be in danger of contracting derangement. When the time comes, we won't be able to pass the scrutiny. Lumian felt a twinge of frustration, recalling how he and his sister had been trapped in Cordu after the abnormality. Everything they did had its cons. He chuckled and said, then investigate the source of the derangement personally and blast it into pieces. This will completely resolve the problem without attracting the official's attention. Ludwig, who had consumed countless suppers, swallowed the deep-fried potato pie in his mouth and calmly said, after informing the authorities about derangement, why stay here and wait for them to investigate? Can't we just leave, change our identities, and take another steam locomotive to another port? Ah. Uh. Lumian was taken aback. Why hadn't I thought of such a simple idea? Just now, the more Lugano and I discussed, the deeper we delved into a dead end. We were entirely focused on finding a reason and excuse for entering Dardell to investigate the source of the derangement. A realization hit Lumian, and his heart skipped a beat. Nonchalantly, he gazed at Lugano, assessing the doctor's luck. The other party's luck in the future would also be tainted with a ghastly green. With a smile, Lumian said to Lugano, you also have the possibility of contracting derangement. Lugano was taken aback for a moment before asking with a pale face, really? Think of it as a joke, Lumian turned his head, seemingly relaxed, and said to Ludwig, see, there are many benefits to studying more. In the past, you wouldn't have thought of such a solution and only knew nothing but eating. Ignoring the hunter, Ludwig forked a piece of mutton into his mouth. What should I do? What should I do? Lugano muttered to himself, attempting to use his doctor powers on himself to see if he could be saved. Lumian interrupted him. No rush. There's just a risk of contracting the illness. You just need to leave this place before you get truly infected. As he spoke, he stood up and walked out of the private room. Wah, where are you going? Lugano blurted out. Lumian slipped his hands into his pockets and responded with a smile. Inform the authorities about derangement. Lugano was momentarily at a loss for words and expressions. All he could do was watch in a daze as Lumian strolled out of the private room. Reaching the train's washroom, Lumian locked the door and activated the black mark representing Spirit World Traversal. His figure swiftly vanished, reappearing in apartment 702 at 9 Rue Orosai. Cartier de la Cathedral commemorative in Trier. Neither Franca nor Jenna was asleep at this hour. One was engrossed in a novel, while the other contemplated what knowledge to impart to Rabbit Chassel. Wah, why are you back? Franca jumped in fright. She had the illusion that she had just dropped him off at school in the morning and found him at home, legs up, eating snacks, and watching television in the afternoon. Lumian glanced at Franca and smiled. We encountered a beyonder incident and wish to inform the authorities through your channels to have them resolve it. Franca exclaimed in surprise and amusement, Yeah, you encountered another beyonder incident? What a mysticism catastrophe detector. Jenna looked at Lumian and suddenly felt that it was a good thing for him to leave Trier. I didn't want to either. Lumian spread his hands sincerely. Franca exhaled and said, Where is it? What kind of incident? In Dardell and Upper Coastal Province's Faust region. Lumian briefly recounted the situation. Franca and Jenna were both surprised and terrified by the contagious derangement. Simultaneously, Franca muttered inwardly, I wonder how 007 will react to this surprise. He's always telling me to get out of the market district. If I really do, he'll realize that not only will Beyonder cases and Trier's other districts pile up on him, the mystical catastrophes of Intus's other provinces will also descend upon him. Ah, that's right. What does it have to do with me? It's all Lumian's fault. Thankfully, this fellow is heading to the Potter kingdom in the future. No matter what Beyonder incidents he encounters, it's no longer 007's problem. He can't possibly collaborate across borders. After explaining the situation in Dardell, Lumian didn't linger. 
he teleported back to the washroom of the steam locomotive's business carriage. He turned on the tap and washed his hands without hesitation. Then, he left the washroom and returned to the small private room. He said to Lugano, the authorities will react soon. Let's prepare to leave. Lugano sprang to his feet. At that moment, the unconscious Pierre slowly regained consciousness, shaking the bar waiter off his body and landing on the platform. Lumian looked at him and smiled. We'll stay and investigate the source of derangement. Can you tell me who Patient Zero was? Who was it? Pierre didn't lose his mind and attack Lumian and the others like before. Instead, he fell into deep thought. Chapter 508, Patient Zero Lugano, who had been listening, shot Lumian a puzzled glance. He couldn't fathom why Lumian would strike up a casual conversation with Pierre just as they were on the verge of departing. A few more moments, and the official Beyonders would make their entrance. Besides, delving too deep into this matter could invite trouble down the road. They might end up under scrutiny, or worse, attract the attention of the derangement source, prompting immediate intervention. Pierre pondered for more than ten seconds before uttering with uncertainty, Patient Zero seemed to be a guest renting a room at our bar. Foreigner? Lumian inquired with composure. Having already briefed the official Beyonders about the derangement through Franca and resolved to find an opportunity to teleport away later, Lumian was no longer as tense as before. Thus, before leaving, he aimed to unravel more about derangement and construct a plausible explanation for the inconsistencies. This quest for information, problem analysis, and uncovering of clues and answers was all part of a conspirer's acting. With some idle time on his hands, Lumian seized the chance to digest some of the potion. Lumian wasn't overly concerned about the potential repercussions of being privy to this situation. Could the information on derangement hold a candle to 0-01's sealed intel? Moreover, as long as he didn't go berserk on the spot, he could later seek assistance from his superior to explore potential solutions. Pierre contemplated for a few seconds, his expression reflecting confusion, and then he said, probably. I can't recall her name, and I have no idea where she came from. All I remember is that she suddenly lost her mind and dashed from the motel upstairs to the bar. She tried to bite people and barked like a dog. The infected foreigner spreading derangement to Dardell? Then why were the townsfolk displaying no inclination to escape this place? Is this also a manifestation of derangement? Lumian asked thoughtfully, did she manage to bite anyone? What happened to her? We took care of her before she could sink her teeth into anyone. We apprehended her and handed her over to the health department, Pierre recollected. Sent to the health department? Lumian nodded slowly. Did the next person to succumb to madness come from the health department? Yes, exactly. Pierre affirmed this time. Lumian pondered for a moment and inquired, what did the resident look like? A young woman. Her face was a bit pale and her eyes were vacant. I, I can't recall her appearance. Pierre couldn't help but raise his palm and rub his head. Upon hearing this, Lumian's heart stirred. If the root of all the abnormalities in Dardell indeed stemmed from a deranged individual, many contradictions could find an explanation. Patient Zero was already in a state of madness, instinctively, she would spread derangement to those around her in a supernatural sense, regardless of whether it was an isolated village or a bustling town serving as a transportation hub. Simultaneously, she would subconsciously employ her ability to disseminate the supernatural derangement, dropping hints to the townsfolk that leaving wasn't an option. She would control all channels that might carry the news. However, Due to her madness and lack of thorough consideration, she didn't explicitly order the townsfolk not to discuss derangement with the steam locomotive passengers. Certainly, it wasn't necessarily due to a lack of thorough consideration. Lumian believed it was more plausible that the lunatic's instincts desired to involve more people and infect them with derangement. Consequently, people who were aware of this weren't permitted to leave or seek help from the authorities. On the other hand, the prohibition didn't prevent residents from discussing derangement with passers-by. This was a limited and relatively safe method of contagion. 
passengers who knew about derangement were akin to approaching the source of the plague. For instance, Lugano's luck had turned, increasing the probability of contracting the disease. Lumian and he had forgotten the option of escaping. The more they communicated, the more desperate they became, ultimately reaching a dead end. They were resolute in entering Dardell to investigate. This was a precursor to becoming infected with derangement. Unbeknownst to them, they had inadvertently received a mental cue. With this in mind, Lumian suspected that the young woman might be a survivor of the village that had previously been eradicated, a potential carrier who had escaped the authorities' purge. She had intertwined these memories with derangement and disseminated them. That was how the residents of Dardell learned about a similar plague in a village wiped out by the authorities. Typically, they lacked the qualifications or means to know such things. Having formulated this preliminary hypothesis, Lumian smiled and turned to Pierre and the bar waiter, asking, where is the village you mentioned that was destroyed by the authorities because of derangement? I, I think it's somewhere in the Odhornasis province. Pierre recalled the rumors he had heard. Odhornasis province. That's quite a distance from upper coastal province. Moreover, there's no direct steam locomotive, it requires a transfer through a few provinces in the west mid seashore coast or Trier. How could you folks, who rarely leave Dardell, have heard such a rumor? Did a bar or passenger from Odhornasis province pass by this transportation hub? The more Lumian pondered, the more he leaned toward his hypothesis. He refrained from pressing further and probed Pierre, this derangement holds significant research value. We'll venture into Dardell to investigate its source and try to find a cure. However, preparations will take some time. Moreover, it's night time. At dawn, we will step into Dardell. We won't depart until we resolve the problem. Lumian stressed the phrases will enter Dardell and will not leave for the time being to gauge Pierre and the bar waiter's reactions. Their expressions underwent several changes, and they were no longer as hysterical as before. After a few moments, Pierre implored, you must come to town tomorrow. No problem, Lumian replied with a reassuring smile. He was now even more convinced that this was an instinctive infection and influence. There was no structured approach to handling the alterations. As long as he avoided triggering a crucial matter or even took the initiative to broach the topic of cooperation, he could effectively deceive the source of derangement. Observing Pierre and the bar waiter about to move toward the other windows of the steam locomotive, Lumian called out to them, wait a moment. After the two of them turned in surprise, Lumian gestured towards the table between the two sofas. You can take the cutlery away now. Pierre and the bar waiter glanced at the dining table in confusion, realizing that only remnants were left on the empty plates. Had they finished eating already? The delivery men hadn't even departed yet. Pierre and the bar waiter were aware that they had spent a considerable amount of time discussing the derangement issue, but it still felt surreal. Won't they eating too quickly? Was he feeding three lions? Burp. Ludwig wiped his mouth with a tablecloth, a content expression on his face. After the two townsfolk cleared away the cutlery, gathered their food boxes, and departed from the platform, Lumian smiled at Lugano and remarked, Continue watching. Chill. I can't chill. How are we to escape when the official beyonders arrive? Lugano's heart felt like it was being grilled. Observing his reaction, Lumian muttered silently, he's indeed acting like a wild beyonder with a low sequence and little knowledge. He doesn't show anything special like Ludwig. Is he really an ordinary wild beyonder who only accepted a mission to follow me? Simultaneously, Lumian focused his attention and checked Lugano's luck. He realized that the ghastly green traces had vanished, and there was no grisly calamity in store. This meant that the doctor no longer had the potential to contract derangement, and he likely wouldn't be embroiled in the official's operations to deal with Dardell's abnormality later. After a while, Lumian heard a loud noise and saw the night suddenly brighten outside. Light streamed down from midair. Lumian looked up and noticed two colossal objects floating in the night. They were two airships clad in dark gray paint, frantically spinning their paddles. They were much smaller than the one Lumian had seen in Trier. 
the condensed light shone from their front and lower positions, converging on the edge of Dardell. Simultaneously, the town erupted in a cacophony of barking once more, as if movement was taking place everywhere. The officials from the Faust region are here? Lumian averted his gaze, awaiting the outcome. Shouts, cries, gunshots, and various beams of sunlight continued for nearly an hour before completely subsiding. Before long, a team of police officers entered the private room, questioning the now disguised, fake identification wielding Lumian and company's interactions with Dardell's residents. Other than anything related to derangement, Lumian told them everything honestly. He was ready to teleport away with Ludwig and Lugano at any moment. After recording and comparing tickets and identification, the police officers left the carriage. Lumian patiently waited until dawn. The police officers returned, presenting three contracts and requesting their signatures. The contract explained that the disturbance from the previous night had resulted from a special military operation, and everyone was obligated to keep it confidential. Does what I revealed before my signature count? Lumian chuckled inwardly and calmly signed with an alias. His fake identity had just been activated, and it had minimal mystic connections. After the police departed, Lumian, having intentionally gone through the official process firsthand, intended to grasp Lugano and Ludwig's shoulders and teleport away. Uncertain if the contract signed with an alias would be discovered, he aimed to avoid potential risks. At that moment, Lumian noticed a towering figure behind Lugano. It was his messenger, Penitent Bainfell, draped in a dark clergyman's robe and surrounded by charred flames. Bainfell sent a folded letter drifting towards Lumian. Lugano was taken aback to see a piece of paper materialize. He instinctively glanced behind him, but Lumian opened the letter and perused its contents. Based on the feedback I received, this should be the escape of a sealed artifact. That sealed artifact resembles a young woman. It first surfaced during a catastrophe in Odhornasis province. Most of the time, she remains in her normal state, appearing lifeless, pale, and muddle-headed. However, once she enters a state of madness, she gradually infects the surrounding people with the same derangement as her. There's no definite transmission pattern. She might not be in the same state every time she goes mad. The same goes for her derangement symptoms. In her normal state, although she's like an unintelligent ghost and acts on instinct, she possesses a power akin to the power of speech, where whatever she says comes true, and if she declares someone dead, they will die. Chapter 509 Ironclad Merchant Ship Also possesses the ability to turn spoken words into reality. Before the derangement took hold, she acted on instinct, her pale face and lifeless eyes mirroring the description of Patient Zero by Pierre. Lumian delved into the catastrophe's details through Franca's letter, gaining a deeper understanding. His speculations, rooted in Pierre's answers and behavior, aligned closely with the truth. The divergence lay in Lumian's belief that the initial infected individual was a genuine lunatic that acted on instinct, while official information identified her as a humanoid sealed artifact, still governed by instinct, that lacked intelligence whether in her normal state or deranged state. Lumian's speculations, however, didn't rule out the possibility that the young woman had transformed into a true lunatic, one that instinctively spread derangement, due to some form of corruption, necessitating her sealing. As for why it was a seal and not a direct eradication, Lumian could roughly guess the reason. The ability to kill anyone at will was still coveted, despite various restrictions. The power to eliminate anyone at will remained highly sought after, despite certain constraints. Whether it was the Inquisition, the Machinery Hive Mind, or Bureau 8, they all prioritized sealing over destruction if a viable method existed. Lumian knew they might even depend on her to handle future crises. His eyes moved down the letter's contents, absorbing the information. As for additional details, confidentiality prevents the source from providing more. Keep a vigilant eye on individuals like her. If you uncover anything suspicious, immediately distance yourself and report it to the authorities. No specifics about her origins, the sealing technique, the manifestation of speech, or how to counteract derangement were provided. 
no concrete seal level or number. Despite Dardell's abnormality and prior descriptions, even if it isn't a grade 1 sealed artifact, it holds significant and terrifying properties among grade 2 sealed artifacts. Lumian pondered briefly, then stowed the letter in his traveler's bag without incinerating it on the spot. At that moment, Lugano was observing his back in bewilderment. Despite activating his spirit vision, he found nothing. Lumian's messenger, Penitent Banefell, had long departed. Let's go, Lumian sighed, reaching out to grasp Ludwig and Lugano's shoulders. His foremost regret was the wasted third of the 400 Verl Dwarfare. He still needed to source different cafes for Ludwig's breakfast, he couldn't allow him to be satiated from one place to avoid raising suspicion. In the next instant, Lugano felt as if he had crossed into the spirit world he'd just glimpsed. Instead of being a mere observer, he plunged deeper into layers of saturated colors, bathing in the light of seven different colored brilliances overhead. Surrounded by indescribable faces and figures, he sped toward an unknown destination. Dizziness overcame him, but in just over ten seconds, his feet met solid ground. Buildings in beige, brownish-red, and light yellow surrounded him. Lumian hadn't teleported too far and chose Faust, with Dardell falling under its jurisdiction. Under the dawn's light, Lumian adorned the lie earring and retrieved a tweed coat from his traveler's bag, seamlessly altering his appearance, height, and attire in a secluded alley. In less than a minute, he morphed into an entirely different person. Though not the first time Lugano had witnessed this, he couldn't help but be slightly shocked by the scene. What a mystical item and formidable ability! Whether it was the silver earring allowing one to adjust appearance within a certain range or the coin bag with seemingly infinite capacity, Lugano had never seen anything like it. Occasionally, he'd heard other bounty hunters speak of official Beyonders possessing Beyondo level disguises. Lumian tossed the lie earring to Lugano, casually stating, Get three more sets of fake identities and buy steam locomotive tickets that will arrive in Port Gotti today. Am I a translator, guide, or your attendant? Lugano criticized as he caught the mystical silver earring. He forced a smile and said, I've never been to the Faust area, so I don't know who to find for fake identities. The principles are common. I trust your experience, Lumian replied with a smile. All right, since you're paying. Lugano muttered silently, retrieving a change of clothes from his suitcase. At the Northern Trier train station, Lumian had already paid him 1,000 Vroldor for the fake identities and informed him that he would handle similar expenses in the future. After Ludwig put on the lie earring, Lugano left the alley with his suitcase. Lumian activated the knee's face, altering his appearance once more, and trailed Lugano from afar while holding Ludwig, who was adjusting his height and appearance. He wanted to observe the doctor's actions and reactions in an unfamiliar place to uncover potential issues. To prevent Ludwig from protesting, Lumian held down his wide-brimmed hat and tossed him a few loaves of baguettes. Ludwig, not clamoring for a hot meal, obediently nibbled on the food as Lumian pulled him along. In the early morning, the bars were closed, so Lugano headed to the nearest market and approached a prowler suspected to be a mobster. Using money, he bought access and discovered where to obtain fake identities. Throughout the process, Lugano appeared no different from an ordinary bounty hunter. Lumian wasn't disappointed or displeased. He calmly followed Lugano until he secured a differently scheduled steam locomotive. Only then did he dispel the knee's face and rendezvous with his companion. In Port Gotti, Upper Coastal Province, Lumian occupied a luxurious hotel room near the sea. Standing before the expansive glass window, he observed the azure sky, seemingly washed in water, contrasting with the clear and pure sea below, resembling gems. The clear and melodious calls of gurgling seabirds, accompanied by their graceful figures, traversed between white clouds, white beaches, and ship masts. Even without opening the window, Lumian could intuitively feel the refreshing sea breeze from the sea. This port, a main entry point for products from industrial cities in the west mid seashore coast into the Fog Sea, was famous for trade and shipbuilding, boasting prosperity. Contrary to Triarian's beliefs about scarce sunlight in the north, Port Gotti remained perpetually bathed in sunlight, with autumn maintaining a mild temperature. 
As Ludwig chewed, Lumian admired the seascape and distant harbor, awaiting Lugano's return with tickets to the Fainapotter Kingdom's Port Santa. At that moment, Penitent Bainfell, abnormally tall and clad in a black clergyman's robe, emerged from the void, silently handing Lumian a letter. Thank you, Lumian acknowledged out of habit before taking the letter and unfolding it. Dardell's derangement has been contained. They've eliminated the severely infected residents, treated the slightly infected, but the sealed artifact is nowhere to be found. According to the information gathered at the scene, it appears she returned to normal a few days ago and left Dardell. Her current whereabouts are unknown. The spreading derangement resulted from the severely corrupted Sea of Mines. The townsfolk's abnormal behavior, unwilling to leave Dardell yet keen on informing passersby about derangement, likely stems from the corrupted Sea of Mines. Anthony's recently learned terminology describes it as a sea of collective subconscious forming a mind world with the island of consciousness and the spirituality sky. Be cautious in the future, there's a risk of being drawn to another mystical catastrophe caused by the sealed artifact. They didn't catch the sealed artifact. Lumian clicked his tongue, sensing a brewing headache. Honestly, there was nothing he could do. Upon arriving in Dardell, the other party had already departed leaving the catastrophe still unfolding. At 3 p.m., Lumian, accompanied by Lugano and Ludwig, boarded the Flying Bird, a merchant ship bound for the Fainapotter Kingdom's Port Santa. Opting for a first-class cabin, they secured a suite featuring a master bedroom, a child's room, a servant's quarters, a living room, and a washroom. With specialized attendants at their service, they gained access to the most upscale dining room and the exclusive cigar room. The cost, a hefty 700 verl d'or, was nearly equivalent to Charlie's annual income as a hotel attendant. Money was something Lumian cared about, yet not too much. Past experiences and his sister's guidance had made him instinctively calculative, but the relatively easy acquisition of money, like the 30,000 verl d'or he obtained from the safe at Sal de Ball Breeze, lessened the sting. Besides, he already possessed the potion formula, main ingredients, and supplementary ingredients for his next sequence, eliminating the immediate need for accumulating funds. As a devoted reader of the Adventurer series, Lumian knew of the numerous human-shaped treasures at sea. If he needed money, he was willing to imitate his idol and cull them. The Flying Bird, the latest steam-powered ship, was entirely made of steel, with no sails but smokestacks emitting fog and masts with watchtowers. Iron gray with intertwining red and gold colors, the ship boasted a wide deck, numerous gun emplacements, and surpassed classic sailboats in displacement, passenger capacity, speed, and sturdiness. When compared to those backward-era fellows, it was like an adult looking down on children. Before the Cordu incident, Lumian had considered embarking on a maritime journey, inspired by the adventurer German Sparrow, to entice his sister. However, Aurora had deferred this plan until after his university graduation. In the spacious, brightly lit living room of the first-class cabin, Lumian gazed out the window at the Azure Sea, lost in thought. Oh, oh! Amidst the whistle, mist billowed from the chimneys of the flying bird. The massive iron-armored merchant ship slowly departed Port Gotti, accompanied by the symphony of various machinery starting to operate, heading into the depths of the sea. Squawk! Squawk. The cries of seabirds reverberated through the clouds. Chapter 510, First Day at Sea Amidst the billowing smoke, the flying bird cut through the fog sea, heading west towards the Intis colony in the fog sea archipelago. They were the same islands in the saying, never trust an islander. From there, it would journey south to Port Santa, northwest of the Fainapotter Kingdom. Though the fog sea was notorious for its heavy fog, the offshore areas were less affected. Lumian spent the next three hours under the bright sun, immersed in a book, an introductory textbook for the Fainapotter Kingdom's Highlander language. While he had Lugano, his translator and guide, Lumian didn't want to be completely reliant on him for information and communication. If anything happened to Lugano, or if he were to deliberately manipulate translations, Lumian would be vulnerable. 
mastering some basic Highlander phrases before reaching Port Santo would allow Lumian to verify the accuracy of translations and give him some independence. Typically, learning Highlander in less than 10 days was nearly impossible for Beyonders not from the reader pathway. However, Lumian had a significant advantage, his knowledge of ancient Faisak, the original language from which Highlander evolved. The two languages shared many similarities in sentence structure, meaning, grammar, and word structure, allowing Lumian to learn Highlander much faster. When can dinner be delivered? Ludwig paced restlessly in front of Lumian's recliner, frustrated that the exclusive attendant hadn't yet arrived with dinner, despite the darkening sky. Lumian closed his book as the sun dipped below the horizon, casting long shadows illuminated by the kerosene lamp. With a chuckle, he said, blame yourself for ordering so much. They need time to cook it all. Thankfully, the first-class cabin has an independent kitchen, otherwise they'd be overwhelmed. Before he could finish, the doorbell rang. As the chimes reverberated, Lugano opened the thick vermilion door to find the young attendant pushing a dining cart into the room, its surface covered in a thick yellowish-brown carpet. Under Ludwig's eager gaze, the attendant calmly laid out the tablecloth and utensils. This is a local delicacy, gaudy herring. It involves marinating smoked soft herring fillets, onions, and carrot slices in olive oil, thyme, bay leaves, and other spices for 24 to 48 hours. It's perfect with warm potato salad. And these are deep-fried fries. In Upper Coastal Province, there's a saying, without fries, there's no heaven. There's also raisin cream bread. These are fresh oysters and shellfish. This is Faust turkey, ham and mushroom burrito. This is Umu's duck minced meat and coarse brown sugar vanilla waffle. This is traditional orange cheese. And there's also a pungent gray cheese. Would you like to give it a try? This is Upper Coastal Province's favorite apple cider, one. Lumian listened with genuine interest as the attendant described each dish. He noticed that, despite his impatience, Ludwig didn't immediately attack his food. Instead, he waited patiently until the attendant finished before sampling the pre-meal bread and savoring the pickled herring. Did something awaken in him? Lumian glanced at the child in confusion. Not bad, Ludwig remarked with a professional air. The smoky taste is just right. It blends perfectly with the fragrance and seasoning. Despite his praise, seven-year-old Lumian couldn't help but find the whole scene with Ludwig's chubby, youthful face and serious demeanor comical. Port Gotti, being near the sea, boasted excellent seafood. The oysters and other shellfish were not only tastier than most restaurants in Trier, but also considerably cheaper. Lumian sipped his brewed apple cider, enjoying the unique local flavors. With Ludwig's impressive appetite, the eight-person dinner soon ended, leaving only clean plates and bones behind. Lumian and Lugano, despite not being small eaters themselves, found themselves dwarfed by Ludwig's consumption despite eating two servings each. This was especially impressive considering he'd already devoured afternoon tea and dessert earlier. I don't see you visiting the washroom often. Where does all the food go? Do you have a bottomless pit for a stomach? Lumian mused, sizing Ludwig up. He stood up and turned to Lugano. I'm feeling for a drink. Wanna join me at the ship's bar? I didn't catch a wink last night. Plan to hit the hay early today. Lugano couldn't wrap his head around his employer's boundless energy. Despite a sleepless night and a full day of travel, Lumian buzzed with life, ready to hit the bar. Could it be because his sequence is higher? The kid with the odd appetite looks pretty charged too. Lumian didn't extend an invite to the translator. After leaving a late-night snack for Ludwig, he swapped into a plain dark brown jacket and left the room, heading for the first-class bar. The bar oozed elegance, filled with the soft tunes of a small band. Sparse patrons scattered around, soaking in the quiet atmosphere. Lumian scanned the scene for a moment from the entrance, then shook his head and exited. He descended the stairs to the deck, slipping into the bar serving third-class cabins and the regular crew. A chaos of noise, shouts, cheers, claps, and random singing saturated the air, echoing around Lumian. 
he instantly felt a sense of homecoming. A wave of ease washed over him, and every cell in his body kicked up a notch. That's more like it. A seasoned regular at the old tavern from a young age, Lumian swayed a bit as he edged up to the bar counter. A glass of La Favert. He thumped the wooden surface. The bartender, a young man with Fainapotter features, greeted Lumian. His face was slim, adorned with black hair, eyes, and distinct contours. His slightly yellowish skin highlighted his appealing facial features. All right, ten licks, the bartender replied in intision, his foreign accent apparent. The ship's prices trumps even those in Trier. As Lumian counted out the coins, he noticed the bartender divert his attention and engage with sincerity and enthusiasm. Madam, what would you like to drink? A glass of cherry wine, a lady in a thick yellow dress responded, showcasing a pretty face and light green eyes. All right. The bartender, not seeking payment up front, prepared to serve the lady. I was here first, Lumian reminded the bartender with a smile. Without hesitation, the bartender replied, This is such a beautiful and dazzling lady. My heart tells me to serve her first. Oh, he's truly from Fainapotter. Lumian didn't get upset. Instead, it felt like he was watching a circus act. Fainapotterians, with their romantic nature and relentless pursuit of love, placed their faith in Earth Mother, emphasizing the importance of women. Men in this kingdom would praise any woman they encountered, openly pursuing those they fancied. Aurora had once mentioned that Fainapotter's men were masters of country romance. Despite their mushiness and overt sincerity, they didn't come off as cheesy, rather, they exuded a different kind of elegance. In comparison, the romantic intentions seemed lacking. However, influenced by tradition and faith, most Fainapotarians placed great importance on family, reproduction, and children, preferring settled family lives. Unless entering marriage without coercion, they were akin to the conservative Loanese, finding it challenging to accept extramarital affairs. While exceptions existed, even in the most conservative Loan kingdom, the prevalence of adultery wasn't as exaggerated or common as an in intus. Many believed that love didn't necessarily thrive within the confines of marriage. After the lady settled her tab and departed with the cherry wine, the bartender served Lumian La Favert, garnishing it with a mint leaf. He remarked without a trace of guilt, my grandmother always said to give special treatment to every lady, especially the beautiful ones. I get it. Lumian slipped back into his role as a regular at Old Tavern. Sipping his absinthe, he concocted a tale. I once had numerous beautiful companions, even more stunning than the last lady. Unfortunately, being just one person, I couldn't marry them all simultaneously. The bartender suddenly felt a camaraderie. I often feel the same regrets. There are too many beautiful women in this world, and I'm just one person. What's your name? Lewis, just call me Lewis. Lumian provided his alias. His current identity was Lewis Barry. I'm Francesco, the bartender shared with Lumian. The familiar setting, the customary boasting, and the vibrant ambience left Lumian feeling a bit tipsy, despite not imbibing much. If not for the mysticism catastrophe, if Aurora were still alive, if he'd already entered university with no other concerns, wouldn't it be nice to just unwind at a bar? Sea travelers couldn't help but discuss pirates. Bartender Francesco informed Lumian, with the widespread use of ironclad warship technology on merchant vessels, it's become tough for pirates. Their sailboats can't match these iron-skinned monsters cruising at 16 to 17 knots. They can't plunder them even if they tried. Lowering his voice, Francesco continued, Pirates go to strategy now is sending individuals disguised as passengers to board ships from different ports. Once they hit a designated area in the sea, they create internal chaos, gaining initial control and allowing a nearby pirate ship to close in. Is that so? Lumian inquired with interest. Any guesses on who might be an undercover pirate on the ship? Francesco was taken aback. It's just the first day. How can I tell? Lumian smiled, teasing, ever been through something like this before? One, from Le Tour de France Gourmand.
Chapter 511, Warning Francesco let out a heavy sigh and spoke, back in the first half of the year, when I tended bar on another ship, we ran into pirates. Over ten of them were among the passengers. They seized control of the engine and boiler cabins right from the start, repelling any attempts by the crew to fight back. They waited for their pirate vessel to draw near. Thank you, Earth Mother. They only ransacked the cabins one by one, and as long as we didn't resist, they left us unharmed. Naturally, the beautiful ladies and gentlemen were excluded. You can't expect pirates to have high moral standards. Lumian took a sip of mint-flavored absinthe, a smile playing on his lips. Aren't they worried that there might be someone like the adventurer German Sparrow among the passengers? What if they encounter a powerhouse unwilling to part with their money and ready to use force? Francesco was caught off guard by Lumian's question. After a pause, he replied, being a pirate involves higher risks, doesn't it? That does make sense, Lumian nodded in agreement. Francesco went on, many merchant ships nowadays hire retired navy personnel, maritime adventurers, and professional mercenaries for protection. They're tough and can handle on-board disturbances. Plus, they make pirates think twice, leaving room for negotiation. There was a similar incident on a merchant ship before. Pirates had the upper hand, took control, but hesitated to take on a sailor team led by adventurers. They opted for negotiations, demanded a protection fee, and withdrew without looting the cabins. Lumian chuckled. If I were a pirate, I'd start a security company in Port Gotti, offering knowledgeable maritime mercenaries. If ships hire them, I'd earn some fees. If not, well, then it's time for a good old-fashioned plunder. Either way, I'd make a profit. Francesco eyed the black-haired, green-eyed man in his twenties with surprise and muttered, Don't tell me you're an undercover pirate? The maritime factions are in chaos. Can your subordinates protect those who hire you from other pirates? Sigh, that's why I've never liked the sea. Stepping on the ground gives me a greater sense of security. Praise the earth, praise the mother of all things. A pure Phanopaterian who believes in earth mother. Lumian smiled and asked, if you don't like the sea, why are you still working as a bartender on the ship? Francesco's expression gradually became animated. Don't you find it romantic to have an independent kingdom, one that can hardly contact the outside world, floating out at sea? When you meet a beautiful lady here, you'll feel that only the two of you are left in the entire world. You can only rely on each other. Your ultimate goal is to find a romantic encounter? Sometimes, Lumian found it hard to comprehend the Phanopaterians and some Triarians who resembled them. At that moment, Francesco gestured towards a round table. That's Philip, the security supervisor of the Flying Bird. He claims to be a retired officer of the Fog Sea Fleet. He destroyed numerous pirate ships with his cannons and personally captured many pirates with wanted posters. Lumian followed Francesco's finger, gazing at the hall illuminated by kerosene chandeliers. A group of men and women gathered around a round table to the side. In their midst was a middle-aged man with short light gold hair, light blue eyes, and a weathered face. Despite his appearance, he didn't exude seriousness or formality. Philip, clad in a dark blue tweed crew attire, raised a glass of Lanty proof and boasted, when I served on the San Martin, I crossed paths with the Queen of Ailment, Tracy. Back then, she was only Vice Admiral Ailment. TSK TSK, as expected of the most beautiful woman in the five seas. I'll tell you this, if we ever encounter a formidable pirate, don't fret. I know them, and I have a certain level of friendship with them. At the very least, I can negotiate. Ha ah, don't ask why naval officers have ties to great pirates. There are many things at sea you don't understand, and it's best not to delve into them. The men and women surrounding Philip listen attentively, occasionally expressing surprise at the mention of influential figures or when he narrated thrilling adventure stories. At some point, Philip's left hand had wrapped around a girl's waist, and she didn't make any attempt to escape. Instead, she wore a shy expression. Lumian averted his gaze and asked bartender Francesco, does he really know so many great pirates? Is he genuinely a retired officer of the Fog Sea Fleet? 
Having finished wiping a cup, Francesco spread his hands and said, Who knows? However, since he took over as the Flying Bird's security supervisor, we haven't faced any pirate attacks during our five trips out to sea in the past few months. I don't know if it's luck or if he truly knows many pirates and can spot spies at a glance, giving them an advanced warning. In the five seas, where pirates are a constant threat, the likelihood of avoiding encounters on five consecutive long-distance voyages is slim. Lumian turned his body again, scrutinizing Philip, whose skin bore the rough, red, and weathered marks of a seasoned mariner. It was challenging to discern if this person was a beyonder, let alone determine his sequence. However, Lumian could deduce from the physical details that he had spent considerable time at sea. Lumian focused and briefly observed Philip's luck. It carried a hint of blood. There's a possibility of combat and injuries in the future, but it won't endanger his life. Lumian frowned, finishing the absinthe in his hand and requesting another glass of Lanty proof. Before long, Philip left the bar with the girl still wrapped around his waist, his face flushed. Lumian clicked his tongue and shook his head. You and Tisians. After a while, rhythmic music filled the bar. Many customers stood up and rushed to the empty space in the middle to dance. Lumian held the liquor, swaying gently to the rhythm, appearing lost in thought. Since discovering that the evil gods bestowed beings were up to no good, he hadn't felt this relaxed in a long time. The hostile plan was now in the past. The investigation of April Fool's key members could only commence upon reaching Port Santa. This was a rare vacation. Estimating that it was time for Ludwig's second late-night snack, Lumian set down his glass and left the bar on the deck. As Lumian made his way back to the first-class cabin, he suddenly whispered, Temaboros, is there any way to identify Beyonders on the ship and the passengers disguised as pirates? I want to visit them one by one, warn them to behave, and not interfere with my enjoyment of the journey. If anyone refused to heed the warning, 007 could assist in collecting the bounty. The Beyonder characteristics they produced could also be exchanged for money. Termoboros's majestic voice echoed in Lumian's ears. Only when you become an inevitability demigod or switch pathways will you have a solution. Without waiting for Lumian's response, the sealed angel added, with Alista Tudor's lingering aura and the slight corruption of 0-01, there's a high chance that you'll trigger a calamity if you really warn those people. Does that mean I'm the greatest calamity and just need to take care of myself? Lumian, who had hoped to reorganize the flying bird's dark world and ensure a pleasant journey, understood Termoboros's meaning. He had no choice but to give up. At that moment, the flying bird had fallen into a deep slumber. Lumian walked across the solid floor, the faint creaks and muffled cries echoing around him. Somewhere within the ship, a woman wept in heartbreaking sobs. Lumian was no stranger to such despair. He'd often heard Miss Ethan's, the object of Charlie's admiration at Aubert's Du Coke door, cry in similar anguish. There are people who suffer everywhere. Sad people. Lumian, influenced by his writer sister, possessed a touch of the artistic spirit. Shaking his head, he returned to room 5, his first-class cabin. Lugano had already retired to the servants' quarters, while Ludwig, clad in pajamas and a nightcap, awaited his late-night snack. Lumian sighed and retrieved the easily preserved food from his traveler's bag, grateful he'd restocked at Port Gotti. He calculated the cost of Ludwig's daily meals, 100 verl d'or, translating to almost 40,000 verl d'or annually. A wave of vexation washed over him. At this rate, Ludwig would deplete his savings within two years. He couldn't help but wonder if Baron Brignais had breathed a sigh of relief upon confirming Ludwig's disappearance. After settling the two midnight meals, Lumian quickly washed and settled into the master bedroom. As the gentle sway of the ship lulled him, his mind drifted off to sleep. Lumian woke up at 6 a.m., feeling refreshed. The dining table was bare, Ludwig and Lugano still asleep. He pushed open the window and stretched, inhaling the crisp morning air. Just before 7, the doorbell rang. My breakfast was scheduled to arrive at 8.30 a.m. Lumian opened the door and found Philip, the flying bird's security supervisor with his blonde hair, blue eyes, 
and weathered face, standing before him. Philip looked grim, a stark contrast to the jovial man he'd been at the bar the previous night. I've confirmed that your identification documents are fake. How did he confirm it? Why did he specially check our identification? Lumian didn't feel that anything about them stood out after they boarded the ship. Suppressing his confusion, he frowned and asked, Are you attempting to extort us? Philip glanced at the living room and said solemnly, I don't care who you were or what you plan to do. Just behave yourselves during your stay on the flying bird. Enjoy the journey, don't cause any trouble, and we'll all be fine. He's really confirming if we are problematic. How did this guy do it? He's quite capable. He's not as frivolous and simple as he seems. Lumian replied calmly, not giving in, I'm afraid I don't understand. Perhaps there's a misunderstanding? Philip locked eyes with him for a long moment. As long as you understand what I'm saying, he finally replied before turning and walking away. Chapter 512 Strange Pirate Ship Lumian watched Philip's retreating figure disappear into the distance, a silent chuckle escaping his lips. This guy was competent, he had to admit. Gone was the frivolous, greasy, and undisciplined facade he'd displayed at the bar the night before. It was a common trait among many Intision men, Lumian observed. When not engaged in demanding work and surrounded by attractive women, they turned into preening peacocks, desperate to display their prowess. Becoming a beyonder didn't change that fundamental nature. Demonesses thrived in Intis, especially in Trier. This wasn't just due to the city's underground allure, there was a deeper, more harmonious connection with the society at large. Lumian wasn't offended by Philip's warning, nor did he take it personally. He'd planned to enjoy the voyage over the next few days, even considered lending a hand in maintaining order on the ship, becoming a shadow inquisitor of sorts. But now, his primary concern shifted to how Philip had unmasked their true identities. Lumian had meticulously combed through Aurora's grimoire, studying the abilities of low-sequence beyonders across twenty-two pathways, and supplemented his knowledge with information gleaned from various sources over the past months. From this, he formed a preliminary hypothesis. Philip is likely a beyonder of one of three pathways, spectator, reader, or arbiter. One excels at observing minute details and reading people's true thoughts. Another is a master of deduction, their sequence 7 even being called detective. They can detect abnormalities from the most subtle clues. The third, at sequence 8 public security officer, wields extraordinary control within their jurisdiction, allowing them to sense and trace anomalies. Given that we haven't spoken directly with Philip before, I can eliminate the spectator option. Besides, spectators aren't typically chosen as security supervisors, it's not their forte. After discovering that there was a problem with us through his abilities and that our origins were unclear, Philip likely checked copies of our identification and sent telegrams to the issuing authorities. And he received confirmation that these three people didn't exist. This explains the delay in his warning. He'd waited for the investigation and response before making his move. This also implies he has a network of helpers across different regions, receives information and feedback, and possesses extensive connections. Doing this alone wouldn't be possible. He has an organization backing him, something more official, perhaps. He did claim to be a retired officer of the Fog Sea Fleet, after all. Such a person is indeed well-suited to lead the security on a heavily armed merchant ship like this. Lumian turned away and closed the door, a wave of relief washing over him. With such a capable security supervisor at the helm, issuing discreet warnings to potential threats, the journey ahead promised to be relatively safe. Lumian spent the morning in the comfort of his first-class cabin, Cabin 5, indulging in a leisurely study of Highlander and breaking up his reading with bouts of exercise. Meanwhile, Ludwig, after breakfast, had begged Lugano to take him on a tour of the ship, spending over an hour on deck playing like a genuine child. Lumian, however, suspected the true purpose of this excursion was to meticulously survey the location and condition of the ship's food reserves. Before lunch, drawn by the bright sun, Lumian descended to the deck. He rested his hands on the railing and gazed out at the vast, 
dark blue expanse of the sea. From the corner of his eye, he caught sight of Philip, back to his usual casual demeanor. He was now entangled with the girl from the previous night at the bow of the ship, whispering sweet nothings and laughing, the picture of a smitten couple. You and Tisians. Lumian shook his head with a chuckle. After leaving Trier, he had adjusted his usual phrases to better reflect reality. Philip and the girl continued their stroll along the deck, their laughter echoing through the air. With the enhanced hearing of a hunter, Lumian had no trouble making out the girl's name, Gozia. Though not conventionally beautiful, she exuded a youthful vibrancy that was undeniable. Lumian watched as Philip's gaze darted beyond the ship's railing, his face hardening for a brief moment. Following the security supervisor's line of sight, Lumian scanned the horizon, spotting a colossal shadow lurking beneath the undulating waves. It disappeared as quickly as it appeared, swallowed by the surging sea. Smaller than the flying bird, but far larger than any sea creature. Giant fish, or something more? Lumian mused, a spark of excitement igniting within him. My dear, what has captured your attention? Gozia's voice broke through Philip's reverie. My sweetheart, just thinking about which first-class restaurant I'll treat you to later, Philip replied nonchalantly. Suddenly, a thin veil of fog crept upwards from the sea, obscuring the sun and dimming the surrounding environment. The passengers and crew on deck remained unfazed, accustomed to such sudden weather changes in the fog sea. Although less intense than the berserk sea, the unpredictable nature of the region was ever-present. As Gozia reveled in the first foggy day of their journey, Philip discreetly raised his right arm, gesturing towards the spot where the shadow had vanished. He doesn't think it's a passing giant fish. Lumian admired the sea ahead with interest. He noticed several crew members ending their breaks and taking their positions, including the gunners. The peaceful atmosphere was shattered by a loud splash as a monstrous iron black behemoth surfaced from the depths. It was a peculiar looking ship. It was covered in a layer of metal, with only thin pipes resembling snail eyes protruding from its hull. As seawater cascaded off its sides, the upper half of the strange vessel split open, revealing a fearsome array of cannons and masts rising from within, creating a wide deck. Dozens, perhaps even hundreds of pirates armed with firearms and swords were on the deck, filling the air with their intimidating cries. A white sail unfurled automatically, right to the top of the mast. Wow! Lumian marveled inwardly. He had never seen such a magical vessel before, a vessel that could disappear and reappear from the depths of the sea. Philip's expression grew increasingly grave. Beside him, Gozia froze, her eyes wide with terror as she instinctively huddled closer to her lover. Which pirate crew is this? Only one man commands such undersea vessels, Philip replied, his voice devoid of its usual frivolity and heavy with grim certainty. Admiral Deep Sea, Hal Constantine. Judging by the size of this vessel, it's not his flagship, the new ones. It's the Black Octopus, commanded by his most trusted subordinate, Bone Splitter Basil. Gozia's vision swam, and she nearly fainted. The night before, during their conversation, Philip had mentioned the infamous maritime kings and pirate admirals who ruled the five seas. Among them, Hal Constantine, who had recently risen to the rank of admiral, was shrouded in mystery. Legend whispered of his monstrous heritage, claiming he possessed the blood of sea monsters. He had even ventured into the ruins of a sunken city, recovering the relics of ancient alchemists, two stealth boats capable of navigating the depths of the ocean unseen. Inspired by these vessels, the Church of the God of Steam and Machinery had attempted to develop their own undersea fleet. However, they failed to mass-produce them. Due to the reliance on higher sequence beyonders, only one or two of these vessels could be assigned to each Intision fleet, each serving specialized functions. Of Admiral Deep Sea's two undersea vessels, the first, the new ones, was a behemoth rivaling the flying bird in size. Inspired by a renowned maritime treasure legend, it served as Hal Constantine's flagship. The second, the Black Octopus, which had just emerged from the depths, was entrusted to his most trusted subordinate, Bone Splitter Basil. He was an equally formidable figure, known for his cold-blooded brutality and ruthless tactics. 
he took pleasure in torturing his captives, and the bounty on his head, far exceeding that of most non-admiral pirates, stood at a staggering 250,000 verldor. The revelation of the black octopus and bone-splitter basil plunged Gozia into a pit of despair. How could a mere armed merchant ship like the Flying Bird possibly stand against such notorious pirates from the Five Seas? What horrors awaited them under Bone Splitter Basil's reign of terror? Philip, however, had no time for his new lover's distress. His full attention was focused on the unfolding spectacle of the Black Octopus and its menacing cannons, ready to unleash their fury at any moment. Standing a short distance away, Lumian felt a thrill coursing through his veins when he heard the name Bone Splitter Basil, the strongest subordinate to Admiral Deep Sea Hall Constantine. This was not nervousness but the exhilarating feeling from catching a whiff of iron and blood. This was one of the hunter's belligerents. Even after fully digesting the potions, a beyonder would still be affected by them. Lumian's emerald eyes, sharp as an eagle's, locked onto the bizarre iron-black ship as he formulated his next move. Once Bone Splitter Basil emerged and the two vessels closed the distance, Lumian planned to teleport behind the infamous pirate and unleash the spell of Harumph. If the spell of Harumph's effect proved insufficient and failed to incapacitate Basil, Lumian would don his flawed boxing gloves, instill a specific desire within his opponent, and teleport again, creating greater distance before activating the Symphony of Hatred, amplifying the instilled desire to a maddening degree. With Bone Splitter Basil severely wounded and momentarily incapacitated, Lumian would seize the opportunity to unleash his full hunter arsenal, striking the enemy down with devastating blows. To prevent interference from the surrounding pirates, he could potentially create a bottle of fiction and isolate Bone Splitter Basil for a one on one duel. A complex plan, complete with contingency measures, raced through Lumian's mind, causing a slight tremor in his body, as if anticipating the thrill of the coming battle. Just as the tension reached a peak and a naval confrontation seemed imminent, the pirates aboard the Black Octopus turned as one, their eyes fixed in shock upon the stairs leading deeper into the vessel. A few seconds later, the bizarre Iron Black ship made an abrupt turn, altering its course and steering away from the flying bird. With swift precision, the exposed sections of the Black Octopus retracted, sealing its interior once more. In the eyes of Lumian and the others, the black octopus rapidly distanced itself, diving back into the depths of the foggy sea. In the blink of an eye, it transformed into a mere shadow, disappearing completely. S. Escaped? Uttering the word after a long moment of dazed silence, Gozia turned to her lover, her voice filled with surprise and confusion. Bone Splitter Basil and his black octopus were simply leaving? Without a fight, without plundering? Philip, himself bewildered, stared at the spot where the black octopus had vanished, forcing a smile onto his face. Didn't I tell you that I know many great pirates? Chapter 513 Worry Gozia's gaze instantly turned fervent upon hearing Philip's response, her admiration evident. Have they escaped? Lumian's lips twitched. The black octopus's abrupt change of course and sudden dive left him speechless. The maneuver caught him off guard, leaving him frozen for a critical moment. This incredible underwater ship, commanded by a great pirate with a massive bounty, simply turned tail and fled without even firing a single cannon? How could one be a pirate with such puny guts? Bone splitter basil? With a bounty of 250,000 verl d'or and a fearsome reputation? Don't even think about showing your face on the high seas again. Lumian cursed under his breath, then frowned thoughtfully. Why had Bone Splitter Basil fled without revealing himself? I could understand if it was the Blood Emperor's aura I activated that made you run so fast, but why now? It couldn't be that he targeted the wrong ship, did he? The Flying Bird isn't the merchant vessel he wanted to plunder, so he was rushing to corner his real prey? Did he somehow sense that hijacking this ship would lead to disaster? If he truly possessed the power of divination or prophecy, they would have known not to come. He wouldn't have had to embarrass himself in front of the crew and passengers, only to turn back and drift aimlessly. Danger premonition? A hunter's danger intuition wouldn't react so strongly until it's face to face with the threat. 
then it hit him. A sequence that had him wary for months, Sequence 6 Devil of the Criminal Pathway. Beyonders at this sequence possessed a unique ability called malicious perception. If someone within their range intended to cause them lethal harm and acted on it within a specific time frame, they could sense the source of the danger and identify their attacker. Bone Splitter Basil. A devil? His title and reputation certainly fit. I had just formulated a hunting plan for him, intending to teleport over after confirming the situation. Did he sense my malice and confirm the extent of the danger before swiftly deciding to escape? Hey, you're a devil. Are you running away without a fight? I'm not even confident in defeating a devil. Besides, you're on your alchemical boat with a large number of subordinates around you. You probably don't lack mystical items. Do you have to be so cowardly? The plan I envisioned had a high success rate, so much so that Basil's ability to sense danger exceeded his endurance. Therefore, he didn't take the risk and chose the most effective and safest response, escape. The more Lumian pondered, the more he felt that this guess was close to the truth. This amused him as well. To be honest, his plan was quite idealistic. He didn't consider the bone splitter sequence or the abilities of the surrounding pirates, nor did he consider how to use the bottle of fiction to single out Basil for a one-on-one -on -one battle. All of this depended on his subsequent observations of the black octopus hunters might not be the ones who charged forward to fight from the beginning. They might even be the last to appear and be responsible for harvesting. But did such a simple plan and malice scare away a devil in advance? Lumian suspected that Basil might not be able to sense the specific plan. It was only because he had the Angel of Inevitability, the Blood Emperor's aura, Mr. Fool's seal, and 0-01's mild corruption, regardless of whether they were powerful or not, that they combined with a feasible plan and clear malice. It strongly agitated the Bone Splitter, making him feel that the impending danger was beyond his ability to handle. Hence, the scene just now. Are all devils so timid? Lumian cursed silently and left the deck in disappointment, returning to room 5 of the first-class cabin. At that moment, the exclusive attendant had arrived with lunch. Ludwig focused on the delicacies, while Lugano lingered by the window, his face filled with excitement. Upon seeing Lumian's return, the doctor exclaimed excitedly, Just now, a great pirate appeared, Bone Splitter Basil, Admiral Deep Sea Howl Constantine's most formidable captain. He even operates the Black Octopus. Have, have you heard of the Black Octopus? It's a mystical ship that can dive to the seabed. I heard it from someone at the bar last night, Lumian replied honestly. Prior to this, he didn't know much about Admiral Deep Sea and his pirate crew. All he knew was that there was such a pirate admiral. After all, Hal Constantine was quite mysterious and rarely appeared in newspapers and magazines that recorded sea stories. His only appearance in the Adventurer series was his title and name, giving him a background without any plot lines. Lugano didn't hide his emotions. I witnessed the mystical pirate ship with my own eyes. It truly surfaced from the seabed and can bloom like a flower. I thought we'd clash with the bone splitter and use your teleportation abilities to escape. To my surprise, Black Octopus chose to leave after observing for just over ten seconds. Over ten seconds? Aren't you looking down on bone splitters? It was a few seconds. Lumian retorted inwardly. Lugano continued, When I chatted with a few sailors this morning, they told me that the Flying Bird security supervisor is a formidable retired officer who knows many great pirates. I thought they were boasting, but from the looks of it, that security supervisor isn't simple. It's really possible that he has ties to many great pirates. That's why Bone Splitter Basil didn't plunder the flying bird. That's right, that's right, Lumian echoed. Rip. Ludwig tore off the oily skin and meat from a duck leg. Lumian glanced at the boy, who was engrossed in his food, and suddenly had a new idea. Could the malice and danger that Bone Splitter Basil sensed be more than one? Could it not be solely for me? Ludwig might have swallowed hard upon hearing the word bone dismantling. However, even though this walking bottomless stomach when compared to me appears high-ranking, he lacks the corresponding abilities. 
to celebrate the fact that the flying bird hadn't been plundered by the black octopus, the captain hosted a party on the deck in the evening, featuring clowns, magicians, and beast tamers. He treated everyone to three glasses of beer. Late at night, the third-class bar bustled with activity. Philip became the center of attention, surrounded by nearly all the patrons. They took turns praising him and treating him to drinks. They were all grateful to the security supervisor for using his friendship with Bone Splitter Basil to persuade the great pirate to leave and prevent the passengers of the flying bird from suffering. Lumian, seated at the bar counter and engaged in conversation with bartender Francesco, savored the landy proof. His gaze casually swept across Philip's face, and he noticed a hint of seriousness and worry beneath the blonde haired, blue eyed middle aged man's frivolous smile. In other words, he wasn't that happy. Yes, I'm sure he didn't scare the black octopus away. Hehe, <laughs> you're still relatively clear headed. It's not something to celebrate knowing that a huge problem approached your ship but abnormally chose to leave. This often means that there's greater trouble lurking on your ship. Lumian chuckled inwardly and averted his gaze. He continued to converse with bartender Francesco about the beautiful women in the third-class cabin. After nearly an hour, Philip squeezed out of the drunken crowd and sat beside Lumian with his lover, Gozia. He knocked on the table and ordered a glass of golden beer. Casually, he said, you actually enjoy drinking in such a rowdy place. The girls here are more enthusiastic than in first class. Lumian could roughly guess Philip's motive for coming, but he didn't inquire further. Philip chuckled. That's true. Casually, he inquired, what did you do when the black octopus arrived? Don't you remember? I wasn't far from you. Don't you know what I did? Lumian replied candidly. Philip nodded slightly and didn't press further. Lumian took a sip of liquor and asked with a smile. Do you think there's a huge problem on the ship that scared off that little troublemaker? Philip turned his head and glanced at Lumian, not too surprised that he had made such a connection. What are you two talking about? The tipsy Gozia couldn't quite grasp the conversation between the two men. It was as if they were speaking in riddles. That's the most logical explanation I can come up with, Philip replied, ignoring his lover's question. Lumian asked with interest, Who do you think is suspicious? From yesterday afternoon to noon today, the security supervisor must have warned many people. Philip set down his beer mug and massaged his temples. After some thought, he smiled. I wanted to tell you, but I don't think that's necessary now. Why? Lumian inquired curiously. Philip took another sip of his beer and chuckled. As long as that huge problem doesn't erupt on the ship, it won't be a problem for me. As you can see, it hasn't revealed itself and is quietly hiding. This means that it might just want to reach the archipelago or Port Santa without a hitch. At this point, Philip sighed and said with experience, many times, when you see an abnormality, there's no need to care or figure out the truth. Pretending not to notice and patiently waiting for the abnormality to leave is the best choice. The abnormality that didn't erupt isn't abnormal. Your investigation and investigation might agitate it, escalating the problem and causing the catastrophe to truly descend. As long as that abnormality doesn't truly harm us, try your best to maintain reverence and avoid stimulation. That's one of the key reasons why I've been able to survive at sea until now. Lumian nodded gently and said, A relative of mine once mentioned that in certain events, those who can't see, hear, speak, or smell are more likely to survive. Philip smiled and extended his right hand. I'm glad you share that understanding. This was his true motive for coming to talk to Lumian. He wanted Lumian, who was using a fake identity, not to be curious and try to figure out the hidden trouble on the ship. That might implicate the entire ship. Understanding Philip's meaning, Lumian couldn't help but raise his eyebrows. Does this mean there are other troubles on the ship? Chapter 514, Huge Wave Lumian took a moment to consider. He didn't think there was any real danger. Philip's concern was based on Bone Splitter Basil's reaction, which only hinted at a potential problem on the ship. 
While Philip knew which passengers and crew members were suspicious, he couldn't pinpoint the real source of the trouble. He wasn't even sure if he was right, and wouldn't dare to be certain. Therefore, his suspect might not be the actual issue. In other words, it was more likely that the real problem was actually sitting right beside him, Lumian and his new godson, Ludwig. However, Philip wasn't aware of this, and by excluding them, would mistakenly focus on other suspects. Apart from Ludwig and me, whether there are other serious problems or not, Philip is right, Lumian thought, letting out a soft sigh. Before any major troubles surface, it's best not to investigate or provoke them. We'll pretend not to see, hear, or speak, and wait for them to reach their destination and leave the flying bird. Of course, this depends on the situation remaining stable. If any abnormalities arise, we'd have to find a way to resolve them immediately. Sometimes, pretending not to see things doesn't prevent them from worsening. The Kordu catastrophe is a gruesome reminder of that. Lumian thought and sighed softly. He turned around and extended his hand, briefly shaking Philip's with a smile. I'm glad we reached an agreement. Philip breathed a sigh of relief, retracted his right hand, and downed his golden malt beer. He had been worried that someone like Louis Berry, who used a fake identity and was suspected of being a criminal, would be stubborn and adventurous. He was concerned that Lewis wouldn't listen to reason and would insist on uncovering the huge problem that scared off the black octopus. Philip felt no sympathy for someone who might die because of their own foolishness, but he didn't want them to endanger everyone else. Thankfully, Lewis Berry seemed like someone who could be reasoned with. As Philip drained his beer, he kept assuring himself, the Fog Sea Archipelago wasn't far from the Republic. In fact, its proximity was why Antis had chosen it as its first overseas colony. The flying bird wouldn't need to stop at other ports for supplies on its journey, allowing it to arrive directly. Assuming the weather remained calm, the flying bird should dock in Ferrum, the capital of the Fog Sea Archipelago, by the following evening. If they encountered bad weather, they might need to slow down, change course, or seek refuge in another port. The latest they could arrive would be noon the day after tomorrow. Perhaps that troublesome problem would disembark in Port Ferrum? Even if something was brewing beneath the surface, it wouldn't fully erupt in just a day or two. Endure, and it would be over. Reassured, Philip, hugging his lover, Gozia, rose from his barstool and left the bustling bar. Lumian continued sipping his landy proof, seemingly unfazed. With a smile, he turned to the bartender, Francesco, and remarked, I've heard that many Phanopaterians are homesick. Even when they have to leave for work, they often return home, write letters, or send telegrams. You, however, chose to work overseas, on a ship that makes it difficult to stay in touch with the outside world. Francesco raised his hand and gestured. While I love my family dearly, families like ours, with generations living together, often face various problems and conflicts. My grandmother, a wise woman, manages us well, but it can be stifling for the younger generation. There are too many elders eager to share their life experiences. Furthermore, my home is in Port Santa. The flying bird docks there almost every month. So, for me, this job is both work and a trip home. It's just like the book that described Phanopaterian customs. Phanopaterians enjoy living in large families spanning multiple generations. And in such families, the most senior woman who has given birth becomes the natural matriarch, controlling the entire family's affairs, regardless of whether her husband is alive. In a religious sense, such a woman is considered the embodiment of Earth Mother within the family. His chat with bartender Francesco wasn't purely for relaxation. He had two goals, firstly, he wanted to understand the passengers better through Francesco's eyes. His final destination was Port Santa, which was five to six days away. Paying attention to the various details of life on the flying bird was crucial. Secondly, he wanted to verify the information in his books and gain a grasp of local customs in the Phanopotter kingdom. Missing out on important knowledge could lead him to misinterpret situations in Port Santa. The night passed peacefully, save for a child waking up twice to eat, the rhythmic chewing noises hardly disturbing Lumian's sleep. 
The gentle rocking of the ship and the waves outside his window created a lulling atmosphere. Just when he thought the flying bird would smoothly reach Port Ferrum, the capital of the Fog Sea archipelago, by evening, the weather took a sudden turn. The sea, previously veiled in a thin fog, began to seethe. Giant waves, like towering mountains, rose and fell in rapid succession. The flying bird bobbed precariously on the waves, its air of colossal power replaced by vulnerability. Now, it was a mere leaf tossed between the sky and the sea, a toy in the hands of a giant. Tiny and fragile, it seemed ready to capsize at any moment. Oddly, the massive waves were not accompanied by darkness or torrential rain. Instead, the howling wind dispersed the fog above, revealing a clear azure sky. A sailor scrambled down from the observation deck and, holding his telescope to Philip, shouted, Boss, this wave isn't right. Only our area has waves this big. Everywhere else is calm. There's no rain here either. Philip, holding on to Gozia who trembled pale from the force of the elements, instinctively furrowed his brow. Abnormal waves? Had that major problem caused them? No sooner had the thought crossed his mind than the flying bird was flung into the air by a monstrous wave, only to be slammed onto another. Terrifying jolts and tremors reverberated through the air, eliciting screams of fear from many passengers. They sensed the flying bird teetering on the brink of capsizing, a shipwreck imminent. In first class cabin number five, Lugano stared calmly out the window, gripping the frame as the dining table slid across the room with the force of the storm. He knew that if the flying bird couldn't withstand the tempest, Lumian Lee would undoubtedly teleport him and Ludwig to safety in Port Ferrum. Lumian, gazing at the strangely calm azure sea beyond the monstrous waves, sensed something amiss. He wasted no time, retrieving the mystery prying glasses from his traveler's bag, hoping to uncover the hidden cause of this disaster. As the brown, gold-rimmed glasses settled on the bridge of his nose, a familiar dizziness washed over him. He saw a chaotic montage of scenes around him unfold. On deck, a tidal wave surged, tossing Philip. Clutching a rope in desperation, he descended rapidly with Gozia. He instinctively positioned himself below her, shielding his new lover from the fall. He landed with a heavy thud, the rope burning a gash into his palm, drawing blood. Chaos reigned in the dining hall as plates, knives, and forks flew through the air, customers were flung around. In one room, a blurry figure of a woman sat by the window, sobbing uncontrollably. The boiler chamber was a scene of disarray, scattered coal littering the floor. Beneath it crawled a horrifying horde of creatures resembling seashells. And beneath the deceptively calm azure surface, a peculiar fish gazed up at the beleaguered flying bird. Its size rivaled that of a shark, its grayish-black body devoid of scales, replaced instead by numerous, pulsing meatballs. These strange orbs shimmered with an interconnected, faint starlight, forming cryptic symbols. It sported a pair of eyes on each side of its head and its gaping maw was as sharp as a flagpole. Surrounding this strange fish and numerous similar fish seemed to form a school. With a sharp gasp, Lumian ripped off the mystery prying glasses and stuffed them back into his traveler's bag, his chest heaving. He suspected the strange fish were behind the violent waves, though it was unclear if the wind was a consequence of the upheaval or a separate cause. Knowing the strange fish were submerged, Lumian discarded the idea of using a massive fireball to guide the flying bird's cannons towards them. Instead, he activated the black mark on his right shoulder and teleported himself to the nearby patch of sea he had just witnessed. As he did so, he retrieved the black and bone flute adorned with dark red holes. General Philip's Symphony of Hatred Lumian materialized mid-air and, while descending, brought the bone flute to his lips. He had learned the flute from shepherds during his time in Cordu, and over the past few days, he had been diligently practicing and refining his skills. Now, he began to play a melodious tune, one filled with a longing for home. It was a favorite melody among the wandering shepherds. The muffled explosions of fireballs churned the water, slowing Lumian's descent. But amidst his melody, a new tune, one that seemed to emanate from the depths of destiny itself, pierced through the seawater and reached the ears of the strange fish and their kind below. Suddenly, the strange fish froze. A mountain-like wave descended, 
but no new ones followed. Boom! 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 The smaller fish surrounding the strange fish exploded from their heads, turning on their own kind in a frenzy. Others simply died and floated to the surface. Lumian's descent accelerated as his feet, legs, and body submerged into the icy sea. He continued playing the shepherd's longing melody, feeling the seawater reach his neck and threatening to engulf his mouth. The next moment, dark red blood oozed from the four eyes and multiple bumps on the shark-sized fish. The terrifying waves subsided rapidly. With only half his head above water, Lumian lowered the bone flute and smiled. He activated spirit world traversal once more. Cough, cough, cough. As he materialized back in room five of the first-class cabin, salty seawater spewed from his mouth. In his eagerness to ensure the effectiveness of the music, he had stopped playing too late, ending up swallowing a mouthful of seawater. Additionally, fearing that too much commotion would disrupt the teleportation, he had held his breath until returning before choking. Is this a form of unluckiness? Lumian mused. Lugano, startled by Lumian's drenched state, asked, Is it resolved? Seems like it, Lumian replied with a smile. His shoes and trouser legs bore the marks of wear and tear, scorched and dripping seawater. At that moment, cheers erupted across the flying bird as passengers and crew noticed the receding waves. Praise the sun! By steam. Thank you, mother of all things. Dot. Chapter 515 Strange Fish Philip, unlike the other jubilant crew and passengers, pushed Gozi away whilst ignoring the pain in his back and palms and dashed to the ship's side, eyes scanning the vast expanse of the sea. He shifted relentlessly, searching for anything unusual, anything out of place. Then, a muffled cry pierced the air. Stunned, he pinpointed the source and sprinted towards the flying bird's bow. The cry grew louder, more desperate. Philip saw a crimson stain blossoming on the distant blue, a large shadow shifting beneath. The shadow rapidly materialized into a monstrous fish with four eyes, grayish-blue orbs replacing scales and a terrifyingly sharp mouth. This wasn't a small fish. It writhed and thrashed, frantic flicks of its tail sending water droplets flying. Waves surged around it, reaching heights of five to six meters even without the wind's aid, crashing down with thunderous force. The shrill cries subsided momentarily, and the four-eyed monster, gripped by palpable fear, plunged back into the depths, swimming away with a speed that belied its size. Its remaining brethren followed close behind. In the first-class cabin five by the window, Lumian changed into dry clothes with the casual indifference of someone unobserved. He knew the symphony of hatred had ignited the four-eyed fish's terror, which is why he opted for a swift teleport back instead of leaping into the air and unleashing another devastating attack while the creature surfaced. Fear would drive the monster away and prevent it from unleashing its full fury and raising further havoc. Phew, Philip breathed, relief washing over him as the four-eyed fish disappeared from sight. Thank goodness, thank goodness, he muttered, his voice filled with gratitude. He spread his arms wide and exclaimed, Praise the sun! Do you know that fish? A voice suddenly broke the silence beside Philip. He turned in surprise to see Louis Berry, with his black hair, green eyes, and sharp features, standing beside him. His lover, Gozia, stood hesitantly at the cabin entrance, wanting to approach but afraid of approaching the shipboard. It's the mutated bannerfish. Eh, <laughs> that's what scholars call it. At sea, they have another name for it, Death Navigators, Philip answered Lumian's question, pressing his hand against the shipboard for support. Death Navigators? Why haven't I heard of it? Lumian asked, genuinely curious. To be honest, his knowledge of Beyonder creatures was limited. His previous experiences mainly involved dealing with Beyonders, heretics, and rampagers. Philip glanced at him, exhaled, and smiled faintly. These fish-like creatures have only appeared in recent years. Many sailors call them the sea's demons. Only appeared in recent years. Lumian frowned thoughtfully. Such descriptions often pointed towards the corruption of evil gods, environmental anomalies, 
or natural disasters. Has it only recently appeared in the Fog Sea, or was there no legend of such a fish in the Five Seas? Lumian interrupted Philip's explanation, eager to clarify his doubts. Philip pondered for a moment before speaking. I used to serve in the Fog Sea fleet. Apart from the Fog Sea, I've only traveled the North Sea. I don't know much about the Berserk Sea, the Sonya Sea, or the Polar Sea, but until a few years ago, I never heard any mention of such a strange fish from the crew, pirates, or colleagues from other fleets. Could they be fish corrupted by an evil god? Lumian suddenly felt grateful that he hadn't impulsively tried to eliminate the mutated bannerfish. Not only would it have exposed his beyonder powers to the many crew members and passengers, but it could have also led to unforeseen dangers. And for what? A pile of trash that would only be good enough to feed Ludwig. Seeing that Lewis Berry was no longer fixated on the detail, Philip continued, mutated bannerfish appear on fog-free nights, hovering upright as if silently observing the cosmos. Many sailors and pirates have witnessed this sight, believing the fish are summoning an evil entity. Think about it. The night sea is pitch black, the crimson moon barely visible, and only starlight illuminates the terrifying, distorted fish heads silently emerging from the water, motionless and arranged in strange patterns. It's enough to scare anyone. Gazing at the cosmos. Could they have been corrupted by an evil god's power for some reason? Lumian pondered for a few seconds before asking, why are they called death navigators? Philip rubbed his cheeks. After surveying the cosmos, the mutated bannerfish remain on the surface, forming two lines like an arrowhead that points towards a specific spot in the sea, as if guiding some unknown creature. Some pirates, adventurers, and treasure hunters believe this points to valuable items or hidden treasures, so they try to follow the mutated bannerfish to see where they lead. But none of the ships that attempted this ever returned, and the crew vanished. That's why we call them Death Navigators. Philip sighed and continued, I once heard from sailors that the Death Navigators can control the waves. Judging by what we just saw, this rumor seems very likely, and it's much worse than I imagined. Right, that mutated bannerfish must have been relatively powerful even among Death Navigators. However, no Death Navigator has ever attacked a human ship before. A soft chuckle escaped Lumian's lips. Perhaps they attacked, but no one survived to spread the news. Philip was taken aback. That's true. In such a tidal wave, once a ship capsizes or shatters, only those with special abilities would stand a chance. He paused and muttered to himself, did that troublesome figure provoke the Death Navigator's attack? It's possible, Lumian replied sincerely. After confirming that the Death Navigators hadn't returned, Philip turned to the passengers and crew huddled by the window and cabin entrance. The danger has passed. The weather has returned to normal. The humans, who had cheered earlier, erupted and relieved cries, praising their deities. Philip looked away and pondered, did the Death Navigator ultimately succumb to that unknown threat? I could feel its immense fear. It's possible, Lumian replied with the same sincerity. With this interlude, the flying bird increased its speed and arrived at Port Ferrum, the capital of the Fog Sea Archipelago, before nightfall. The sun set behind St. Tick Island, casting a crimson glow over the distant sea, vast forests, and the dormant brown volcano. The sight was magnificent and breathtaking. Ferrum, in the native language of the Fog Sea Archipelago, meant having fragrance and sweetness. St. Tick Island was rich in cloves, nutmeg, pepper, and sugarcane. Fruits were mainly bananas and grapes, while the rest of the land was planted with cotton. Looking at the white-walled, red-roofed buildings lining the coastline, the masts, sails, and smokestacks emitting fog, Lumian chuckled and said, Emperor Roselle, who named this city back then, probably didn't expect Ferrum to become the last bastion of the indigenous language. Under generations of cultural genocide, the current islanders could only speak in Tisian. Their native language had been lost long ago. There might be elders in the primitive tribes living deep within the forest who still understood the indigenous language, but in all the colonial cities and surrounding plantations, one language reigned supreme, in Tisian. 
Of course, the Fox Sea archipelago had its own unique dialects, a blend of Antisian and indigenous languages, rarely used by Antisians outside this region. Are you disembarking? Lugano inquired of Lumian. The flying bird wouldn't be leaving the port until the next afternoon. Of course, Lumian replied with a hint of excitement. Now that we're here in Ferrum, I can't miss the chance to try their famous golden psalm. Would you like to lead the way, bringing me and Ludwig around, or would you prefer to stay here and keep an eye on him? The Fog Sea Archipelago was known for its superior sugar cane, and the sugar liquor produced from its syrup, called Golden Psalm, was legendary. Lugano's first instinct was to accompany his employer, as he felt safer around Lumian's capable and decisive presence. However, after a moment of reflection, the doctor decided it would be wiser to stay on board. While Lumian was undeniably formidable, his talent for attracting trouble was equally impressive. Leaving Ludwig with enough food for dinner and two rounds of late-night snacks, Lumian disembarked from the flying bird, dressed in a white shirt, a black vest, a dark jacket, and matching pants. In Trier, it was already early autumn, and the air was crisp with chill. However, the Fog Sea archipelago seemed to be enjoying the tail end of summer. Though the air was warm, it was quickly dispersed by the refreshing sea breeze. As Lumian strolled out of the port, he spotted a brown-skinned, wrinkled old woman with black features selling golden straw hats across the street. These hats were woven from a local plant called Golden Leaves, which was favored by the believers of the eternal blazing sun religion. Wearing one supposedly gave the illusion of having the sun shining directly overhead. Intrigued by the idea, Lumian purchased a hat for five licks and placed it on his head. He then continued his leisurely stroll towards the nearby square. In the heart of the square stood a sun obelisk, surrounded by numerous notices adorned with wanted posters. Lumian stopped, his hands instinctively slipping into his pockets. Before the sun dipped below the horizon, he scanned the wanted posters and committed the bounties to memory. Queen Mystic, one of the Maritime Kings. Bounty of 100 million Verldor. King of the Five Seas Nast, one of the Maritime Kings. Bounty of 20 million Verldor. Queen of Stars Catlia, one of the Maritime Kings. Bounty of 11 million Verldor. King of Immortality Agalito, one of the Maritime Kings. Bounty of 4 million Verldor. Queen of Ailment Tracy, one of the Maritime Kings. Bounty of 3 million Verldor. King of Dusk Bilatov Ivan, one of the Maritime Kings. Bounty of 2.6 million Verldor. Observing Lumian's intense scrutiny of the six Maritime Kings wanted posters, an adventurer standing beside him couldn't resist cracking a joke. Looking to hunt the Maritime Kings, eh? Chapter 516 Questioning Method Lumian whirled back to face the teasing man. Doesn't every adventurer who comes to sea dream of following in Gehrman Sparrow's great footsteps? The joking adventurer wasn't past his twenties. Curly brown hair topped a gaunt face, his indus blue eyes sparkling with amusement. Despite the unkempt stubble adorning his chin, he emanated a middle-class trier air, refined in his details. His attire, a thin blue coat, white pants, and brown boots. A large caliber revolver and an exquisite rapier balanced his waist. Lumian's retort and lofty aspirations seemed to surprise the adventurer. He chuckled after a moment, even Sparrow didn't manage to hunt down any pirate kings. Wasn't Gehrman Sparrow the one who supposedly killed Barros Hopkins, the vanished King of Black Throne, one of the original Four Kings of the Sea? Although the Adventurer series hadn't touched upon it yet, Lumian was a dedicated reader of maritime tales in newspapers and magazines. The Adventurer scoffed, unconfirmed. Only when it's inked into the Adventurer series is it truth. They say Fors Wall was specially hired by the Church of the Fool to promote Sparrow's exploits. Just as I suspected, the famous author, Fors Wall, operates under the protection of the Fool Church, allowing her to write without fear about the secrets of the great pirates. Lumian asked with interest, so, the relationship between German Sparrow, the former Vice Admiral Ailment, and the current Queen of Ailment is real? I'd bet on it. The Queen of Ailment herself has never denied it, the adventurer replied, 
clearly enjoying the conversation. After their chat, the adventurer, with his playful demeanor, found Lumian even more appealing. He smiled and asked, How should I address you? After learning your name and you becoming a legend like German Sparrow, I can brag to other adventurers that I knew you before you became famous. His last sentence was laced with good-natured jest. Lewis Berry, Lumian offered his alias. What about you? Perhaps you'll be the next Garman Sparrow. Batna Kant. The adventurer with the wide aperture revolver and exquisite rapier chuckled and said, I don't expect to end up like Garman Sparrow. I wouldn't mind becoming the next Blazing Danitz or even the former strongest hunter of the Fog Sea, Anderson. That would be quite satisfying. Quite ambitious. He doesn't seem like a new bee to the seas. Lumian quickly assessed Batna, unconsciously slipping into a conspirer's mindset. He still believes achieving power like Blazing Danitz is possible after everything he's seen. That suggests a strong sense of self-belief. Could he be a beyonder as well? Adjusting his golden straw hat, Lumian smiled at Batna Kant. Drinks on me. How about it? Stepping into Port Ferrum, the bustling capital of the Fog Sea Archipelago, St. Tick Island, Lumian carried a double purpose, to unearth more pirate intel and acquire the remaining supplementary ingredients for the Reaper Potion. This mission demanded contact with beyonders and local information brokers. As his thoughts raced, Madam Magician's reward flickered across his mind, Reaper Potion Formula, Sequence, 5, Main Ingredients, Grey Demonic Wolf's Front Claws, Forest Hunter's Tongue, Supplementary Ingredients, 80 milliliters of Grey Demonic Wolf's Blood, 2 Forest Hunter's Fangs, 10 Drops of Colorful Bearded Horned Lizard Venom, and 10 Drops of Hornbeam Essential Oil, Ritual, Plan and Execute a Successful Capture of a Target with a Sequence Higher Than Your Own. Flaunt the completed conspiracy before them, and consume the potion as they witness your victory, filled with fear and despair. Note 1. The increased number and higher sequence the captured targets and the greater their fear, regret, and anger, the more potent the ritual's effect. Note 2. The two main ingredients can be substituted with Gardner Martin's Beyonder characteristic. His blood and two teeth can also replace the gray demonic wolf's blood and forest hunter's fangs, respectively. In other words, Lumian only had one sole missing ingredient, the venom of the colorful bearded horned lizard. This ingredient hinted at a rare creature. Fortunately, hornbeam essential oil, a common ingredient among mysticism enthusiasts, was already in his possession before he left Trier. All right. Batna Kant didn't reject Lumian's invitation. The two walked towards a side street off the square, where a bustling open air market unfolded. Towering piles of fruits lined the roadside, while stalls brimmed with golden leaves straw hats, juicy sugarcane, sweet scones, savory roasted meat, native cigarettes, and fried banana slices. Brownish black islanders, foreign sailors, curious tourists, and seasoned adventurers mingled around barbecue stalls, sharing drinks and laughter. Two nearby bars, their doors flung open, offered round tables spilling onto the sidewalk, inviting passers-by to linger and enjoy a drink. Batna surveyed the lively scene and cautioned Lumian, seems like this is your first visit to the archipelago. Remember, never trust an islander. Their outward deference and meekness mask their true intentions. They dream of swindling our money and selling us for a hefty price. If you lack the strength and intelligence to put them in their place, their evil thoughts will surely be put into action. Lumian met Batna's gaze and chuckled. Did they take advantage of you when you first arrived? Batna fell silent, avoiding the question. Lumian didn't press further. He spent two licks for a small bag of freshly fried banana slices. The crisp exterior gave way to a soft, sweet interior, bursting with flavor. As he chewed, Batna muttered, those are just for children and women. How could a grown man, determined to follow in Gehrman Sparrow's great footsteps, be indulging in fried banana slices? In theory, at least, I'm still a minor. Lumian mentally dismissed the matter. As they continued through the market, he turned to Batna and asked, do pirates often enter Port Ferrum in disguise? Yes, frequently, Batna replied without hesitation but hunting them here is hardly worth the trouble. 
Why not? Lumian raised an eyebrow. It would be easier to collect the bounty on their heads. Batna chuckled and lowered his voice. Port Ferrum's officials tacitly allow pirates to come here, selling their plundered goods and buying supplies and pleasures in return. The pirate trade is a major economic force in Port Ferrum. Many, including the governor, the local fleet commander, and the garrison head, have amassed wealth through it. As long as the pirates keep a low profile, going after them in Ferrum is like challenging the local power players. If that happens, you and the pirates risk getting caught, but the pirates might find a way to jailbreak. Does Trier not have any objections? Lumian asked, amused. Outside Trier, people often referred to the Intus government as Trier. Who knows? Maybe those who know about the pirate trade are swimming in wealth from corruption. If they don't, they won't bother figuring it out, Batna chuckled. Either way, pirates are pretty chill in Port Ferrum and prefer avoiding trouble. Is that so? Lumian pondered for a moment and said, If a pirate attacks me, don't I have the right to defend myself? Yes, but why would they initiate an attack on you? Batna could sense this guy was trying to provoke the pirates. Perhaps they think I'm an easy target? Lumian replied as he and Batna Kant turned to a nearby bar. They entered it, choosing to sit inside instead of on the street. It was equally lively inside, with a mixed-race woman dancing provocatively on the wooden stage at the hall's center. Her moves synchronized with the music, frequently lifting her legs and following the rhythm. Gradually, she shed her jacket in various layers, revealing ample areas of healthy skin and gentle curves. As she placed her hand on her undergarment, the surrounding patrons responded with whistles and loud cheers, the atmosphere reaching its climax. How about this? In some ways, isn't Farrah more open-minded than Trier? Not only can you see it, but you can also take it away with a sum of money, Batna remarked with a smile. Lumian raised his right hand and declared, this only means that Ferrum is far enough from the reach of both the churches and the Trier Avenue du Boulevard. What do you mean? Batna was momentarily taken aback. Lumian adopted a pious tone, mimicking a devout believer in the eternal blazing sun. It's too far from justice to be bound by the law. Seeing Batna's expression freeze, Lumian smiled again. Just kidding. Out at sea. Who cares about the law? Might makes right. Batna chuckled, relieved. For a second there, I thought you were about to purify the place in the name of God. Taking their seats, they ordered the Fog Sea Archipelago's famous sugar liquor, Golden Psalm. Eight licks per glass was much cheaper than a trier. As the caramel sweet liquor warmed his throat, Lumian launched into an enthusiastic conversation about German Sparrow, acting like a devoted follower. He chatted with Batna and even the bartender, drawing them into his passionate discourse. After a while, Lumian finished his golden psalm and stood up, drawn towards the central wooden platform where a new stripper had taken the stage. Batna watched with a knowing smile. He assumed the lad couldn't resist the allure. Lumian approached the platform, grabbed two patrons who were blocking his way, and effortlessly tossed them aside. With a powerful push against the platform's edge, he leaped onto the stage. Under everyone's bewildered gaze, Lumian drew his revolver, aimed it at the bar's ceiling, and fired. Bang! Dust rained down, startling the stripper into a crouch. Patrons panicked, scrambling for cover. Some stood frozen in shock, others glared indignantly or frowned, and a few even sported expectant grins. What is he thinking? What is he doing? Batna was dumbfounded. Lumian blew on the revolver's muzzle and flashed a grin at the patrons. Everyone, may I have your attention? I have something to ask you. Chapter 517 Prominent Merchant Lumian ignored the stunned silence that followed his question. A smirk played on his lips as he addressed the group, so, where can a fellow find some mystical trinkets around here? Upon hearing this question, Batna Kant couldn't help but raise his right hand and finish his remaining golden psalm. Where did this punk come from? How could he ask such a question in public? Even if nobody reported him, they'd only see him as a fool. For a moment, 
Batna regretted accepting Louis Berry's invitation. This fellow would tarnish his reputation by association. Noticing the odd expressions around the bar, Lumian gave a nonchalant shrug. He holstered his revolver and announced, Looks like you're all just ordinary folk, then. With that, he leaped off the wooden platform, navigating through the startled crowd back to the counter. The two drunkards he'd thrown out, along with the others who had been frightened by him, measured his strength and weapons, choosing not to retaliate. Back on his barstool, Lumian ordered a landy proof with a grin at Batna. Port Ferrum is certainly more open than Trier. Batna studied Lewis Berry with an are you serious expression, forcing a smile. We must follow German Sparrow's career, not his actions. Is this fellow so obsessed with German Sparrow that he mimics his cold, reckless demeanor? German Sparrow, at least, had the strength to back up his madness. What about you? Furthermore, German Sparrow exudes a cold and indifferent madness, while you are reckless, foolish, and brainless. How can the two be equal? Lumian ignored Batna's jab and turned the conversation to the recent surge in pirate activity in the Fog Sea. After finishing his landy proof, he bid farewell to Batna and headed out. Walking through the bustling open-air market, he made his way towards the harbor. Just as Lumian returned to the square plastered with announcements, a sudden jolt sent him whirling around. A male islander, sporting a half-top hat and a dusty black jacket, approached hesitantly, a strained smile plastered on his face. I saw you at the bar earlier. Cut to the chase, Lumian urged impatiently. The islander, his brownish-black skin stretched over a lean face, leaned in and lowered his voice. Looking for mystical items, are we? I know just the place. Really? Lumian asked in disbelief. Can't promise anything, but it's worth a shot. Just don't buy anything if they turn out unsuitable. The islander's gaze flicked to Lumian's left armpit. Besides, you're armed and dangerous. Not exactly an easy target for robbery, right? That's true. Lumian contemplated this for a moment, then gave a slow nod. What's your name? Carmel. The islander gestured towards a narrow street branching off the square. Follow me. It's close. Lumian trailed nonchalantly behind Carmel, their path crossing two streets before they arrived in a district eerily reminiscent of Rue Anarchy. Crumbling buildings huddled close, new construction jostling for space amidst the narrow road. Carmel led Lumian into a dimly lit laundry shop, its interior draped with damp clothes. They navigated the maze of hanging garments, arriving finally deep inside the dark room. There was a door there. Disguise yourself first, Carmel instructed, retrieving two hooded black robes from a hook nearby. Those who dabble in such things prefer to keep their identities secret. Lumian donned the robe, pulling the hood low over his face. Carmel then rapped on the door in a specific rhythm. It creaked open, revealing a makeshift living room furnished with an old sofa, threadbare armchairs, and a mismatched assortment of furniture. Six figures, cloaked in identical robes, sat in various positions, their faces obscured by the shadows. Lumian politely closed the door behind him as Carmel made a brief introduction. After the two pulled up a stool and sat down, a man with his head pulled low leaned forward and whispered, I need a royal jellyfish's venom crystal. I can offer 5,000 Verldor. Silence. The next participant sold a strange sea eagle eyeball he had procured. Seeing that their discussion was on point, Lumian stood up and surveyed the gathering. I need a sphinx's brain. Name your price. The man seeking the crown jellyfish's venom crystal's voice was carefully controlled as he replied, I happen to have one. If you pay me 30,000 Verldor, it's yours. How can I be sure of its authenticity? Lumian asked him directly. The strange sea eagle eyeball seller interjected in a raspy voice, I can notarize it for you. Excellent. Let me take a look at the goods first, Lumian smiled, approaching the seller. The man replied calmly, such a valuable mystical item, you wouldn't expect me to carry it around, would you? I'll only bring it to you if you pay a 50% deposit first. It's upstairs. You can follow me and make sure I don't escape. 
you can even put the deposit with the notary for safekeeping. Very reasonable. Just as Lumian finished speaking, he suddenly lunged at the trader with the speed of a cheetah, a right hook swinging through the air. Bang! The man crumpled to the ground, his teeth flying in a spray of blood. The other participants, including the notary and Carmel, were momentarily stunned before scrambling for the door. None of them challenged Lumian's assault, nor attempted to use their powers. Their sole focus was on escape. Carmel, closest to the exit, flung open the door and bolted. In an instant, his vision blurred, and he found himself back in the simple living room, alongside two others who had suffered the same fate. They all looked bewildered, as if witnessing a folktale come alive. Bang! A yellow bullet slammed into the exit door. The hooded figures huddled down, covering their heads with practiced movements. Lumian spun around, pulled back the trader's hood, and pressed the revolver's muzzle against his forehead. Not a bad scam, Lumian said with a smile. He had orchestrated an impromptu conspiracy, drawing attention with a gunshot in the bar and publicly expressing his need for a mystical item. This allowed him to identify any greedy pirates or local swindlers who might possess knowledge beyond the reach of ordinary citizens, including black market information. It was also a way to digest the potion. The seller was a typical islander, with brownish-black skin, a long face, gentle features, and dark amber eyes. I wasn't lying to you, he insisted anxiously and angrily. Really? Lumian cocked the revolver's hammer. Before closing the door, Lumian had created a bottle of fiction, setting a condition that only beyonders could enter. None of the participants had successfully escaped, which confirmed the absence of beyonders. If you're not a beyonder, why mention the main ingredient of the conspirer potion? Just for fun? The seller trembled and stammered, I, I'm sorry. We just wanted to scam some money. We, we can't survive otherwise. Lumian wasn't interested in their motives. He glanced at the neatly lined up accomplices and tapped the trader's forehead with the gun's muzzle. What's your name? Roddy, the seller replied, swallowing hard. Another tap to the forehead. Where did you hear about the Sphinx brain, crown jellyfish's venom crystal, and notary? This information was inaccessible to ordinary people. I, I can't say. A sheen of cold sweat appeared on Roddy's forehead. Confidentiality agreement or other restrictions? Lumian studied Roddy for a few seconds and smiled. Then tell me who your master is. Roddy froze, his eyes widening in fear. He hadn't expected the other party to be so certain he had a master that he was someone else's servant. Three, two. Lumian began the countdown. It's Sir Morgala, Roddy blurted out. Then take me there, Lumian calmly requested. Roddy's sweating intensified. No, no, I'm Monsieur Fidel's attendant. He's the vice president of the Port Ferrum Joint Chamber of Commerce. Participating in numerous mysticism gatherings organized by Fidel as an attendant? Although he can't divulge the corresponding information to others, he can use the information he obtained to swindle adventurers. Lumian stood up thoughtfully, dismantled the bottle of fiction, and led Carmel and his swindler accomplices out. He interrogated them one by one and confirmed that Roddy was indeed Fidel Guerra's attendant. One of the vice president of the Port Ferrum Joint Chamber of Commerce's primary tasks was to assist pirates in handling sensitive and illegal cargo. Port Ferrum, Cartier de Black Pearls, Governor General's Office, 16 Rue Correas. Lumian patted Roddy, now donned in his red attendant's attire with gold trimmings and crisp white pants. A smile played on Lumian's lips as he spoke. Tell Monsieur Fidel that I'm interested in purchasing some mystical ingredients and would appreciate the opportunity to discuss it further. All right. Roddy yearned to utter a single plea, if you could kindly remove the revolver from my back, I would be eternally grateful. Leaning against the weathered wall of a nearby house, Lumian watched as the swindler nervously entered Unit 16, the four-story grey-roofed building adorned with numerous statues. The moment Roddy stepped inside, escaping the revolver's direct aim, his first instinct was to bury the whole incident and forget it ever happened. But then he remembered the chilling warning delivered by the man who fired without hesitation, 
a 10-minute silence from Fidel, and Roddy's true colors as a swindler would be painted loudly across the street. Should I lie and claim Monsieur Fidel is unavailable? But he doesn't seem easily duped. A drastic reaction could be worse. Roddy, caught in a dilemma, clenched his teeth and rapped on the study door. Fidel Guerra, a man descended from both Intis and Fainapotter blood, possessed curly black hair that had started to show signs of age, dark brown eyes, and skin darkened by the sun. Though once known for his refined demeanor, time had etched its mark on his face, leaving behind a mane of mottled white hair and prominent wrinkles. Dressed in a crisp white shirt and a brown vest, he quietly sipped his wine as Roddy, trembling with fear, stammered out their confession. He spoke of their ill intentions, of their attempt to swindle the new adventurer. As soon as Roddy mentioned Lumian leaping onto the wooden platform, firing a shot to attract attention, and boldly inquiring about obtaining a mystical item, the merchant sighed and interrupted his flustered attendant. There's no need to elaborate further. Does he wish to see me now? Chapter 518 Merchant's Entrustment 16 Rue Correas Twirling the brim of his golden straw hat, Lumian stopped just outside the office door and met Fidel Guerra's gaze across the desk. Lumian's grin was anything but friendly. Made a decision, have you? Faster than I expected. Fidel Guerra, with his partially Fainapaterian features, turned to Roddy and let out a soft sigh. Didn't expect my attendant to be the ringleader of a scam syndicate. Maybe the paychecks he receives from you don't quite match the lifestyle he sees on a daily basis, Lumian shot back habitually. Fidel ignored the jab. He studied Lumian, eyes narrowed. So that bar act was all for show? To dupe fools like him? Let's say I'm grateful for their thousand door donation. Looks like Port Ferrum's got a bright future for con artists. No shame in his banditry, not a flicker. Roddy felt a swarm of regret gnaw at his insides. Fidel nodded and inquired, What's on your shopping list? Lumian, affecting an air of indifference, responded, I'm in the market for a bottle of colorful bearded horned lizard's venom. Isn't it the Sphinx's brain? Roddy, who was listening, was taken aback. For a moment, he couldn't help but wonder if he was the swindler or the man opposite him. Clad in a white shirt and brown vest, Fidel contemplated for a moment before offering, I don't have it in stock, but I can procure it for you. It might take two to three days. As for the price, it varies, usually between 3,000 to 4,000 vrl d'or, depending on the seller. Need my assistance in acquiring it? No problem. Lumian, arms slightly spread, replied, praise the sun. You're a gem. Fidel, suspecting mockery, frowned slightly. He maintained his composure, stating, I'm not charitable, I'm a businessman. Why not make a profitable deal? Besides, I find forming connections with adventurers like you beneficial. Given money and resources, certain matters are easier for you to handle. Fidel, smiling, questioned, Aren't you concerned about counterfeit goods? How do you confirm authenticity on the spot? Lumian, with an approving smile, quipped, I know you live here. That's assurance enough. The famous merchant Fidel? Gunned down six times in a row for pulling a fast one in a deal worth a few thousand vrl d'or. Not the kind of rep you'd call respectable news. He left the issue of confirming the colorful bearded horned lizard Venom's authenticity unaddressed. Fidel maintained his impassive gaze on Lumian before a smirk crossed his face. I can't recall the last time someone dared to threaten me like this. Interested in knowing what fate befell those who did. Curious if I've got the nerve to make a move now? Lumian's gaze narrowed a touch. His smile remained, but it chilled the room in an instant. He met Fidel's gaze without hesitation. After a while, Fidel sighed without anger and remarked, Your approach reminds me of someone, the legendary adventurer, German Sparrow. Yes, I'm mimicking him, Lumian admitted candidly. Fidel chuckled. Imitating his madness, then? So, underneath the act, you're a calm, rational, and cunning individual? Lumian shook his head, smiling, and replied, No. If I don't imitate him, I'd be even crazier. 
the atmosphere in the study became tense once more. Fidel, picking up and sipping fragrant black tea from a bone porcelain cup, acknowledged, you're quite the young firebrand. Your vigor even makes an old man like me a bit envious. How about taking on a commission? It can fetch you a hefty sum and earn you fame at sea, akin to Garman Sparrow. Lumian, adjusting his golden straw hat, inquired, what's the job? Eliminate a pirate, Baronet Black, Class Kesey, Captain of the Golden Nepos. The bounty is 65,000 Vroldor, Fidel stated calmly. He used to be the third mate of the King of Dusk, Bulatov. Left the fleet, turned to plundering on his own. For months back, he stole a batch of my goods on St. Tick Island. It's likely sold by now. I don't expect to recover it. I just want him dead. Let everyone know that anyone who touches my goods meets their end. Lumian, teasingly, asked, what if it was the King of Dusk who did it? Fidel fell into silence. After a brief pause, Fidel brushed off Lumian's question and continued, I'll provide you with regular updates on Kizi, his characteristics, strength, ship location, and onshore whereabouts. As a bonus, I'll throw in an extra 25,000 Vroldor as a reward. If you manage to take down Kizi, I'll expedite the process to secure the full bounty through my connections and help spread your reputation. Everything Kizi owns will be yours. So, what do you say? Eliminate Kizi, and you'll become one of the most renowned adventurers at sea. 25,000 additional reward and intel support. Lumian thought for a moment and asked with a smile, how many adventurers have you pitched this to? Seven or eight, all of whom I hold in high regard, Fidel replied candidly. There's no penalty for failure, as long as you survive. Inwardly, Lumian mused, so, it doesn't matter whether I accept the mission or not. He nodded. Hunting pirates is the duty of every adventurer. With a verbal agreement established, Fidel reached into a drawer, producing a brown paper envelope, which he tossed to Lumian. Lumian deftly caught it with one hand, untied the thread, and extracted the information, swiftly flipping through it. Abruptly, he looked up at Fidel. Has Kesey been seen in Port Ferrum recently? Yes, I'm certain of this intel, though his exact hiding spot is unknown, Fidel replied with a slight nod. Agreeing to return in two days for updates on both the colorful bearded horned lizard Venom and Baronet Black, Lumian left 16 Rue Coreas and made his way towards the harbor. Roddy, fearing severe punishment, was surprised when Fidel merely waved him off, instructing, go back to your room and reflect. Yes, Monsieur Guerra. Roddy, relieved, left the study and ascended the dimly lit stairs to the second floor. Yet, as he walked, a chill overcame him, and he shivered. The darkness around him deepened, and in the dim light, something emerged from behind his shadow. Attempting to cry out for help, Roddy, gripped by terror, found himself forever voiceless. Meanwhile, Lumian didn't head directly back to the flying bird. Instead, under the cooling night sky, he strolled towards a street he had recently passed. There stood a modest cathedral, the Fool's Cathedral. Having previously spotted the Fool's sacred emblem on the bell tower, Lumian had decided to offer a prayer upon his return. As expected, Mr. Fool's faith seems prevalent at sea. Port Ferrum, being an Intus colony, boasts several cathedrals. Lumian gazed at the warm light emanating from the cathedral, removed his golden straw hat, and entered. Inside, Lumian noticed around twenty to thirty individuals, likely homeless, resting at the edge of the wide hall. Some had tattered blankets, while others relied solely on their clothes for warmth. The Fog Sea Archipelago wouldn't turn these tramps into ice statues this season, but rain lurked, ready to pour at any time. Finding shelter was a coveted haven for these tramps, and the Fool's Cathedral offered solace. Back in my vagabond days, when brutal weather hit or days without food wore me down, I'd roll the dice in the cathedrals of the two churches. If the bishop or padre was decent, they'd toss a meal my way and a spot to crash for the night. But come dawn, I had to vanish, or I'd end up in those rotten relief centers. Lumian reminisced, found a seat, and started praying. The fool's cathedral embraced silence at night. Now and then, folks strolled in, muttered their prayers, and exited. 
Some wore merchant garb, others rocked a sailor's look, and a few even emitted a faint pirate vibe, but none disturbed the peaceful aura. Lumian wasn't sure what to pray for. Back when he'd occasionally drop by the eternal blazing sun cathedral, he'd just echo bits of scripture in his mind, tossing wishes like coins and hoping for corresponding blessings. What if they actually came true? Now, he knew such rituals were futile, and he had few desires. Most importantly, Lumian had only heard clerical teachings about the fool a few times. He couldn't remember much from the Bible except for the eight angels and Mr. Fool's authority. But did that matter now? Recounting his journey from leaving Trier to arriving at Port Ferrum, Lumian's emotions gradually settled into a sense of tranquility. May Mr. Fool bless me. May all catastrophes be resolved. May Aurora be resurrected. After about fifteen minutes, Lumian concluded his prayer with a simple wish. As he stood up, a distant rumble echoed. The cathedral's windows rattled, and the building creaked and swayed. Lumian raised his eyebrows. Amidst the startled tramps, he walked to the door and gazed towards the source of the noise. Near the Governor General's office, billowing smoke and flames rose into the sky, casting an eerie glow on the surroundings. Lumian couldn't help but raise his right hand and stroke his chin. He muttered to himself, this shouldn't have anything to do with my arrival, right? It seemed something significant had occurred in Port Ferrum. Chapter 519, One Event A Day The flames of Cartier de Black Pearls danced in Lumian's eyes, pulling him deep into thought. As a conspirer, his mind instinctively dissected the possibilities. The resistance and civil independence factions were easily ruled out, they had no presence in this archipelago, Intus's first far-flung colony. The religious and cultural genocide, along with the assimilation efforts of successive governments, they had tirelessly worked to make it happen. Emperor Roselle's policies had transformed this place into something akin to Intus's overseas province, loose laws and weak security. The islanders, having abandoned their original faith, now saw themselves as discriminated citizens in the Intus border regions. This discrimination mirrored the plight of Reemians in the south of Intus and Savoyards in the east. Regardless, Trier's citizens held a universal disdain for all foreigners. However, their vigilance heightened against islanders notorious for scams and thuggery. Did the pirate trade spark internal strife, or were southern continent organizations, seeking to overthrow colonial rule, deliberately causing trouble in the Fog Sea archipelago? Perhaps some ambitious individual is following the lead of an evil god. Lumian's thoughts raced as he noticed a 2.5-meter-tall half-giant emerging from a room beside the cathedral, dressed in a black trench coat and silk top hat. Addressing the bewildered supplicants and tramps, he assured them, don't worry. The Lord will protect everyone. Stay here and don't go out. Wait for the riot to subside. There won't be any danger. Praise the fool. The believers of the fool church found solace, pressing their hands to their chests and bowing. Their expressions softened, conveying a sense of security. The tramps exchanged glances, but none dared to leave. In the minds of most Intisians, a cathedral was a safer haven than any government, regardless of the church it belonged to. At that moment, golden sunlight descended into the area where the explosion had occurred, accompanied by a series of dense explosions, though not as deafening as before. It was evident that the Governor General's office and the beyonders of the two churches were addressing the anomaly. Simultaneously, Lumian observed the sky, once illuminated by moonlight and starlight, darkening. Despite no change in the weather, the street outside seemed cloaked in a thin, dark fog. Ignoring the half-giant bishop's shouts after a moment of contemplation, Lumian opened the cathedral door of the fool and stepped out. The temperature outside had notably dropped, akin to Trier's autumn. Beneath the gas street lamp's glow, Lumian retraced his steps back to the port. Suddenly, a swaying figure emerged from a nearby alley. The figure, clad in a thin shirt and pants with bare feet, had a pale, wrinkled face. His eyes were more white than brown, and liver mortis covered his exposed skin. Zombie? Lumian raised his eyebrows. 
As the suspected zombie, an old man, staggered towards Cartier de Black Pearls, it seemed to detect a hint of spirituality and blood, abruptly turning to Lumian and emitting an inhuman sound. Lumian promptly condensed a crimson fireball, nearly white, and sent it hurtling towards the zombie. Amidst the rumbling explosion, the zombie's head shattered, and its body disintegrated. It met its demise once more. No more movement. Is that all you've got? Lumian had originally wondered if he had encountered a more dangerous undead creature. Pressing on, he formed ten to twenty crimson fireballs above his head, behind him, on his shoulders, and at his sides, allowing them to follow his movements and maintain a relative suspension. As Lumian rounded a corner, he spotted a young couple screaming in terror and fleeing. Behind them, a zombie pursued, its dark red heart and white intestines faintly discernible from numerous gunshot wounds. A nearly white crimson fireball, unleashed by Lumian, flew past the couple and exploded on the pursuing zombie. Rumble. The charred corpse scattered in all directions, accompanied by residual flames. The young couple, halted in surprise, stared at Lumian surrounded by ten to twenty crimson, nearly white fireballs. Confusion and disbelief filled their eyes. Are you waiting for death? Lumian cursed as he advanced. Take the back street and enter the fool's cathedral. All right, all right. The young man and woman responded instinctively, as if facing armed police officers or adventurers. The fireball was clearly more powerful than a gun. As the couple entered the street where the fool's cathedral was located, Lumian, resembling an envoy of flames, continued towards the port at a moderate pace. Along the way, he encountered a few more waves of people emerging from bars, open-air markets, and other places, who had encountered zombies. Lumian didn't say a word. He directed the crimson, nearly white fireballs around him to help them eliminate the revived corpses. Then, he instructed them to hide in the nearest cathedral. The zombies' pursuit and the intimidation of the fireballs made his words persuasive. No one insisted on finding their own way. If there were any, Lumian couldn't be bothered. After several similar encounters, Lumian began to discern a pattern. These zombies weren't reanimated from the living, they were originally deceased. The entirety of Port Ferrum's deceased had risen without any discernible cause. These zombies instinctively headed towards the explosion site, but if they encountered the living on the way, they'd be drawn by both flesh and spirituality, leading them to pursue, kill, and gnaw. With this understanding, Lumian no longer advised passers-by to seek refuge in distant cathedrals. Instead, he directed them to avoid hospitals, graveyards, and similar places, urging them to stay for two to three hours in bustling bars, dance halls, or houses where no recent deaths had occurred. After a series of halts and advances, Lumian returned to the port and reboard the flying bird. He continued unleashing the crimson, almost white fireballs until only two remained. Philip, leaning against the ship's rail, kept his eyes fixed on the Governor General's office. What happened? he inquired of Lumian. How would I know? Lumian replied, amused. Philip swiftly changed the topic. Did you come across any anomalies? Only then did Lumian briefly recount the explosion near the Governor General's office and the sudden reanimation of the corpses. Zombie summoning? Philip muttered to himself, a frown creasing his brow. Without awaiting Lumian's response, he sighed and said, It was smooth only on the first day of this voyage. On the second day, we encountered Bone Splitter. On the third day, Death Navigators attacked us at noon. By night, or rather in the early hours of the fourth day, another zombie calamity struck in Port Ferrum. We still have six days until we reach Port Santa. Lumian felt a pang of guilt. In theory, his attraction to or attraction by calamities shouldn't be so frequent. When he was in Trier, he didn't encounter mystical incidents every day. If that were the case, 007 would have died from overwork. Encountering one or two calamities throughout the journey would be understandable, but considering Dardell's derangement, it's truly a daily affair. Could it be that some unclean entity is tailing me? Could it be the cause, the trigger, or the convergence? And is there essentially only one calamity I've encountered? 
The more Lumian pondered, the more he felt the urge to correspond with Madame Magician to investigate if there was an underlying issue behind such frequent calamities. Perhaps the zombie calamity was triggered by the initial trouble on the ship. Once we leave the flying bird, our subsequent journey might become peaceful, Lumian casually consoled Philip. He didn't hold much confidence in his words. Hope so. Philip spread his arms slightly and prayed devoutly. Praise the sun. Lumian took his time before heading back to the first-class cabin. He lingered by the shipboard, surveying Port Ferrum. The authorities' silent endorsement of pirate activities in the Fog Sea archipelago had resulted in a certain level of chaos and misconduct. However, it had also led to a notable increase in the number of Beyonders compared to regular Intision cities. Swiftly organizing a resistance, they cleared the streets of zombies, minimizing the casualties among citizens and tourists. Whether pirates and adventurers exploited the turmoil to commit crimes or settle scores remained uncertain. In less than half an hour, the turmoil near the explosion site subsided. Official beyonders dispersed, addressing disturbances on other streets. Very good. Nothing major happened. They managed to control it in time, Philip remarked, relieved. You can say that, but I can't. Lumian laughed self-deprecatingly. Only then did Philip feel at ease enough for casual conversation. Did you go into Ferrum for a drink? That's right, Lumian replied with a smile. I happen to receive a commission. What commission? Philip asked casually. Hunting a pirate, Baronet Black. Lumian didn't withhold any details. Philip's eyes narrowed as he inquired with a frown, Are you sure you're stronger than Baronet Black? He has a ship and over a hundred subordinates. Besides, even if you find an opportunity to assassinate him, aren't you afraid of the King of Dusk's retaliation? He's one of the Maritime Kings. Just because I accepted a commission doesn't mean I'll definitely do it. I don't even know where to find Black Baronet Class Kizi. That's his name, right? Lumian didn't mind the potential repercussions from the King of Dusk. There were more than one saint who wanted to deal with him. Philip observed Lewis Berry's nonchalant demeanor, realizing he had accepted a mission but would reconsider only if there was a chance to complete it. Thus, he didn't press further on the matter. The next morning. As the security supervisor finished breakfast, a subordinate sailor informed him the governor general's office had ordered the port to be temporarily closed, and all ships were prohibited from leaving. Philip suppressed the urge to stand up and asked in a deep voice, what are the soldiers at the port doing? Searching ship by ship, the sailor replied truthfully. In room five of the first-class cabin, Lumian observed the chaotic harbor where the army had entered and continued writing a letter to Jenna and Franca. Something seems to have happened to Port Ferrum on St. Tick Island in the Fog Sea Archipelago. Ask that person and see if he knows the exact situation. At this point, Lumian raised his right hand and tapped his chest four times, up, down, left, right, like Mr. K. He whispered sympathetically, Poor 007. Chapter 520, Demon Warlock Trier, Cartier de la Cathedral Commemorative, 9 Rue Orosai, Apartment 702. Franco woke naturally, rising lazily from her bed. Her plans were simple, grabbing a piece of toast, anticipating a heavy lunch. Lately, the absence of mirror people leads had made her days relaxed. Thank the heavens, thank the earth, thank Mr. Fool. Lumian, the jinx, has left Trier. Franca muttered in her pre-meal prayer. As she sipped her milk, Jenna returned and pointed to the coffee table. Rabbit Chassel delivered a letter this morning. It's from Lumian. Letter? Franca's eyes narrowed as her relaxed body tensed. The source of Dardell's derangement was still at large. What had happened this time? He mentioned an incident in the capital of the Fog Sea Archipelago. He wishes to gather details and hopes you can inquire with your contact among the authorities. I refrain from waking you since you only reach out to that contact late at night, so I opted to read the letter immediately. It seems you can only make inquiries during the night, Jenna explained concisely. How considerate. 
Lumian, that rascal, would undoubtedly knock on the door and jolt me awake. Franca, who had experienced Lumian's disruptive wake-up calls countless times, felt unusually touched. She chuckled. Did something happen to Port Ferrum once he arrived? Even though it seems unrelated to him, but... Franca leaned back slightly and remarked, what's up with the walking mysticism catastrophe detector? Since it wasn't urgent, she planned to ask about 007 in the telegram group later at night. After all, he was an official beyonder of Trier. It was unlikely he would have immediate information about the events in the Fog Sea Archipelago's capital. If she didn't initiate the inquiry, he might remain unaware. Franca, with her penchant for instant messaging, sat down the bottle of milk and wrote Lumian a teasing reply. If you want to know what's happening, investigate it yourself. A walking mysticism catastrophe detector like yourself doesn't need clues or information. Stroll through the streets of Port Ferrum aimlessly, and who knows, you might bump into the person involved. Hey, let's not turn letter writing into work related communication, using it only to discuss issues or ask for help. Can't you share the interesting sea tales and details of pirates' bounties? Heh <laughs> heh, ever since you left Trier, everything's been calm and quiet. I can enjoy sleeping in again. Enjoy your sweet revenge. No need to rush back. Give us a heads up if you need assistance. Jenna observed Franca thoughtfully as she gleefully filled nearly two pages of the letter. Inside room five of the Flying Bird's first class cabin in Port Ferrum, Lumian, confined to his quarters, sneered as he finished reading Franca's reply. How many complaints has this fellow received from 007? She's blaming me for the frequent mysticism catastrophes. Folding the letter, he brought it to Ludwig's lips. The boy, who had just finished dessert, looked at Lumian and remarked, I'm not a shredder. I thought you eat everything, Lumian replied casually as he lit the letter, watching it turn to ashes in the sea breeze blowing through the window. Shortly after lunch, Philip knocked on the door, accompanied by four soldiers in blue military uniforms adorned with golden threads. The officer, holding copies of Lumian and the other's identification documents, compared their faces to black and white photos. Like you, they came from Port Gotti and only arrived last night, the officer inquired, having confirmed Philip's reliability. Yes, I watched them board the ship. We met frequently in the past two days, Philip replied, wisely choosing not to expose the fact that Lumian and the others' identities and information were fake. Very wise. Otherwise, you'll witness true trouble. Lumian joked inwardly. If his disguise were to be exposed, he would choose to teleport away with Lugano and Ludwig rather than make a scene and reveal the adventurer Louis Berry to the world. Lumian's only devotion to Germain Sparrow, ready to hunt pirates when the opportunity arose. In truth, Lumian had no intention of becoming a true adventurer. His purpose for venturing out to sea was revenge. After confirming Lumian and the others' situation, the officer led the soldiers to the next room, with Philip accompanying them. Lumian observed that the investigation of the flying bird was thorough, yet not overly intense. The officers followed procedures meticulously without delving into further inquiries. It made sense. The explosion in Cartier de Black Pearls and the abnormality of the corpses couldn't have occurred overnight. Even if it was an accident, it had been brewing for a while. The extensive impact suggested a prolonged development. Unless the person involved was a demigod, it was nearly impossible for ordinary authorities to trace any demigod-related traces. This meant the flying bird, having arrived in Port Ferrum only the previous night, likely had no connection to the incident. The focus was on confirming the passengers' identities. The possibility of a demigod being injured and unable to escape Port Ferrum was considered, warranting a comprehensive investigation, but there were no suspicious casualties on the flying bird. The officers disembarked after nearly two hours, accompanied by twenty to thirty soldiers. Lumian, now on the deck, approached Philip and inquired, What happened last night? Philip glanced around and lowered his voice. I heard from my former colleague that they're searching for demon warlock Berman. Berman? Lumian expressed his ignorance. 
Having only read a portion of the wanted posters the previous night, Lumian was not familiar with demon warlock Berman. His attention had been on maritime kings, pirate admirals, and other significant pirates. Then, he had shared a drink with Batna Kant. He's a wanted adventurer, Philip explained with a sigh. Before I left the Fog Sea fleet, he was still normal. He chased bounties and treasures and met his wife, Helen, a female adventurer. Later, Helen died in an accident, causing Berman to go crazy. He wanted to revive his wife and did many things, both good and bad attempts. He mercilessly orchestrated the destruction of a 300-person town to fulfill the conditions for a resurrection ritual. He organized gatherings of evil warlocks, aiming to use the lives of others, especially newborns, for cruel and bloody witchcraft to revive Helen. These events pushed his bounty to surpass Bone Splitter Basil, reaching 600,000 Verldor. In his quest to resurrect his wife, he was driven to become a cruel and cold demon warlock. Lumian suddenly sighed. If Madam Magician hadn't found him back then, if Mr. Fool hadn't offered a glimmer of hope, and if the Tarot Club hadn't arranged for two formidable psychiatrists to provide treatment, would he now resemble Berman and carry a demon-prefixed moniker? Moreover, simply treading the path of boons would expedite his growth. With Termoboros's aid, he could reach Sequence 5 Fate Appropriator within a few months. The obliteration of a 300-person town held the potential to elevate him to a circle inhabitant. 600,000 Verldor is nearly on par with Vice Admiral Black Tide Holly Sassen, who has the lowest bounty among pirate admirals, Lumian remarked, drawing a comparison. Vice Admiral Black Tide was a great pirate who had only gained fame in recent years. His bounty was 700,000 Verldor. Philip fell silent for a moment before adding, Berman might not be weaker than Holly Sassen, but he doesn't have his own fleet. He's always alone and occasionally collaborates with those evil warlocks. This allows him to escape authorities' encirclements and successfully infiltrate towns adorned with his wanted posters. From Philip's description, Lumian gathered that demon warlock Berman possessed diverse abilities, excelling at disguises. With the elegance of a true warlock, Berman combined it with mastery over the power of the dead whether acquired through resurrection research or inherent in his original sequence's contradictory description of both comprehensive and specialty skills. The port blockade left the flying bird stranded in Ferrum, delayed from its scheduled departure. At 4 p.m., Lumian found himself with nothing to do. Sporting his new golden straw hat, he disembarked from the ship, where passengers and sailors could now freely move. Once more, he stepped into Port Ferrum. He planned to investigate the scene of last night's explosion. Perhaps he could unearth some clues. What lay in ruins was a hospital. Nearly half of it crumbled, unveiling a massive pit leading underground. Corpses littered the remaining structures, amidst fresh blood and humanoid shadows charred by the blast. With the ban lifted, numerous adventurers flocked to the site, seeking answers. Lumian blended into the crowd, discreetly observing. Lewis, you're here too. Suddenly, Lumian recognized a familiar voice. It was Batna Kant, armed with a substantial revolver and an exquisite rapier. Meticulously groomed, he looked sharp and sophisticated. That's right, Lumian replied with a smile. As an adventurer, how can I miss the grand occasion of pursuing the demon warlock? Our main goal is to gather clues for a reward. Batna muttered under his breath. As he investigated the battle remnants for Leeds, he casually inquired, Did you come across those resurrected corpses last night? I did. Besides being a bit eerie, there's nothing noteworthy about them, Lumian boasted. Batna glanced at him and suddenly smiled. Anything unusual happened to you after leaving the bar last night? Lumian replied nonchalantly, I ran into a few swindlers and walked away with a small fortune. A small fortune. Batna was taken aback. He suddenly recalled Lewis Berry's actions at the bar and his words, perhaps they think I'm an easy target? Chapter 521, Guidance of Fate When Batna turned his gaze back to Lumian, there was a discernible shift in his eyes. 
the mimicry of Gehrman's sparrow and the apparent recklessness that characterized this guy seemed all too contrived. Beneath the facade lurked cunning and a hint of sinister intent. Anyone falling for his act was in for a world of trouble. Lumian chose not to dwell on how he'd managed to swindle a small fortune out of the swindlers. Instead, together with Batna, he meticulously surveyed the aftermath of the explosion, scrutinizing every detail. Regrettably, even the official Beyonders, armed with their diverse sequences and synergistic combinations, were at a loss, let alone the duo lacking any proficiency in divination or prophecy. Batna absent-mindedly ran his fingers over the finely crafted rapier hanging diagonally at his waist, letting out a sigh. I know it's a long shot, but I can't resist coming here, wasting my time. It's not about the bounty. What adventurer doesn't dream of overnight fame? Hunting down the demon warlock Berman wasn't the only route to fame. Assisting official Beyonders in tracking this wanted criminal, whose bounty rivaled that of a pirate admiral, was a noteworthy feat in itself. Wasn't your primary motivation to gather clues for the money? Lumian inquired, a playful smile on his face. Ah, well, that's a secondary motive, Batna awkwardly defended himself. Suddenly, he had a realization. He never explicitly mentioned that his investigation aimed at accumulating clues for monetary gain. He merely thought about it. Can he read my thoughts, or is he just bluffing? Batna scrutinized Lumian with a perplexed expression. Lumian chuckled. Don't let your thoughts betray you. If you cross paths with a spectator, your secrets won't stay hidden. Batna instinctively lifted his right hand and touched his face. Is my expression management that bad? He vented his frustration with a muttered curse, with the scene in this level of chaos and no traces left on the nearby streets, unless a deity blesses me, or I'm imbued with luck, finding any clues is like searching for a needle in a haystack. How about we grab a drink instead? Luck. Finding clues doesn't necessarily hinge on good luck, bad luck could work just as well. Lumian's heart stirred as he pulled a bandage from his pocket and calmly wrapped it around his eyes. Batna Kant, utterly bewildered, couldn't help but ask, what on earth are you doing? Blindfolding. Relying solely on instinct to navigate the nearby streets eliminates external influences and unleashes the full force of luck, Lumian explained with a chuckle. Perhaps today, luck is truly on my side? According to Franca, a mystical catastrophe detector like him didn't need conventional clues or intel, he might just stumble upon the person involved while strolling around. In that case, Lumian decided to follow the whims of fate this time. If he succeeded, he could use the demon warlock or related clues to claim a handsome bounty. If he failed, it would prove Franca's words to be nothing but baseless slander. Batna couldn't help but wonder if Lewis Berry had lost his mind. Can you really do that? There's no harm in trying, Lumian replied confidently, blindfolded and ready to step onto the street. After a few paces, he abruptly halted. Blindfolding, he realized, was useless for hunters. The path he had taken and the scenes he had observed while searching for clues were vividly etched in his mind, meticulously arranged according to their real-world locations. Essentially, he possessed a high-definition mental map of the surrounding streets, allowing him to reach shops and buildings with uncanny precision. With a hunter's exceptional control over their body and direction, even without sight, coupled with heightened senses of smell and hearing, Lumian couldn't help but conclude that relying on the whims of fate was redundant. After a moment of contemplation, he began to ponder his next move freely. Demon warlock Berman's elusive escapes hints at special abilities or possessions granting him such freedom. Can he teleport away like me, alter his appearance and height at will, or perhaps even disguise himself as someone of a different gender? Despite numerous bloody and cruel experiments, Berman has evaded capture, suggesting conventional methods and thinking wouldn't suffice. Can I change my mindset and let him take the initiative to appear? Yes, if we can't find him, we can make him come to us. His primary concern is resurrecting his wife, Helen. If I can fabricate a few cases of resurrection or discuss resurrection at certain mysticism gatherings and provide verifiable mysticism knowledge in related domains, this demon warlock might very well follow the clues I left behind. 
However, this plan faces two challenges. The official Beyonders might have attempted similar schemes, and Berman, being cautious, could see through them. Additionally, the time needed for setup and waiting could be weeks or even months, a luxury I lack in Port Ferrum. I can only weave the plan gradually into mysticism gatherings and bar conversations, occasionally revealing secrets to make it more realistic and my motives less apparent. Lost in his thoughts, Lumian relied on Batnakant for occasional support, preventing mishaps during their walk. When Lumian had a complete albeit time-consuming plan, he stopped, removed the bandage covering his eyes, and smiled at Batna. Where are we? My intuition says there might be clues about the demon warlock hidden here. It's a regular street with regular houses. The residents seem wealthy and powerful, Batna replied helplessly. Lumian finally caught sight of the evening sun. As Lumian adjusted to the evening sun, his eyes narrowed, and his heart quickened. Although unfamiliar with many streets in Port Ferrum, his instinctive journey guided by fate had led him to a familiar place, 16 Rue Correas. The adjacent grayish-brown building, adorned with a sculpted outer wall, belonged to Fidel Guerra, the prominent merchant. Lumian had reserved colorful bearded horned lizard venom here last night and accepted a commission to hunt down black baronet class Kizi. Temaboros, are you behind this? Lumian's immediate instinct was to question the inevitability angel sealed within him. Termaboros remained silent, leaving Batna, standing beside Lumian, puzzled. He couldn't fathom who Lewis Berry was addressing. If Termaboros didn't intentionally lead me here, then something in Fidel Guerra's house is aligning with my fate. Is it an item related to the hunter pathway or connected to an evil god? Or could the clues to demon warlock Berman's whereabouts truly be found at Fidel's residence? Lumian's mind raced as he rapidly considered a series of possibilities. Staring at Fidel's building, he evaluated the likelihood of the demon warlock's presence. Berman, engaged in numerous resurrection experiments, likely struggled to complete his preparations alone. Snatching various resources would draw the attention of both official beyonders and pirates who sought his capture. Only the assistance of other evil warlocks could provide him with the necessary help. If a well-connected merchant like Fidel supported him in secret, Berman wouldn't face difficulties obtaining experimental materials. For Fidel, with a sequence possibly not high enough, having a demon warlock reliant on him for covert protection is undoubtedly advantageous. Considering Fidel's clandestine business, vulnerable to attacks from powerful pirates or adventurers, having a demon warlock at his disposal makes sense. In case of future conflicts with authorities, the warlock could shield him, enabling a change of identity and a fresh start in another city or country. According to Aurora's insights, such individuals often maintain fake identities and reserve assets in multiple places. Last night, soon after I met Fidel, a mishap occurred involving the demon warlock's failed experiment. Lumian averted his gaze. Lumian increasingly suspected that the merchant, Fidel Guerra, had motives to shield demon warlock Berman. Of course, if Termaboros intentionally guided him here, the situation would only become more complex and serious. What are you looking at? Batna inquired, following Lumian's gaze to 16 Rue Correas. I met Fidel Guerra, a prominent merchant, here last night and received a commission from him, Lumian replied candidly. What commission? Batna asked with curiosity. Lumian responded with a smile, hunt the captain of the Golden Nepos, Black Baronet Class Kizi. Is the rumor true that Black Baronet Class hijacked Fidel's shipment? Fidel hired numerous adventurers to deal with Black Baronet. Batna enlightened before lowering his voice. Don't tell anyone about this. Why? Lumian inquired with a smile. Batna, stroking his neatly trimmed stubble, whispered, These bounties and commissions don't necessitate actual acceptance, nor do they require success. Yes, if word gets out that an adventurer plans to hunt a pirate, and they're not too far apart, revenge from said pirate is inevitable. It's both a punishment and a warning. Baronet Black is a notorious pirate. If he catches wind that a newcomer like you is taking on a mission to hunt him and is spreading the news, do you think he'll take offense? He might track you down and use your demise as a lesson for other adventurers and Fidel. 
Baronet Black is indeed in Port Ferrum. Lumian nodded thoughtfully. That's a smart approach. Smart? Batna was momentarily taken aback. In the evening, at a bar, Lumian, Batna, and the others had been reveling for nearly two hours, filled with joy and excitement. Suddenly, Lumian lifted his glass and descended from the barstool to the floor. Addressing the adventurers and ordinary patrons around him, he declared, Everyone, remember my name, Lewis Berry. I'm on the brink of fame. I've accepted a commission from the prominent merchant, Fidel. My objective is to track down Black Baronet Class Kesey. When I succeed, the name Lewis Berry will echo across the five seas. When that time comes, you'll proudly say you shared a drink with me. Ah. Batna froze on the barstool. It felt like witnessing Lewis Berry once again leaping onto the wooden platform and firing his gun the night before. Chapter 522 Excellent Scheme Amid the bustling scene, Lumian relished his drink until the clock neared midnight. Exiting the bar with Batna, they stepped onto the street, where the once warm sea breeze had turned chilly. Batna hesitated before asking, Do you seriously plan to go after Baronet Black? Hadn't Lewis Berry's performance been a repeat of the previous night's scheme, expecting Black Baronet Class Kesey to come looking for him? Lumian turned his head, his green eyes devoid of any signs of intoxication. Otherwise? If he doesn't seek me out, where am I supposed to find him? Sneak onto the Golden Nepos and take on their entire ship solo? Fair point. Batna conceded that Lewis Berry's logic had merit. Once Black Baronet made land, he would likely disguise himself, making him hard to track. At sea or on his own boat, a lone adventurer would find it nearly impossible to take him down. Even lions feared a wolf pack. Moreover, among the wolves, aside from Class Kesey, there were a few heads with beyonder powers. Batna had to admit that every head was no less formidable than himself. After a brief pause, Batna sensed something amiss and blurted out, Are you sure you can handle Baronet Black and the two or three helpers he might have? Lumian's lips curled into a smile. Every adventurer who comes to see dreams of following in Gehrman Sparrow's great footsteps. It wasn't the first time he said this, but the tone was different. This time, Batna detected a calm and serious demeanor. Is he for real? Is he sly and cunning or just plain reckless? At that moment, Batna had to reconsider his understanding of Lewis Berry. There was a method to his madness, a trap meticulously laid out, but the aspirations and strategies were impractical. What struck Batna most was that Lewis knew it was unrealistic, yet he calmly and persistently pressed on to realize his grand dream. How to describe this guy? Batna couldn't find the right words. At that moment, Lumian had already reached the open-air market stalls. He dropped five verdure on fried banana slices, scones, roasted meat, roasted oysters, grilled fish, roasted shrimp, and sugar cane. You're still hungry? Batna asked, surprised. During their drinking session, they had already ordered fries, fish, meatloaf, and more. Lumian smiled and replied, getting supper for my godson. Godson? At your age? Batna couldn't quite fathom this guy with a Savoy province accent. Maybe it's a trend in the mountainous province for young men to become godfathers? After Lumian picked up the brown paper bags, Batna exhaled and remarked, your plan might not be effective. Adventurers boasting about their exploits are a dime a dozen. They might not consider your declaration a joke to spread it to others. It's too common. Lumian smiled and said, no, they'll spread it like wildfire. In a few days, the entire Port Ferrum will know that a new adventurer has taken a commission to hunt down Baronet Black. How's that possible? You can't control their mouths, Batna retorted subconsciously. Suddenly, he was taken aback. You can't really control their thoughts, can you? Lumian scoffed and tapped his head with the paper bags. Use your brain and think carefully. They won't want to spread it. Someone will help me spread it. Batna had an epiphany. You want to secretly hire a group of people to help you publicize this matter. 
He paused for a few seconds before continuing, there's no need for you to hire them. The merchant, Fidel, will help you achieve your goal once he finds out about your act. He has ample resources. But what if he doesn't know? I'll pay him a visit tomorrow, Lumian replied calmly. It's meticulous and feasible. It's like iron chains, all interconnected. The more Batna thought about it, the more he realized that every detail of this plan had been considered, but overall, it exuded a sense of madness. After a while, he instinctively assessed, if Baronet Black leaves the Fog Sea, it might take months for him to hear the news. If he happens to be in Port Ferrum, perhaps he'll find out in two or three days. Port Ferrum had a population of just over 100,000, including tourists. It might not even be comparable to a Cartier in Trier. More people were scattered across St. Tick Island's plantations and the Andatna volcano mines. I hope he's in Port Ferrum, Lumian said with a satisfied expression as he strolled through the night. Batna fell silent, unsure of what to say. Returning to the flying bird, Lumian entered room 5 of the first class cabin and found Ludwig enjoying the supper he had left for him. He placed the brown paper bags on the dining table. The aroma of fried ingredients and barbecue filled the air. Ludwig looked up in surprise before quickly devouring the food Lumian had brought back. Lumian settled into a nearby recliner, rocking gently. Finally, Ludwig let out a contented sigh and said, You get tired of always eating cheese, bread, cakes, and crackers for supper. A person who can even eat live rats raw doesn't have the right to say that. Lumian criticized and smiled. This proves that I haven't forgotten you, my godson. By the way, how long do you plan to follow me? I've already helped you escape the Church of Knowledge. Ludwig pondered seriously. I'll follow you until I can earn my own living. Nah, now, I'm still a child. That's true. If this fellow doesn't have the money to buy food, something terrifying might happen. Also, before I go to the City of Exiles, the Church of Knowledge probably won't allow Ludwig to leave me. Lumian laughed self-deprecatingly. I, an unmarried underage man, have to support a child like you for a long time. Ludwig muttered under his breath, not necessarily very long. Does that mean you can recover to the point of supporting yourself within this year or next? Lumian pretended not to hear Ludwig's muttering and gestured towards the servants' quarters with his chin. Has that guy been acting okay? Ludwig, acting as a spy, asked in confusion, for intentions, is flirting with women on the deck and in the bar under the pretext of attending to patients considered okay? Yes. Lumian sighed helplessly. You and Tisians. The next afternoon, amid rumors of the port closure possibly ending the following morning, Lumian disembarked from the Flying Bird and headed straight to Rue Correa's and Cartier de Black Pearls to pay an early visit to the prominent merchant, Fidel Guerra. The previous evening, Lumian had received a letter from Franca, delivered by Jenna's rabbit Chassel. The explosion in Port Ferrum matched Philip's intel, but there were more details. By the time official Beyonders reached the scene, demon warlock Berman had already vanished. Facing an undead monster made of limbs and corpse fragments, capable of awakening the deceased in Port Ferrum, official Beyonders had their hands full. The hospital suffered casualties, patients fell victim to the monstrous horror. In Fidel Guerra's study, Lumian met the man, a blend of Entis and Fainapotter blood, smoking a cigar with a grin. Did you come here because of the smell? I just received the colorful bearded horned lizard venom. Just obtained? I'm afraid it's been here all along. Considering my earnest efforts to draw out Baronet Black and fulfill your request, you're not suggesting you haven't secured the goods. Lumian ventured a guess, a smile playing on his lips. Seems Lux smiling upon me. How much? 3,800 Verl d'Or. My cut isn't much, Fidel replied sincerely. Lumian didn't negotiate. He produced a stack of banknotes and tallied out 3,800 Verl d'Or. Observing this, Fidel signaled an attendant and gave instructions. Soon after, the attendant returned, carrying a brown glass bottle. Fidel directed the attendant to take the money and hand over the goods while he kept a distance of roughly 10 meters from Lumian. Metal containers won't do. 
the venom's potency can be affected by corrosion. Lumian nodded subtly, casting a glance at the brown glass bottle before stashing it away in his pocket. After the attendant departed, Fidel grinned once more. I heard you replicated your act from the night before at the bar last night. This influential merchant showcased his well-informed nature. Indeed, we must employ effective strategies repeatedly, Lumian tacitly concurred. Fidel nodded. I appreciate a sharp young man like you. I'll help disseminate your message and ensure Class Kesey hears it promptly. Hehe, <laughs> the adventurers I assigned to this task previously were far too risk-averse. No problem. That's precisely why I'm here today, Lumian mentioned before making his way to leave. After a few steps, he abruptly halted, turned around, and spoke thoughtfully, Do you think Demon Warlock Berman is hiding here? Fidel was taken aback. What are you talking about? What does the Demon Warlock have to do with me? Not much. Just a wild guess, Lumian replied with a smile. Rue Correas is very close to where the explosion occurred last night, and your establishment is quite suitable for hiding. Without waiting for Fidel's response, he took another step and casually exited the building. Fidel observed Lumian's departure, furrowing his brow in confusion. He couldn't fathom why Lumian had uttered those words. In the deep of night, the sound of waves echoed in the distance, and the flying birds swayed gently. Lumian reclined on the bed in room 5 of the first-class cabin, enveloped in a velvet blanket. His eyes shut tight, breathing deep, he was sound asleep. Suddenly, a dark cloud materialized outside the window, obscuring the crimson moon and stars in the sky. The room, draped in curtains, plunged into darkness. Even looking at one's hands, one could barely discern five fingers. Within the shadows, something seemed to stir to life. Chapter 523, Eye of Illusory A lanky shadow emerged from the shadows in translucent form. Swiftly, it lunged at Lumian, as if eager to claim a new host. Resembling the possession of wraiths and evil spirits, this entity sought control but lacked the speed to complete the process in a mere blink. In an instant, Lumian, previously dormant, transformed into a shadowy figure, melding seamlessly with the darkness, leaving the bed bereft of his presence. This marked the manifestation of his newly contracted skill, shadow transformation. An eerie hush enveloped the room, dominated by the tall, translucent shadow, erasing any trace of Lumian or his unseen assailant. Suddenly, the darkness rift, revealing a decaying, skeletal python oozing yellowish-green pus. Empty-eyed, its fondless mouth resembled a vortex, emitting a hurried, piercing sound. A suction force tugged at the surrounding shadows, drawing them in. It seemed like an undead creature, a specialist in consuming shadows and shadowy creatures. Room 5 of the Flying Bird's first-class cabin's master bedroom assumed an otherworldly tableau. Despite the lingering dim light, shadows dissipated, leaving everything cloaked in pure darkness. In due time, Lumian emerged from the shadows, resuming his human form against the backdrop of a lush carpet and an exquisite wardrobe. Simultaneously, a towering figure materialized, a knight adorned in tattered black armor. Pale flames flickered in its eye sockets, putrid liquid seeping from the armor's crevices, with only sticky flesh clinging to its exposed skin. With a broadsword raised, the dead knight advanced, slashing at Lumian, as if poised to shatter both bed and wardrobe. Lumian's agile form shifted, maneuvering from facing the death knight, the shadow-swallowing python, and the looming tall, thin shadow to flank them all. Crash! The broadsword of the death knight cleaved through the wardrobe, sending fragments flying. Lumian, reacting swiftly, crouched down, clenched his fists and struck the heavy brownish-yellow carpet. From the center, a multitude of crimson, nearly white flames burst forth, consuming every inch of the room. The inferno devoured the three undead entities suspected to be from the spirit world. Rumble! Within the roaring flames, fireballs materialized and shot out from Lumian's form. They honed in on the Death Knight, the shadow-swallowing python, and the lanky black shadow, or recklessly engulfed the sizable bedroom. Rumble. The crimson, nearly white fireballs detonated consecutively, 
tearing apart the three undead beings, pulverizing the bed, desk, and other furnishings. Pungent smoke billowed from the scorched carpet. In this explosive turmoil, any entity lacking pure ethereality or possessing partial corporeality faced inevitable destruction in the confined space. The once steel-clad armor of the Death Knight crumbled instantly, and the shadow-swallowing python fractured into a multitude of burning remains. Though the lanky shadow fared relatively better, it too succumbed to the engulfing flames, dwindling in substance. Rumble Although the flying bird boasted a steel structure, the impact of such force, reminiscent of multiple cannons targeting a confined space, inevitably took its toll on room 5 of the first-class cabin. Strangely, only cracks marred the inner wall, with neither the wall nor the door fully giving way. However, the formless barrier enveloping the area shuddered violently, on the verge of disintegration. As shockwaves rebounded from the walls, doors, and ceiling, Lumian, the catalyst of the explosion, suffered as well. It was akin to being struck repeatedly by a massive hammer, with his vision clouded by golden specks and a metallic taste of blood in his throat. The air, instantly devoured by flames, left him with a suffocating sensation. Amidst the tumultuous flames, a figure emerged from the darkness, standing near the window, adorned in a black robe with a loose hood. Numerous wounds marked his body, testament to the explosive waves and engulfing flames, leaving charred imprints. Lumian observed that the man's once fine hairs had transformed into pale white, nearly indistinguishable feathers. Some were charred, emitting a dark dense fog instead of thick smoke. Rather than the usual red blood, a thick yellowish-green hue oozed from the wounds. Under the raised hood, Lumian discerned a pale white face and a few ulcers reaching down to the bone. Vague traces of pale white fur adorned the wounds. In the blink of an eye, Lumian locked eyes with his opponent, who sported cold flaxen-colored irises. Between the brows of the hooded figure, a crack swiftly widened, revealing an illusory vertical eye with a deep purple border that almost verged on black. Devoid of eyelashes or pupils, it seemed to harbor countless pale white patterns. This peculiar vertical eye instantly mirrored Lumian's figure. His initial intention to teleport behind the hooded man and employ the spell of harumph met an abrupt freeze. The impact resonated at the spiritual level. It was akin to Lumian's soul body losing the protective shield of his physical form and standing exposed to scorching sunlight. Instinctively, fear, stiffness, and lethargy gripped him. Ordinarily, humans explored the spirit world through astral projection, rarely detaching their soul body, the core of their soul, from their physical being, always shrouded in protection. The Arbiter Pathway's psychic piercing bypassed the physical body, ether body, astral projection, and body of heart and mind, directly influencing the soul body. It carried an almost undefendable reputation, affecting individuals to varying degrees. Lumian suspected that the spell of Harumph shared these characteristics. Within the assailant's dark purple, nearly black vertical eye, pale white patterns silently spun, as if seeking the essence of Lumian's spirit body. The sensation resembled being scrutinized by penetrating rays of light, causing Lumian's spirit body to quiver slightly, impeding intricate thoughts. Just as he was about to take the simplest action of sinking his consciousness into the Blood Emperor mark on his right hand, the hooded man emitted a sudden pained groan. His head snapped back as if struck by a bullet, the once illusory, dark purple vertical eye now blurry, oozing dark red blood mixed with yellowish-green pus. With a pained groan, the hooded figure swiftly turned and soared out of the window, dragged by an unseen force. Observing this, Lumian didn't hasten to block the escape with spirit world traversal. Instead, he raised his right hand and snapped his fingers. Boom! At the window, a crimson, almost blinding light erupted, and a violent explosion engulfed the hooded man. Lumian had set this as a trap. Before entering a state of sleep, he had concealed the master bedroom within the bottle of fiction. There were two entrances, one by the window and the other by the door, accessible only to beings with superpowers. Both exits harbored delayed explosion fireballs. Any trigger would unleash devastation. Amidst the fiery explosion, the hooded man was propelled off his feet, crashing against the window frame. His limbs seemed on the brink of tearing from his body. 
Without a moment's hesitation, Lumian teleported to the severely injured and unconscious man, harumphing at his foe. Two beams of white light shot forth, striking the target and rendering him completely unconscious. As Lumian prepared for his next move, pairs of arms suddenly emerged from the darkness at the shattered exit of the bottle of fiction. Some were covered in warts, some decayed to the point of pus overflowing, and some only displayed blackened bones. These arms seized the hooded man's clothes and dragged him into the shadows, disappearing without a trace. Observing this, Lumian refrained from an immediate transformation into a shadow creature to pursue them. Instead, he stood his ground, a slight frown creasing his brows. The assailant shared an uncanny resemblance to demon warlock Berman as depicted on the wanted posters, but the non-human feeling was even more pronounced. The details suggested an undying monster rather than a human. Lumian wasn't caught off guard by demon warlock Berman's appearance. It was one of the anticipated outcomes. He had deliberately voiced suspicions about Fidel's connection with the demon warlock in front of him without providing clarity, fostering the illusion that Louis Berry, a bold adventurer with a penchant for conspiracies, was attempting to extort money from the prominent merchant. Under normal circumstances, even if Fidel had something to hide, he wouldn't act so swiftly. He would likely observe closely for a few days to confirm the situation. Lumian, however, had offered him an opportunity this time. Louis Berry, the adventurer, had made public the commission he accepted to lure out Baronet Black. In such a scenario, it wouldn't raise eyebrows if he were killed by Class Kesey. The death of an overconfident individual in Port Ferrum wouldn't spark trouble or suspicion. So, why not nip the danger in the bud? Even if Louis Berry's suspicions lacked evidence, they would still draw the attention of official beyonders. Lumian's performance at the bar the previous night seemed to bait Black Baronet Class Kesey, but in reality, it was bait for the merchant, Fidel Guerra. If Fidel had no ties to the demon warlock, it wouldn't trigger an additional reaction. Lumian merely needed to pursue the superficial purpose of hunting Black Baronet. If there was a connection, he would promptly receive a response. To Lumian's surprise, the abilities exhibited by Demon Warlock Berman shared similarities with the few divine pathways he knew, but there were also notable differences. Chapter 524 Infighting The illusory eye between the Demon Warlock's brows bore a remarkable resemblance to the Eye of Mystery prying from the Warlock pathway. However, this entity took a unique form, manifesting as a vertical eye rather than the typical manifestation within the eye itself. Lumian had never encountered or heard of such a phenomenon before. While a mystery prior might experience similar abnormalities as a high sequence beyond her, it was clear that Berman hadn't reached the saint level. Otherwise, Lumian would have been the one fleeing, not him. In such a scenario, Lumian might not have been able to escape even if he desired his only hope would be that the residual aura of the Blood Emperor could momentarily distract Berman, enabling him to teleport away. Considering the authorities wanted poster, information from 007, and details gathered from Philip and others, Lumian had long concluded that a demon warlock like Berman couldn't be a sequence for, he certainly wasn't audacious enough to hunt a demigod. Based on the illusory vertical eye and Berman's diverse, Comprehensive abilities, Lumian sensed a true alignment with the characteristics of a warlock. However, no warlock's eye of mystery prying resembled this. Not only did it grow between the brows and become a vertical eye, marked with pale white patterns against a nearly black background, but it also possessed the ability to intimidate others' spirit bodies, revealing a perceived truth. In that moment, Lumian felt as if he had been stripped of all externalities leaving only his spirit body to resist Berman's. Yielding or failing would result in fainting or enslavement. Fortunately, the truth on him was beyond the perception of low to mid-sequence beyonders, and Berman was no exception. Before Lumian could activate the Blood Emperor's residual aura, the demon warlock suffered a backlash, nearly incapacitating him. Moreover, Berman's command over the undead and the protection he received after fainting surpassed typical warlock capabilities. Even if others could achieve similar effects with learned or invented spells, it wouldn't be to that extent, let alone so effortlessly. Which evil god's pathway is this? 
or has Berman, a warlock, been corrupted and acquired abnormal traits? That would explain the non-human details on him. After conducting so many resurrection experiments, he wouldn't lack the kind that sacrifices to evil gods. The illusory vertical eye was undeniably powerful and bizarre. I couldn't withstand it head on. Were it not for the protection of Mr. Fool's seal, Termoboros, and the lingering aura of the Blood Emperor, all surpassing my current level, I might have met my demise at Berman's hands. Lumian's thoughts raced as he quickly made a guess. Seizing this moment to counteract the impact of the explosion, he retrieved the golden straw hat from his traveler's bag and placed it on his head before disappearing. Lumian teleported to 16 Rue Correas, the entrance of Fidel Guerra's opulent residence. While demon warlock Berman had the means to escape, the same couldn't be said for this prominent merchant. If Berman had been in good condition when he fled, Lumian worried that he might return out of professional courtesy and rescue his employer. However, since Berman had been rendered unconscious and taken away by some undead creature, he wouldn't be returning to 16 Rue Correas. He wouldn't even after waking up either. The more time passed, the more likely Fidel Guerra's house would become a trap for the demon warlock. Hence, Lumian still had time to ponder Berman's sequence and the non-human issues he exhibited. His deliberate delay served a purpose. If demon warlock Berman were to wake up promptly and flee with his employer, Lumian's calculated delay of a minute or two would ensnare both of them. Standing at the entrance of 16 Rue Correas, Lumian's brow furrowed slightly. As a hunter, he detected a faint scent of blood emanating from inside the house. After a moment of consideration, Lumian gently pushed open the dark blue door. It was unlocked. The door bore splatters of fresh blood that hadn't fully congealed. It seemed as though someone in a panic had sought refuge here, unlocking the door just before being pursued and torn to pieces. However, there were no remnants of the corpse to be found. Lumian halted at the doorway, listening intently. The entire house remained eerily silent. Did Fidel act swiftly, eliminating those in the know and relocating to safety before Berman could strike me down? In such a scenario, if Berman's operation proved successful and he uncovered the reasons for my suspicions and if there were others privy to the information, Fidel could use the pretext of a late-night attack by Black Baronet and other pirates, where he nearly lost his life. Escaping wouldn't have been easy before returning here. Alternatively, he might vanish forever, adopting a new identity to embark on a fresh business venture. Lumian pondered this mystery as he navigated past the blood-stained area at the entrance, intending to search the house for clues. His goal was to uncover the exact relationship between Fidel Guerra and demon warlock Berman. Leaving the door slightly ajar, he proceeded towards the staircase, the scent of blood lingering in the air. Perhaps sensing his approach, heavy footsteps suddenly echoed. Amidst the rhythmic sounds of footsteps, a figure emerged from the basement, coming into Lumian's line of sight. It wasn't human, or rather, it couldn't be deemed human any longer. Standing three to four meters tall, its body comprised fragments from various human corpses. It possessed a mix of feminine curves and masculine traits, sewn together by linen threads, with blood-stained mucus dripping from the joints. This person featured a relatively intact head, with only one source, Fidel Guerra, a mixed blood entus and phanopotter. The merchant's head didn't align with the body, it was as if a child's head had been placed on a half-giant's neck. Dark brown eyes, vacant yet still filled with fear and confusion, stared out. Dead? Fidel is dead? Did he turn himself into a monster? Lumian pondered. Just as this thought crossed his mind, the stitched corpse lunged forward, dragging three human leg bones that seemed fused together. A pale white flame ignited on the colossal bone sword. Lumian's eyes narrowed, and his body abruptly vanished, reappearing instantly behind the massive stitched corpse. Ha! Ah. He opened his mouth and emitted a pale yellow light. However, the light struck Fidel's head, failing to disorient him, let alone render him unconscious. It became apparent that the undead creature was immune to the spell of Harumph. Almost simultaneously, the rapidly running sutured corpse forcefully pivoted, emitting a muffled sound from its throat, a language Lumian didn't understand or a word carrying magical effects. 
Lumian's soul trembled, as if cowed by evil and death. He momentarily froze. The sutured corpse turned around, advancing with purpose. It raised the colossal bone sword, burning with pale white flames, and slashed at Lumian's head. Lumian, experienced in such situations, mostly stemming from encounters with high-level entities, found the current threat less severe than the consequences of the demon warlock's illusory vertical eye. Just in time, Lumian woke up, activating the black mark on his right shoulder. Amidst the howling wind, the colossal bone sword, engulfed in pale white flames, struck the afterimage left behind. This time, Lumian materialized close to the stitched corpse's back, stabbing the symphony of hatred retrieved from his traveler's bag into it. With a pft, the pitch-black bone flute, seemingly fragile, plunged into the stitched corpse's flesh. The flaxen threads burst open, and chunks of flesh and blood peeled off, revealing a dark red heart emitting pale white flames. Lumian extended his left hand, pressing it against the near-fatal wound. The crimson fireball, nearly white, compressed layer by layer as it was pushed in. Utilizing the reactive force, Lumian abruptly flew backward, dodging the massive bone sword that slashed at him. Rumble. In midair, he witnessed crimson, nearly white flames erupt from the sutured corpse, tearing apart the beating heart. Rumble. The sutured corpse disintegrated, and the flesh and blood of various humans scattered on the ground. Bang. Fidel's head landed in a pile of flesh and blood, the blankness giving way to a pained expression. Who turned you into this? Lumian inquired, glancing out the window, sensing that the explosion would likely draw the attention of the patrolling police. Fidel's head opened its mouth, words muffled and filled with hatred. It's, it's Berman. Berman? Lumian was taken aback. Were you in fighting? Fidel's head throbbed with pain as his voice trailed off. I thought you were testing me. I wanted to observe for a few more days, B, but he couldn't wait. He won, wanted to kill you tonight. I didn't agree, and he killed everyone in the house. He, he's a true lunatic. At this point, Fidel's head lolled, his eyes closed, and he fell silent. Demon warlock Berman's mental state is quite problematic. Lumian thought. Is that why he killed his employer's entire household? If he really wanted to kill me, he could have acted alone. Lumian had previously considered whether Fidel would think he was baiting him. For this reason, he deliberately created the illusion that he was baiting Black Baronet to lull Fidel. As for the effect, Lumian didn't care too much. If Fidel didn't take the bait, he would use another method. Fishing wasn't the only method in his arsenal. Unexpectedly, this triggered infighting between Fidel and Berman. Lumian believed even he couldn't bring himself to do such a thing when his psychological problems were at their worst. That was unless Fidel provoked him, such as pointing out that only a lunatic would believe in resurrection. Observing the corpse fragments for a while, Lumian noticed no signs of a beyonder characteristic emerging. Curse my luck. Berman must have taken it. He shook his head and walked towards the room where the safe might be. Chapter 525 Repair Fee Lumian wasn't sure if he should attribute the misfortune of demon warlock Berman taking the banknotes, coins, and gold from the safe to the Symphony of Hatred. After all, he hadn't arrived at 16 Rue Correas and hadn't utilized General Philip's black and bone flute. Its abilities likely weren't potent enough to rewind the past. However, Fidel, living up to his title as a prominent merchant, had numerous wallets stashed in various clothes. Lumian conducted a quick search, revealing a total of 30,000 Verldor. This provided a modicum of relief for his psychological injury. Upon hearing the arrival of a carriage outside, Lumian left Fidel's bedroom and turned to the adjacent room. He suspected it was the patrolling constables here to investigate the recent explosion. The room was clean and tidy, yet a faint, uncomfortable smell lingered, the stench of decaying corpses. Entering the room felt like stepping into a catacomb, surrounded by the marks of his own kind and their deaths, creating an uneasy atmosphere. This should be Demon Warlock Berman's room. It allows him to protect Fidel in the shortest time possible, heh <laughs> heh, but he ultimately killed him. 
this story tells us that the most important condition for choosing a bodyguard is mental stability. Lumian mused as he surveyed every corner of the room. At that moment, the constables had already pushed open the house's door, revealing spilled blood and scattered flesh. One of them swiftly drew his revolver, while the other blew a whistle, producing a piercing sound. Lumian's gaze focused on the blackened marks in the room. The blood, suspected to be old, emitted a sinister aura. Berman once killed a special creature in this room to complete a resurrection experiment. Lumian muttered to himself. He didn't assume it was demon warlock Berman's blood because he believed that the other party wouldn't leave behind such a crucial item when he had enough time. If a beyonder skilled in curses obtained it, Berman would be in grave danger unless he had a way to sever the connection in advance. In contrast, Berman's blood and flesh were more likely to be found in the master bedroom of room 5 of the Flying Bird's first-class cabin. The demon warlock had suffered severe injuries from the explosion and the flames. Of course, the blanket explosion and subsequent intense combustion might have rendered the ingredients for cursing inactive. Lumian crouched down and retrieved a glass bottle from his traveler's bag. He scraped away the black marks on the wall and stored them inside. After completing his task, Lumian cleared any potential traces, hair, skin, and other items. He activated the black mark on his right shoulder and vanished from 16 Rue Coreas before more constables and official beyonders arrived. Upon returning to the Flying Bird, he immediately inspected the previous battlefield, now reduced to ruins, scattered with charred and shattered remnants. Metal walls bore marks of distortions and minor cracks, remnants of the intense encounter. The lingering gases from the burning carpet and items slowly dissipated through the open window. After Berman triggered the trap at the exit, the bottle of fiction had dissipated. Lumian focused on examining the windowsill, finding charred remnants. Phew. Exhaling deeply, he departed room 5 of the first-class cabin, descending to the deck. Philip, the security supervisor, leaned against the shipboard, gazing at the night view. Where's your lover? Lumian approached Philip, resting his hands on the shipboard. Philip sighed and replied, her destination is Port Ferrum. Apparently, she was heading to a relative's plantation to assist them. Something to celebrate. This means you'll have a new lover, Lumian said, adopting the tone of a dandyism believer. Please allow me to be downcast for another two days, Philip responded, not objecting to Lumian's words but emphasizing his invested feelings. Of course, it was just a little. Did you just return from the port? Why didn't I see you board the ship? Philip inquired, following his professional instincts. I've been in my room the whole time. There was a minor accident at the party just now that set the master bedroom ablaze. Many things were burned. Get someone to fix it promptly tomorrow, Lumian explained, seeking Philip's assistance in resolving the situation. Despite the possibility of staying in the fire-damaged room, Lumian preferred to take action to rectify the situation. Philip appeared confused. Party. Ablaze. What did you do in the room? I didn't hear anything. Lumian grinned and responded, a passionate guest made an appearance. Their actions were a bit extreme. Really? Philip inquired subconsciously. No, Lumian admitted straightforwardly. Do you want to hear the real reason? Philip fell silent. After a few seconds, he said, there's a need for compensation for such damage. We'll charge you the repair fee. Fortunately, we're still in Port Ferrum. We can replenish various items immediately. Otherwise, it would have been quite troublesome. Lumian handed over a stack of banknotes. This is the repair fee. I hope it can be completed by tomorrow. If it's too much, consider it a tip. If it's too little, ask me for more. Philip took the money, frowning as he weighed the stack of banknotes. What did you do to the bedroom? Why is he giving so much for the repairs? Is this hush money? Lumian smiled, turned around, and returned to room 5 of the first class cabin. Observing him disappear through the cabin entrance, Philip counted the stack of banknotes under the crimson moonlight and the gas street lamps at the port. 2000 Verl d'Or? Did he blow up that room? 
Philip was shocked and suspicious. But I didn't hear anything. That night, Lumian slept in a recliner in the living room. Initially planning to summon Jenna's rabbit Chasel and write Frank a letter about the demon warlock, seeking her help with magic mirror divination to identify the source of the old blood in Berman's room. However, he remembered that Franca might still be awake while Jenna was already asleep. Patiently waiting until the morning, Lumian set up the ritual using rabbit-shaped spirit that wanders about the unfounded, a runner who pursues knowledge, a messenger that belongs solely to the Seven of Cups to summon the book-holding transparent creature resembling a rabbit with powerful legs. Today's rabbit Chasel, unlike the last time, wore a pair of indistinct gold-rimmed glasses. Handing the letter in the glass bottle containing the blood and powder to Rabbit Chasel, Lumian asked curiously, Why are you suddenly wearing glasses? Is this the downside of knowledge? Behind the gold rimmed glasses, Rabbit Chasel's eyes glinted sharply. No, I learned this from a novel given by the Seven of Cups. What novel did she give you? Lumian inquired, having a hunch. The last time I helped you deliver a letter to her, she didn't have any other books with her, so she could only lend me one of her newly purchased collections. Rabbit Chasel adjusted its gold-rimmed glasses on the bridge of its nose. That novel is called The Adventurer One, First Show of Strength. As expected, Lumian thought. So, that's why you learned to wear glasses. He didn't know how to comment on this matter. After Rabbit Chasel left, Ludwig and Lugano woke up one after another, with the former casting a glance at Lumian's bedroom before eating his pre-breakfast snacks. Lugano, however, seemed puzzled. Was there a fire last night? Why don't I know? Lumian chuckled. It happened while you were engrossed with a certain lady. I quickly resolved it. Is that so? Lugano reigned in his disbelief. Choosing to explore local delicacies in Port Ferrum rather than enjoying the ship's breakfast, Lumian disembarked. Shortly after, Philip, the security supervisor, arrived with a dining cart. Standing in the doorway of the charred bedroom, Philip was stunned. You call this a minor accident? Even if it was blasted by cannons, it couldn't be in a worse state, right? Was he planning to dismantle the entire ship? Ah, such destructive power actually didn't affect the room's exterior. Even the damage to the walls is within reparable limits. I didn't hear anything either. What had Lewis Berry done in the room last night? No wonder he gave 2,000 verl door. At that instant, Philip's blood surged into his brain. In the Sun Square open-air market of Port Ferrum, Lumian enjoyed a tortilla filled with various fruit cubes and sipped a peculiar coffee laced with salt as he leisurely strolled through the stalls. Occasionally, he treated himself to a roasted sausage, relishing the sizzling, oily delicacy. Approaching the end of the open-air market, he encountered Batnacont. The well-dressed adventurer's eyes lit up as he approached Lumian and whispered, Something happened to your employer. Curious, Lumian inquired, what happened? He wanted to know how the official Beyonders had publicized this matter. It's that demon warlock. He killed Fidel's family and all his servants. Batna's relief was evident, he hadn't been present yesterday and was glad to have avoided potential danger. The evidence does seem to point toward the demon warlock. The authorities must have shared all the details. Lumian smiled at Batna and remarked, so, everyone at 16 Rue Correus fell victim to the demon warlock? Yes, Batna confirmed with a solemn nod. Lumian glanced at him and joked, remember how I blindfolded myself yesterday, hoping fate would guide me to uncover clues left behind by a demon warlock? Do you recall where we ended up? Batna was momentarily taken aback before muttering, 16 Rue Correus. Suddenly, he looked up at Lumian in shock and fear.